A hooded man visits a football stadium illuminated by the golden red setting sun. He remembers that before he was just a pathetic strategic analyst for the K3 League, whom no one recognized. He adds that he still believed in himself and was confident that his strategies would work even in the big leagues. However, people around him looked down on him due to his lack of achievement and status in society. According to the main character, this is why no one believed in his success and treated him like trash. However, the man is now transported to the present, in which his football team is playing out the last half of an important match. The crowd of fans shouts incredibly loud words of support, saying that his team is simply burning on the field. The man smiles, listening to the words of football commentators that they had previously heard many predictions that this would be a one-goal match. They add that a player named Burton White is doing very well. They also note that this team is coached by some unknown Asian coach, who previously played in the major leagues and is doing something incredible, trying to resist the best European team. Commentators say that Burton is responding to the support of the fans, and one of the players mustered all his spirit and broke through the defence. Having approached the enemy's goal, he uses several deceptive manoeuvres and delivers a powerful blow to the ball. The ball rushes into the goal at high speed, and the goalkeeper does not have time to catch it in time. The stadium erupts with cheers, and the commentators joyfully announce that the match score is now 1-0. They add that Burton did not miss his chance and brought a point to his team. The team coach mentally says that he will definitely become the best coach in the world, introducing himself as Drake. Some time ago, a football match begins at Lonestra Stadium, and a commentator named Jimmy Grady greets the spectators, announcing the start of the second half of the match between the Cadbig and Trafers teams. He states that in the first half of today's match, the Trafers team players did not show initiative and were marking time. Jimmy says that a Trafers player named Neeris had the ball taken away again, adding that the Trafers team lost the last three out of five matches, fueling the discontent of their fans. The commentator warns coach Andre that another defeat could lead to the team being replaced by another. The coach mentally panics, telling himself that at this rate they won't score more than one goal and will lose. He understands that he must win the match at any cost and not allow them to be replaced. Suddenly he remembers a method and decides to use it immediately. He quickly takes out his smartphone and opens an application called World Management. He recalls that this is a community application where there are not only numerous football fans, but also professional coaches and players. The peculiarity of this application was not just the fact that it was used by a huge number of people, but the presence of one user who was a rare tactical genius under the nickname MAD. Andre expresses confidence that with MAD's tactical skills, he will surely be able to turn the situation in his favor. Having completed the authorization procedure, he sees that MAD has already written to him that his affairs do not look very good and happily tells him that he is glad that he is watching his match. Mad replies that he watches all their matches, as he is a long-time fan of the Trafers team. The coach says that he is very flattered to hear this, adding that now the situation is really on the brink of a foul. Mad replies that nothing is impossible, adding that he has several ideas on this matter. He writes to the coach that Taylor Jackson is an excellent hitter, but he has one weak point. Mad adds that Taylor is a good passer and is quite fast, but his weak point is dribbling, so it would take two fast players to block him. Coach Andre follows Mad's advice, and the commentator notices that the coach suddenly asks for a replacement player. Mad adds to his advice by saying that after changing players, it is worth blocking the trajectory of the pass, and then tells them that Taylor's main passes today are to left winger Tarkovsky and left midfielder Santos. From Mad's point of view, it is necessary to block these two players, then Trafers can easily seize the initiative. He emphasizes that after this decision, it will be easier and they will only have to be more careful with those who try to break through from the flank, but otherwise they should continue the attack on the enemy's field. The commentator notes the immediate improvement in the Trafer's position, saying that they intercepted the ball from Taylor Jackson while dribbling. With delight, he states that the Trafer's team began to move much more quickly than in the first half, adding that coach Andre successfully applied the new tactics. Andre looks at the match and cannot believe his eyes, saying that his team has changed beyond recognition. The Trafers team scores the ball into the opponent's goal, earning themselves a point in this match. The commentator says that the Trafers team was in a stupor throughout the first half, but now they confidently scored a goal. He adds that the situation turned 180 degrees and no one expected that the Trafers team jumped at the chance at the last moment. From a commentator's perspective, Coach Andre showed off his amazing skills in this game. Andre rejoices at the victory, noting that their situation was truly desperate, after which he writes sincere thanks to the MAD user 
stating that he is truly called the best strategic analyst in the world. The mad user, who turns out to be a young Drake, proudly declares that he has once again led the team to victory. He emphasizes that his abilities even work in the world's leagues, declaring himself a great genius. A second later, strong knocks begin on his door, and he immediately gets scared, instantly becoming quiet. The collectors who came for Drake shout loudly that they know that he is hiding from them in this apartment and demand that he open the door. Drake hides in horror behind the chest of drawers, hoping that the collectors did not hear anything. The collectors decide not to tear the door off its hinges and come for Drake later, to which Drake mentally asks himself how long he will live like this. He recalls Coach Andre's words about him being the best strategic analyst in the world, noting that this is not the first time he has heard this. However, he notices that he can't really pay off the interest on the debt he inherited from his parents, and his life doesn't look much like the life of a great strategic analyst. After some time, he arrives at his brother's cafe and drinks a bottle of vodka in one gulp, he places it on the table with a knock, loudly declaring that vodka is one of the best things in this world. His brother asks him to stop drinking alcohol and asks him if everything is okay with him, to which he replies that he is tired of living like a dog in financial ruins. He complains that he has helped famous football teams win an incredible number of times, but his position as a cornered rat does not change. His brother Nathan doesn't know what to say and decides to just let Drake talk. In the end, he adds that Drake still doesn't know the future, which means it's not time to lose heart. After a while, he helps his brother walk, saying that his late grandmother always told him that Drake would become a big man. He adds that he agrees with his grandmother because despite the current adversity, he works as an analyst and on the other side of the globe, his abilities are recognized. Drake replies that he is indeed a good analyst, briefly plunging into heavy thoughts. He notes that despite the fact that he works in the stupid K3 league, which is about to collapse, he is still an analyst. He wonders if this profession is too undervalued and remembers what he was like at the beginning of his career. In those days, Drake dreamed of getting to Europe and looked only forward, but he quickly realized that in the world of football, connections decide a lot. He recalls that those who passed the test much worse than him ended up in the K1 league, but no one was outraged by this result. Deep in thought, he notices how one of the football players tells him that he does nothing, but receives a stable salary, adding that he is even a little envious. Drake tells him that, in his opinion, the football players of his club also do not train, but they receive rather large salaries. He tells them that the beginners try much harder than them and asks them if they are sweaty after training. The offender does not evaluate these words and is already preparing to resolve the issue with his fists. However, suddenly the head coach of the football team calls out to Drake, asking for a moment of his attention. He says they need to talk and invites him into his office. Drake agrees, mentally annoyed that these conversations are scheduled at the most inopportune times. Drake recalls that the club's head coach was very proud of his connections and always turned to him in difficult times. The coach invites Drake to sit down, but he refuses and asks him why he called him to his place. Drake notes the detail that the coach looks very subservient for the day and hesitantly mumbles something incomprehensible about how their club has been stagnant lately. He tells Drake that if they lose again, they will be demoted to which Drake then stated that he is well aware of this. He adds that for this to change, the club needed to follow the strategy he was proposing rather than changing things on the fly. Drake reminds the coach that he heard that the head coach was recently called by the owner of the club, and if the club is demoted, he will finally be fired, to which the head coach says that this is exactly what he was told. He asks Drake for help, saying that apart from him they have no hope, adding that he has four daughters who will not forgive him if he decides to work. Drake then mentally admitted to himself that he didn't care about his problems and he wanted to tell him to deal with it himself. But the head coach continued his story, adding that his third daughter was now in her last year at school, to which he... He is also mentally perplexed about how this should have touched him. However, after thinking a little, he comes to one very important thought and interrupts the coach's story by hitting the table. He tells the coach that he has one important question for the coach to which he puzzledly asks him what he wants to know. Guessing that he will be the next one after the head coach is fired, Drake asks him if he agrees to do whatever he wants, if thanks to him the team still wins. After some time, the time comes for the last chance for Drake's team and its head coach. The commentator announces the start of the last game of the season between the Gim Hay and Jinju teams. The players begin the starting gear, and the fans begin to cheerfully support the Jinju team. They shout loudly, waving team flags and asking her to bring them victory. Drake watches his team play in dismay and questions them about what they are doing, telling the defenders to pull themselves together. 
He shouts to them that the enemy has already reached the middle, ordering them to move the line back. The commentator says that Gimhei's team is breaking through to make a lobbed pass. He adds that fortunately the Jinju team's defender got into position in time to push the enemy line back. The Jinju defender jumps up, hitting the ball with his head, making a pass to his teammate. Drake notes that this match is quite unpredictable, noting that at this rate, their team could be thrown into the K4 League. He recalls that there are currently 16 teams in the K3 League, three of which will be eliminated by the end of this season. So their team, which is in 15th place, needs to rise to 13th place to avoid elimination. He notes that Gimhei is a pretty strong team, and they could easily play a draw. But today they absolutely need to win, and turns to the coach, saying that they need a replacement player. One of the players is indignant at this decision, saying that he does not agree with it, turning to the head coach with the words that Drake graduated from some unknown university and is now asking them to throw away the card of replacing the player. Drake asks the annoying player to look at the wingers, confusing him. He expands on his point by adding that, in contrast to the classic winger role, Gimhei's team placed left-handed forwards in the lateral positions who move through the centre, moving ever closer to their field. From Drake's point of view, they need to remove the attacking midfielder and place the defence in the centre and change the formation from four players to three, with an emphasis on the centre of the stadium. He approaches the head coach and says that if they don't change tactics, their team will blow dry, adding that if he wants to lose his job, then he can continue to do nothing. The player on the bench is angry with Drake, demanding that he respect the head coach. He grabs Drake's clothes and asks him why he decided to have the trainer be his service dog, but the head trainer orders them to stop. The coach and other players turn their heads and see the owner of the football club watching the game and their behaviour. He lowers an attentive gaze on the heroes, full of severity and contempt. The head coach orders everyone to keep quiet, adding that today's game is too important for them to waste time arguing. He turns to Drake, asking him which player he thinks they need to replace. Drake mentally notes that the head coach has not decided to suppress his pride and still addresses him familiarly. However, he quickly comes to the conclusion that this is not important now, since he has paid for this work. The first half ends scoreless, and the coach comes into his team's locker room, praising their fighting spirit. He gives several motivational speeches, but is suddenly interrupted by Drake, who orders the team to stop philandering. The team looks at him in surprise and asks him what he means by that. He turns to a player named Park Chung, telling him to stop doing the massage and go warm up, adding that he will take the field at the beginning of the second half. One of the players turns to Drake again, not understanding why he brings Park Chung onto the field, noting that Drake seems to be at the same university. He gloatingly points out that Drake constantly denounces corruption and connections, and he himself is exactly the same, to which Drake calmly replies that defenders Hei Kim and Hyun Su are not the fastest but they make very clear crosses. He adds that often when introducing left-handed strikers, defenders move closer to the centre and make crosses because the performance of the striker's position is so good that it is possible to risk leaving the back unprotected. Drake asks his opponent what would happen if they used one of the fast attackers, who would then be difficult to stop. He turns to Park Chung, asking him if he can cope with the task, to which he confidently replies that he will do everything in his power. Drake tells Park Jung that he is very happy to hear this, adding that this will be his debut. However, he will only have to do what he is told, and as soon as the counter-attack begins, he must run as fast as he can without looking back after what he says is that today he will make him the star player of this match. The second half begins, and the commentator announces that the Jinju team will field Park chung in the second half, noting that this is a rather bold decision, since this team is on the verge of relegation from the league. Almost immediately, Park Chung goes on the offensive, rushing forward, and the commentator notes that Park is incredibly fast and no one can keep up with him. Gim Hei's team players shout at each other, saying that they need to block him immediately. The commentator praises Park Chung's strength and speed, noting that the Gim Hai team's defenders are in a daze, leaving him one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper. Taking proper aim, Park Chung delivers a crushing blow to the ball, giving it enormous speed and an unpredictable trajectory. The goalkeeper fails to predict the movements of the ball, and the ball easily hits the goal, straining the net from the force of the impact. The commentator happily declares that Park Chung scores a goal 10 minutes after the start of the second half, thereby saving his team from a crisis. Park Chung joyfully looks at the goal, not believing that he managed to score a goal, while the commentator says that this is the debut goal in Park Chung's debut game, adding that he bypassed four defenders with his speed alone. The coach joyfully jumps up from his seat, 
saying that luck has finally smiled on them. Drake says that it is too early for them to rejoice and tells the coach that he would prepare another card to replace the player. The coach looks at Drake in surprise and asks him who he wants to put on the field this time. Drake says the best solution would be to replace the forward with Kim Hoseek. The coach with a confident face declares that he also thought about it, but Drake immediately notices the falseness in his words. He mentally notes that Kim Hoseek had attention problems and was oblivious to what was happening under his feet and usually sat on the bench because of this. However, like Park Jung, he is an excellent striker. Drake speculates that in such a situation, Gim Hae will likely want to bring in heavy hitters and hopes that they will take appropriate measures to counter these two players. He notices the actions of team coach Gim Hai and notes that these are the actions he expected them to take. Drake says everything is going according to his plan and Gim Hae's team has fielded a striker named Michael. The confrontation between the teams continues and the Jinju team player successfully blocks Michael's attempts to go on the offensive. He takes the ball away and the commentator notes that the second half is beginning to come to an end. He adds that the Jinju team now has another chance, noting that the ball is passed to player Kim Ho Sik. Kim Ho strikes with lightning speed, stunning the goalkeeper and scoring another goal against the opponent. Kim Ho Sik rejoices at his success, and the commentator notes that the Jinju team continues to win 2 0. The commentator says that this ends the football match, and Jinju beats Kim Hai and rises in the rankings, which helps avoid elimination from the league, to which Drake joyfully shouts about his success. However, suddenly he hears someone loudly and enthusiastically congratulating the head coach on his victory. Turning around, he notices that the same player who endlessly argued with him is sucking up to the head coach, and he tells him that today's victory was a success solely thanks to him. Drake irritably notes that during the match the head coach hovered around him all the time, and now he doesn't even spare him a glance. Drake leaves the field, saying that this time he will forgive him adding that the coach himself probably realized that it is better to listen to his advice. He meets with his friend Nathan, who congratulates him on keeping his team from being kicked out of the league, to which he replies that once he intervened, victory was in their pocket. Nathan asks Drake if he has heard the news about Donny, to which he asks him what happened to him. Nathan says that last month Donny missed half his salary for some stupid reason, wondering how Drake didn't know about it while working with Donny at the same club. Drake says that he can't know about this since Donnie didn't tell him anything about it, adding that rich people are the greediest people in the world. He suddenly thinks out loud, wondering if this could be the reason why Donnie didn't give him meat, to which Nathan is surprised that Drake cares about such minor things. Suddenly, Drake decides to check his bank account for his paycheck, to which Nathan irritably says that Drake could pretend to be interested in listening to him. However, upon seeing his receipts, Drake freezes in place, looking at his phone with a dead gaze. Nathan asks Drake what happened, looking at him questioningly. Drake's icy bewilderment turns to anger, and he begins to shake with anger, looking at his smartphone. Nathan asks his brother what is bothering him so much, to which Drake replies that there is a bonus of 400,000 won for winning the match, and also for the work of an analyst, Drake should have received 200,000 won per game. He looks at his account with anger, saying that he was only paid 500,000 won for saving the team from defeat. He angrily notes that he tried very hard for his team to win and in return received only a spit in the face. The main character gets up from his seat, irritably asking how management dared to cut his salary, to which Nathan asks him where he is suddenly going. Drake, driven by his anger, comes to the center of the Jinju football club. The secretary follows Drake, telling him that he can't get an appointment with the club owner right now. However, Drake does not listen to the secretary, angrily opens the door and asks everyone inside where his money is. The owner of the club and several of his subordinates look at him questioningly, asking who he is, to which he is mentally indignant that they have taken his money and are feasting at his expense. Drake turns to his boss, asking him what happened to his salary this month, adding that he was only paid half of what he was entitled to, to which he asks him why he is breaking into his office over such a small thing. One of the subordinates says that he knows Drake, adding that he is a famous loser, to which the club owner clarifies whether Drake really recently got into a fight with his head coach. They all note that they should have taken another person who graduated from at least some decent university, to which Drake mentally calls them scum. One of the subordinates of the owner of the football club tells Drake that if there are any complaints against the football club, then he should make an official request and not unceremoniously burst into the office, after which the boss says that if he could not get a decent education place, then Drake could at least learn to behave decently. Drake decides that the time for normal conversations has passed, 
and calls them all bastards, eating the beef that is on the boss's table. Everyone present looks at him in surprise and asks him if he has gone crazy. Drake, with anger in his voice, says that the boss should shut his mouth and sit silently, otherwise he will shut him up himself. He desperately says that everyone always tells him the same thing, as if they are parrots and asking them why they are so attached to this university. He grabs the recently won cup and asks his boss if he should smash the cup to hell, to which he immediately gives in and invites him to settle things with words. Drake says that he originally came to this office to resolve the issue with words and asks him where his damn money is. Suddenly, a voice comes from behind Drake, asking for a moment of his attention, to which he turns around irritably, asking what they need. He carefully examines the tall man with sunglasses and says that if he wants to kick him out, he will have to try too hard to do it since he is not going to move until he gets paid. The man politely says that Drake misunderstood him, adding that he came to him about his inheritance. He hands Drake the file about his inheritance, noting that this is not exactly the right setting for conversation, suggesting that he find a quieter place. Drake looks at the lawyer with confusion, asking him what kind of inheritance he is talking about, mentally speculating about what kind of inheritance he could have received. Drake decides to follow the lawyer and they arrive at a small diner to discuss business. They order some bulgogi and Drake enjoys the sound of the meat cooking in front of him. He starts the meal with pleasure and the man notes that Drake really likes beef. The waitress notes that the beef is not ready yet, to which Drake replies that he really likes his steaks medium rare. Drake reflects on the inheritance that came out of nowhere, noting that if he had known about such an inheritance earlier, he would not have hunched over in this hard labor, torturing himself. He looks closely at his lawyer, wondering if he is a scammer as he hands him his business card. He introduces himself as a leading lawyer at an international law firm named Marshall. He introduces his partner, saying that his name is James Kim, and he came here on an inheritance case from Britain, and together they are representatives of the great Mao Sok. Drake notes that he is familiar with the name, remembering that his grandmother often spoke about it back when she was still alive. According to his grandmother, his grandfather went on a spree with some foreigner and left for the UK, for which she was angry with him for the rest of her life and did not agree on a divorce. Drake muses that the name alone will not be enough to receive such a large inheritance from his grandfather, so he will need to check everything he can. Drake begins to ask clarifying questions about his supposed grandfather, and they assure him that he is definitely his relative and asks him if he really wants them to name the Chinese character of his name. Much to their surprise, Drake says that he would be very interested in seeing this to be sure. Marshall chuckles at this and says that he'd better show Drake the documents, adding that he still needs to check a few things about them. Drake studies the documents and notes that everything in the documents matches, from the name to the Chinese character. Drake continues to read the documents and irritably admits to himself that there are legal terms everywhere that he does not understand anything about. Drake remembers that he used to study a little law and decides to check Marshall's reputation and personality on the internet. He sees that the very first search query displays information about him and his company, as well as recordings of programs in which he participated. Drake reflects that most likely everything fits, and he really is the heir. Drake asks the lawyers how much money he will inherit, to which they begin to calculate the total amount, while he mentally hopes that there should be at least 100 million won with which he can pay off everyone's debts. Marshall and James tell the protagonist that his grandfather's net worth is about 4 billion won, causing Drake to freeze in shock. Marshall tells Drake that this is not all, saying that there is still a small nuance left. He adds that the legacy also includes the Greater Manchester Club in Horwich. After some time, Drake meets with Nathan again and tells him this story, to which he asks with complete bewilderment whether he dreamed all of the above. Drake doesn't say anything, to which Nathan says that he's completely out of his mind from Soju. Drake only sheds a stingy tear in response from mixed emotions. A second later, he begins to sob with happiness, confusing Nathan. Nate is surprised to note that Drake cries like a little baby when talking about money. Drake squeezes Nathan's hand and says that it was not in vain that he tried and worked so hard, to which Nathan, making sure that this is really true, he happily notes that Drake was not in vain learning English and will finally go to Europe. Nathan asks Drake what kind of club this is and what league it is in, to which the main character replies that now Nathan will be incredibly surprised. Drake says that this is a club from the English EFL1 league called Bolton Wanders, to which Nathan asks in surprise whether the legendary Lee Chan plays in this club. Drake says Bolton was once in League 3 too. Nathan asks Drake if he will hire him there. Drake asks Nathan if he really wants to go work there, 
to which he replies that he lasted the coaches in the K3 league for three whole years, to which Drake replies that he knows this very well, since Nathan was marking time, not having the opportunity to rise to the second league. Nathan says that Drake should definitely take it with him, adding that if you count the number of times he treated him to fried pork, the amount will be about 10 million won. Drake notes Nathan's serious attitude, replying that he still doesn't want to own the club. Nathan is surprised by this decision and asks Drake what kind of nonsense he is talking about. Drake happily declares that instead of going to England and working there for some team, he can simply sell this club and live comfortably for the rest of his life. Nathan asks Drake why he is not going to engage in this club, to which the main character replies that it should be obvious. He tells Nathan that his father borrowed money when he was a child, and then he was cheated. According to Drake, after that he constantly did nothing but drink and beat him. Also, due to such a difficult life situation, Drake's mother ran away from their family. He also recalls that after this, Drake's grandmother took him under her wing and raised him, after which he decided that he wanted to connect his life with football, adding that if it weren't for football, he would have been doing something illegal. Drake ends his story by saying that after such a childhood, he realized very early that in this damn reality, the only thing that matters in life is money. According to Drake, even his passion for football is nonsense, and first he needs to sell the club, buy a building and live comfortably. After some time, Drake meets with lawyers and they give him documents about the inheritance, saying that usually the inheritance goes equally to the children and grandchildren of the deceased. They add that, nevertheless, luck seems to have been on his side, adding that if there had been a will, the inheritance would have passed in favor of the one named there. However, according to lawyers, his grandfather suddenly passed away, albeit in the company of his mistress, to which Drake is surprised that his grandfather managed to cheat there too. The lawyer carefully asks Drake if he would like to check out the football club personally. Drake politely refuses, saying that he found all the necessary information on the internet. He tells Marshall that Bolton Wanders are in League 3 and are on the verge of relegation. The Marshal suggests moving on to finalizing the deal, inviting Drake to provide his fingerprint as a sign of agreement. Drake prepares to put the stamp, thinking that he didn't know his grandfather anyway, and the sale of the club can be entrusted to a representative so as not to go there personally. The marshal carefully watches as Drake signs and imperceptibly smiles at the moment when the protagonist's finger touches the contract. He stands up and tells Drake that the documents are fully signed and ready, adding that he will contact them after the entire transfer procedure is completed. He also adds that the funds will arrive in the bank account the very next day. 24 hours later, Drake checks his savings account and finds 3 billion and 800,000 won in it. He joyfully realizes that now all this belongs to him, which means he has finally become a rich man. Drake proudly declares that from now on, he will live happily for the rest of his days while his friend inspects the car at the dealership. Nathan tells Drake that this car even has an HDTV, to which Dileo says that it is a new model, asking them if they want to take it for a test drive. Drake and his friend agree and get into the car, after which Nathan tells Drake that he is now the chairman, so he should live up to his status, asking him if he can buy a Maserati car. Drake says that sounds good and he may buy one in the future, adding that he will most likely buy two or three cars and change them from time to time. Nathan notes that Drake is acting as usual, not at all embarrassed to show off, to which Drake replies that he is in a great mood today, so Nathan can choose any car for himself. Meanwhile, the lawyers who worked with Drake stop at a cafe known for its traditional dishes. James Kim examines the dish he was served and asks what it is. Marshall tells his colleague that it's Sunday soup, adding that it's a common thing to eat in Korea, adding that he's already sick of the food he chooses, assuring him that he will definitely like this dish. James asks Marshall about yesterday's situation, asking if everything will be okay, to which he looks at him with slight bewilderment, asking what he means. James says Marshall didn't give details of how things are currently going at the club and didn't touch on the topic of finances. Marshall replies that Drake should have checked this himself, adding that except for the amount of the inheritance, Drake did not really listen to all the other information. According to Marshall, they were simply doing their job, which is why he pulled out the documents, emphasizing that he did not deceive Drake in any way. He tells James to close the topic by showing his phone and saying that Drake was looking for information on him. He notes that people can be terribly simple-minded, laughing at the fact that Drake believed him as soon as he saw that he was starring in the program. He reviews the site, noting that the administration deliberately lowered down unflattering articles that are difficult to find unless you specifically look for it. Meanwhile, Drake is driving his car, happily thinking about his future life. He says that he has finally repaid all his debts, 
and can now safely leave Korea, wondering where he should go. Suddenly, the built-in phone in his car starts ringing and Drake picks it up. The caller turns out to be lawyer Yang, who is selling the club, who greets Drake after which he asks her about how things are going with the club. The girl says that based on what she found out, this club will not be able to be sold, to which Drake asks in surprise what she means. The lawyer shares details, from which it follows that the club has a very large debt in one bank. She adds that no one wants to buy it, and according to her information, various rumors are already in full swing in football circles, after which she asks Drake if he checked the documents before entering into the inheritance. She studies the documents more closely and tells the main character that the club's debt is 100 million pounds. Drake has difficulty controlling his car and nervously asks the lawyer to repeat the amount owed. She continues the story that tickets for the match barely cover the accrued interest, and the team is on the verge of expulsion from the league. She adds that there is not a single good player in this club, so no one is even trying to save this club, after which she asks Drake if he can hear her well, to which Drake only remains silent in stupor. Drake hangs up the call, parks his car on the side of the road and calls Marshall, but is informed that the caller is temporarily unavailable, asking him to leave a message after the tone. Drake loudly swears at Marshall and his colleague, calling them inveterate bastards. He tells himself that he has never seen 10 billion won in his life, and the club's debt translated into them is 150 billion. He once again brings up Marshall and James, noting that they didn't tell him anything about the football club's debts. He checks the business card, saying that he will not allow them to hang all these debts on him and will definitely find Marshall. Meanwhile, Marshall and James are already in another country in one of the villas. Marshall is on the phone with his aides, telling them to tell Drake he is unavailable if he contacts them again. He arrogantly hangs up, saying that Drake made a fuss when it was too late to change anything. James asks Marshall what happened, to which he replies that Drake has hired another lawyer who is now looking for him in England. James wonders what they should do, adding that perhaps they should give details about the state of the club. Marshall says Drake probably would not have signed the contract if he had known about the club's financial situation. He adds that if Drake decided to refuse the inheritance, then the debt obligations will pass to his cousins, which will lead to incredibly spectacular proceedings between relatives. He adds that their client turned out to be very cruel, since he himself did not want to take over the club on the verge of bankruptcy. So he found an heir, although it would have been much more convenient to simply give up his share. Marshall concludes that even if Drake finds him, it will not help him in any way, while Drake comes to Marshall's office in Korea. He kicks down the door, furiously demanding that Marshall come to him and answer for his crimes. However, he only stumbles upon a half-abandoned office space in which several desperate former clients of Marshall are sitting. He overhears their conversations and realizes that he is not the only one who was fooled by Marshall and his colleague. He boils with anger, looking at the people who find themselves in financial ruin because of Marshall's machinations. Furious, he takes out his phone to make more detailed inquiries about Marshall and is horrified by what he sees. He realizes that Marshall is involved in several scandalous cases that show him as an unscrupulous lawyer who breaks the law. Rage begins to fill Drake's body and he realizes that he is faced with real scammers. He screams into the phone about how much he hates Marshall, promising to find him and get even with him for all his atrocities. There is a dead silence in Drake's apartment, which is occasionally broken only by drops of water falling from the tap. Drake lies on a mattress in his room, barely moving from a severe hangover. Drake remembers that three days have passed since he fell into this trap. He also recalls that he searched every office of the law firm and even contacted the police, but all this was to no avail. He was told that he could renounce the inheritance after three months, but if he received property as a gift, this was completely impossible to do. He also recalls that despite the fact that Marshall acted in bad faith by hiding information about the club's debts from him, the police were unable to help him in any way. It also turned out that Marshall was hired by one of his grandfather's relatives, who of course immediately disappeared. Drake irritably notes that this relative planned everything perfectly, dumping a whole load of problems on him. A tear of despair runs down his face and he says that he has just set himself up for a good life, but fate again drags him into the swamp of hopelessness. After some time, Drake studies information about the Bolton Club and learns that it is a club with a rich history and traditions in which the legendary Korean football player Lee Chan once played. He also learns that this year Bolton Wonders is in the third league in 21st place out of 24 teams. Drake finishes reading the article, realizing that most experts have already given up on this football club. He takes out a cigarette and says that based on the news, this club lost yesterday's match with a devastating score of 4-0. Nathan demands that Drake put away the cigarettes, 
telling him that he has no conscience at all, adding that then the apartment will smell of nicotine. He looks closely at Drake and asks him what he plans to do with all this. Drake says that as a result of thinking, he came up with a plan B and a plan A, to which Nathan asks him why he didn't start with plan A, to which the main character replies that he came up with plan B first. Nathan listens to Drake, who tells him that plan B is complete ruin and asks him what he means. Drake says he recently learned that if the club goes bankrupt, the club will be relegated to League 5, after which Drake will have to step down as chairman of the club. According to Drake, after this he will also have to give all his money to creditors. Drake emphasizes that they will also have to return the cars they bought to the dealership, which terribly upsets Nathan, who dejectedly says that he recently bragged to his daughter about his purchase. Drake says this option is the cleanest option given the $150 billion in debt behind him. Drake also adds that until he gets rid of his debt, he will have to live at Nathan's house. The main character thoughtfully declares that now he can play with his niece every day. Nathan asks Drake if he is joking, to which he replies that after filing bankruptcy, he will be insolvent for a long time. Nathan imagines what would happen to him if his family discovered Drake in their home. He tries to convince his brother to change his mind, saying that he has good abilities, thanks to which he can find a job, to which Drake replies that after everything he has done in the local league, he will no longer be accepted. Nathan mentally notes that Drake, as luck would have it, loves meat very much, so he cannot allow him to live in their house. He tries to encourage Drake, but he only conveys the weak message that negative thoughts do not bring anything good. Suddenly, Drake grabs his brother by the shoulders but allows him to continue his motivational speech. Drake tells Nathan to think about something, to which he replies that he doesn't want to think about anything. Drake tells Nathan that he won't be able to live a normal life if he loses everything and goes crazy, asking Nathan what would happen if he died of anger and his corpse was left to rot in a small room. He adds that his neighbors don't even know that someone lives in his basement apartment, again asking his brother if he can live in peace, knowing that Drake is dead in that damn basement, after which he adds that that's why he must live with him to avoid this terrible tragedy. Drake asks Nathan for help, to which he replies that he himself is now ready to kill him, to which he says that he will have to come to terms with this desire, since he bought him a car. Nathan points out that the car will have to be returned anyway, and Drake decides to come up with a better argument. He says that he will try to cancel the return of his car, noting that he is very caring and asks Nathan to let him live in his apartment in return. Nathan asks Drake what his plan A is, to which he replies that he was just about to tell about it. The protagonist reports that plan A is a simple sale of the football club. Nathan reminds Drake that he himself says that this club cannot simply be sold, to which Drake responds that no one will want to buy a club that has a huge debt. Drake adds that his cunning plan is to sell the club for next to nothing. To implement this plan, Drake is going to travel to England to do everything in his power to ensure that the club remains afloat until the end of the league. He adds that as soon as the situation stabilizes, he will sell it at a low price, noting that if the club is now worth about 30 billion, he will sell it for 10 or 20. Drake begins to announce the conclusion of his thought, to which Nathan replies that he has no choice but to live in Korea and feed his family. Nathan tells Drake that he will send him Korean food regularly so that he will not forget about his homeland. He says that if Drake chooses plan A, then he will have a very difficult time, to which Drake confidently declares that they should all plow together. He adds that he has now finally found a job, just like Nathan asked, adding that they should go to England together. He adds that even though Nathan is now working as a coach, his team is still on the verge of relegation. Nathan says that it will not be better in England, to which Drake replies that this is completely different, and if Nathan agrees, he will be able to say that he worked abroad, adding that he will take care of his family and provide everything necessary for living. Nathan thinks about the fact that Drake was a coach in League 3, but had a great instinct for athletes and took good care of them. Meanwhile, Drake reflects that it will be impossible to manage an entire football club alone, and even if he goes bankrupt, he will not be alone in his misfortune. Nathan agrees saying that his daughter would also benefit from living abroad, adding that he agrees to go with him only if he really provides housing and food for his family, to which Drake says that he swears to him of this. He hugs Nathan, saying that he was confident in him, because they are even closer than siblings. Nathan thinks that he will try to test Drake's abilities in business and trust him. Drake and Nathan's family buy tickets and fly to England on a plane to Manchester. After staying at the hotel for a short time, Drake decides to try on the business suit he bought. He looks at himself in the mirror, saying that when he smiles, he will only need to show his five front teeth. He tells himself that he looks good enough, adding that these are just debts that he can definitely handle, 
Having set himself up, he leaves the room, saying that it's time to pull himself together. Arriving at the club office, he deserves a briefing that the club includes the team, the entire coaching staff, medical staff, as well as office workers such as managers. The head of the club tells Drake that they are all called the front office, or the more laconic term support, to which Drake replies that in general everything is clear to him. The manager says that now he must explain to Drake the backstory of the club, to which Drake realises that he is about to fall asleep from boredom. To avoid a boring lecture, he remembers how he arrived at the University of Bolton Stadium an hour ago. He looked around, saying that he was the most ordinary man in the street who understood nothing about football. Suddenly, a man approached him and politely greeted him, noting that he had been waiting for him for a long time. The man introduced himself as Richard Gears, adding that he is the head of this football club. He shakes Drake's hand, saying he's honoured to meet him. Richard Gears invited Drake to follow him, adding that he wanted to tell everything about their club. Drake returns to the present and tries in vain to convince his brain to continue listening to Richard's lecture. He tells himself that he is now the owner of the club, which means he should know at least basic information about it. While Drake tries to convince himself to listen more carefully to the old man, Richard says that now he will tell him about Bolton's profit structure. Drake immediately perks up, listening more carefully, and Richard says that the club's income is divided into five categories. Richard says the most profitable of these is the sale of tickets to matches, adding that part of the money from sales goes to the maintenance of the players, and the other part is the profit of the Wanderers' company. Drake asks Richard how many tickets are sold on average, to which he replies that the club sells about 7,020 tickets each season, to which Drake mentally notes that this is not the worst result, provided that it is only a third have arrived. He recalls that he recently saw access to the upper stands of the stadium blocked. He approaches Richard, asking him why they can't open up access to these stands to make more money. Richard replies that the reason for the closure of the upper stands is the low population of the city of Bolton. He adds that the total population of the city is 240,000 people, to which Drake reflects that even the city in which he lived had 340,000 people. Richard says Bolton is a textile centre with many factories, and a large proportion of the population are factory workers with little entertainment in their lives, so they prefer to get out to the stadium to watch a match live rather than sit in front of the TV. Drake says that the situation became much clearer to him, thanks to Richard for his detailed answer to the question. He says that he has heard that the English as a nation love football with all their hearts, to which Richard replies that this is true, adding that for this reason, even in such a small city, more than 7,000 people attend the game. Drake wonders if Richard Gears is trying to get him to think positively. But the club leader says that this is the end of the general information and they can move on to a short excursion. First of all, Drake decides to meet the medical staff to find out how things are going. He then goes down to the field to observe the team's training. After this, he meets with the club's coaches to analyze their work. After the tour, Richard Gears hopes Drake has his first impression of the football club. Drake reflects that everyone seems to be polite and friendly on the outside, but he still felt their heavy gazes on his back. According to Drake, these glances incinerated him, making it clear that he would never be welcome here. Richard says now it's time to talk about the really important issue. Drake goes into the manager's office and he shows him the documents, saying that they contain all the personnel expenses and the salaries of the team's players. Richard says League One teams operate on an average budget of £6 million, but Bolton Wanderers now have an average spending budget of £15 million. Drake reads the financial report with horror, admitting to himself that he did not expect that such a club would have expenses three times higher than normal. He asks Richard how this could happen, adding that such wastefulness is akin to trying to fill a broken jug with water. Richard says the former owner was keen to get into the league, so he spent a lot of money this season and brought in a lot of potential players. Drake ruefully reflects that his grandfather must have bought his players at random, and because of this, about £9 million is spent annually on player salaries alone. He goes over the reports again in his head, realising that last year's budget deficit was as much as £40 million, which means his grandfather continued to spend money despite huge debts. He recalls his metaphor about the broken jug and notes that from a financial point of view, he has not yet heard a single good news that would somehow reassure him. Drake realises that he himself is a kind of broken jug and switches off for a while, plunging into his thoughts. Suddenly, a familiar voice calls out to him, inviting him to eat a cookie to perk himself up properly. Drake asks Nathan why he decided that the reason for his bad mood was a desire for food, to which he asks if he really guessed wrong. Drake says it's all about the football club's budget, 
adding that he can't just give up so he has to fix this whole situation and get the company back on its feet. Nathan eats some cookies and asks Drake what his plans are, to which he replies that first of all they will have to cut the budget and save more. With these words, he confidently rises from his seat and says that he will definitely finish the job if he has already started. After some time, he calls the club manager into his office and tells him that he is going to cut the spending budget. Club manager Derek Scott says this is a terrible decision given the club's difficult times. Drake calmly replies that now is the time when it is necessary to save money, asking Derek what alternative options he has for getting out of the situation. Derek Scott says that he doesn't care how low their budget is, adding that he doesn't understand Drake's actions, as he is proposing to cut the roster of players when they should instead be investing in them as the future of the club. After which he annoyedly states that Drake is trying to embarrass his team and club. Drake slams the table in anger and questions Derek about why he thought expensive players would play better. He remembers Derek's words about investing in the players and says that he wants to ask him a counter question. Drake recalls that Bolton, as part of EFL1, invested generously in high-level players, but still found themselves at the very bottom and asks Derek why this could happen. Derek doesn't find anything that makes a convincing argument and Drake says he doesn't care whether it's the player or his manager. He is adamant that revenue restoration will proceed as scheduled, adding that that's all he wanted to tell the manager. Derek leaves in a rage, slamming the door loudly, to which Drake is surprised, wondering why he had to react so violently. Drake reflects that the club's money does not belong to him, but he is still responsible for it, which means the regime will be tightened so that they do not have to pay fines after a loss. Meanwhile, Derek walks down the hallway, irritated by the fact that Drake only cares about money. He angrily calls Drake an amateur who doesn't understand anything, indignant that he dared to behave like that with him, adding that Drake is not at all like the previous owner of the club. He recalls that the previous owner of the club was not only generous with money, but also invited him to play golf or go on a yacht. He also remembers that when they were relaxing, he introduced him to incredible beauties. Afterwards, he angrily recalls how Drake suggested he change tactics mockingly asking him if he planned to motivate the players with anything other than fiery speeches. He's not Derek loses his temper and kicks the wall as hard as he can, calling Drake a worthless bastard who doesn't know anything about football. After a second he stops, thinking that he needs to calm down and respond to his words more easily. Meanwhile, on the expanses of social networks in accounts related to the football life of the Bolton club, news appears that the new owner of Bolton Wanderers does not love his club and he only needs money and power. Forum users argue that this decision is deeply erroneous, adding that Asians do not understand anything about sports. Nathan reads the comments, surprised at how many rumors have spread, considering that no one has given any interviews on this topic yet. Drake realizes that all this started because of Derek's tricks and reflects that he is unlikely to leave him alone. Nathan concludes that the new rules seem too harsh to him, noting that nevertheless sales cover the salaries of two or three people, let alone six. Nathan says that nevertheless, there is Owen Doyle in the club, to which Drake says that he understands his admiration, since this player is the symbol of the team who gave it nine years of his life. However, he argues that Doyle has fallen sharply in the rankings recently, so he costs the club just £5,100 a week. Nathan says Drake should rethink his decisions, adding that such changes could lower the morale of the entire team. Drake tells his brother to speak directly about his ideas if he has them. Drake tells Nathan that he heard that the guys from the EFL1 team were getting 3 million one a week, to which he replies that Owen Doyle almost tripled that amount. Drake looms over Nathan, telling him that in 26 games this season he has missed three goals, to which his brother replies that it's hard to argue with that argument. Drake states that even he could score at least one of those three goals, to which Nathan says that they shouldn't get too personal. Drake explains to Nathan that besides Owen Doyle, there are four other players who demand 10 million one a week, so it is impossible to try to save without paying attention to them. He adds that he has already listed six players, including Doyle, whom he intends to put on the reserve list, and now all they can do is wait for a response from these players. Nathan listens to Drake's arguments and sighs heavily. He asks Drake if he knows that they have a football match tomorrow, to which he replies that he knows about it. Nathan says that if Drake knows about tomorrow's match, then he must understand that if they lose, they will drop to 24th place in the league rankings. Drake recalls that the EFL one includes a total of 24 teams, which means that if they lose, they will end up in last place. Drake is immersed in heavy thoughts about what could happen if he loses, while Nathan says that he understands his intentions, 
recommending that he still prepare for tomorrow's match. A few hours later, night falls, and only two windows of the club have lights on. The head of the club reviews Drake's reports and is surprised at what is written in them. He notes that Drake is the complete opposite of the former football club owner. The head of the strategic planning group named Emma Charlotte comes to the manager and asks for a moment of his attention. She asks him about the team reduction plan provided by the new owner of the club. The manager asks her why she is asking him about this, to which she replies that she is driven by idle interest. She politely thanks the manager for his work in restoring the team, to which he chuckles and replies that this is not his merit. Emma Charlotte recalls that she recently had the idea of proposing this idea to the former owner. The manager tells Emma that the idea of reducing the roster belongs to the new owner of the club. Emma asks Richard in surprise if the rumours that Drake wanted to sell the club for next to nothing were true as soon as he became the owner. She asks him how this is possible, to which he replies that he himself has difficulty believing it. Richard adds that the new owner of the club has now decided to take full control of the club into his own hands. Richard says that he was convinced of this himself after talking with Drake, adding that the same applies to these documents, after which he notes that Drake, unlike the previous owner, does not know anything about football, but he is young and not devoid of enthusiasm. The next day, the football match begins, and the commentators announce the start of round 27 of the league between Bolton Wanderers and Milton Dons at the University of Bolton Stadium. He adds that today there will be an incredibly exciting fight for the lowest place in the league rankings, noting that unlike the championship match, this match decides the future fate of the teams. He slams his palm hard on the table, shouting that both sides are going to really need glasses now. He gets up from his chair and says that as a commentator for the Bolton team, he asks all viewers in this difficult moment. He turns to the stands and calls on all Bolton fans to encourage their favourite team. The commentator does not give up in his calls, but the spectators in the stands do not radiate any enthusiasm. Drake reluctantly admits to himself that no one is motivated to win right now, since the audience knows that the Bolton team has been greatly weakened. He notes that even in this case they should not lose, after which he carefully examines the stadium, noting that there are about 3,000 people here, a third of which are Milton fans. Drake notes that Bolton fans have more questions for him than for the game, deciding that they need to go somewhere, since there is nothing but stress here. Meanwhile, one of the fans takes the microphone from the commentator and turns to Drake, saying that he knows nothing about English football, adding that Bolton will go broke if he continues to manage the club. Drake fumes with anger, saying that he is the one trying to save this club from ruin, adding that this fan will now be blacklisted, to which Richard Gears asks him not to pay attention to such words. He adds that when Bolton scores, the fans quickly switch to the match, so they just have to wait for the goal. Meanwhile, the ball flies into the Bolton team's goal, and the commentator joyfully announces this event. The commentator shouts that Milton striker Richard Fair scores the first goal, giving his team the lead. Richard and Drake look gloomily at the situation on the football field, not even finding words for indignation. Drake notes that people are desperate, adding that no one will root for a team that is already preparing to lose. Suddenly, Drake hears heartfelt and joyful cries of support for Team Bolton. He notices a little boy who is trying his best to support his favourite team, asking them to win. Richard approaches Drake and says that the club still has loyal fans who believe in their club. Drake says that even if the score is now 1-0, they still have a chance, and they must justify such pure and childish support. Drake jumps up from his seat and joins the child, shouting for Team Bolton to bring them victory. He continues to stubbornly support his team, but a few seconds later the ball is back in the Bolton goal, after which the commentator praises the Milton Dons team's tactics. Drake sadly sits down on a chair, saying that, contrary to his wishes, miracles do not happen in the world. He decides to calm down and watch the game, noting that the opponent's skills are also excellent. He is surprised by this situation, thinking about when they manage to become professional players. He notes with sincere understanding and sympathy that he feels very sorry for this boy, looking for him with his eyes. However, the young fan gives Drake the middle finger as fans scream for Drake to get out of the club. Drake stoically endures what he sees, noting that reality is incredibly harsh on him. Some time after the match, he talks to Nathan, noting that they are in big trouble. Drake notes that Nathan will be head coach of the Bolton U21 team, but he has not shown his abilities yet. He reflects that if this continues, his plan to save Bolton's budget will completely fail, since they currently have no tactics and the method of selecting players leaves much to be desired. 
He adds that the current composition of the team is no good and there are no capable players among them, while Derek received his money for nothing. According to Drake, things cannot be left as they are, otherwise the team's morale will completely fade, adding that if they had lasted in that game, they would have been paid a fine of 3.8 billion. He tells Nathan that there are too few people in the stands, noting that this time they finished last in the league, which means they will continue to fall, so they urgently need to change the situation. Otherwise, there will be even fewer spectators and the money will stop flowing. Nathan asks Drake how they can attract an audience, to which he replies that he has a few ideas for this. He asks Nathan what his nickname was, to which he replies that everyone kind of called him a bastard. Drake tells his brother to stop talking nonsense, and Nathan thinks again, trying to remember all of Drake's nicknames. He goes through all the offensive nicknames of his brother, to which he asks him to pull himself together and not go through all this nonsense. Nathan is briefly confused, and Drake says that he doesn't really care whether he remembers or not, since he will remind him on his own. Drake says that everyone used to call him player, to which Nathan asks him why he remembered that. Drake says he has no other way to make money right now other than sports betting. Nathan is surprised by Drake's words, thinking that Drake cannot start gambling. Drake notes that football in England is different from normal football in that you can bet on it. According to him, this is why bookmakers often cooperate with clubs as sponsors. He also recalls that for fans, this is becoming one of the ways to earn money. He says that a significant portion of fans also place small symbolic bets, like some kind of ritual, after which they support and sincerely pray for their team to win. He adds that given all this, a sponsorship contract with a bookmaker would be a smart option for them, noting that there are no clubs yet that would proudly engrave the logos of bookmakers on their jerseys. He reflects on the fact that in the last game, he clearly saw the despair of the fans, who crumpled and tore the paper in their hands, suspecting that these pieces of paper were definitely certificates. He adds that the next step is to encourage fans to bet more often. Richard says that they already know all this, asking Drake if he has another form of betting in mind. Drake says he wouldn't call it another form of betting, adding that they will be selling limited Bolton Wanderers betting slips. He develops his idea by saying that this is based on the same bets on a win, draw or loss as in regular coupons. Richard tells Drake that bets limited to the outcome of one match are risky and they can, for example, go into a loss. Drake thinks that Richard is right, since the chance of winning is only 33%. He tells Richard that he has a plan in which they will not lose anything financially, to which Richard asks how this is possible. Drake says they may add a refund policy, as well as adding bets not just on wins or losses, but on the number of goals a team will score and what the final score will be. He adds that when a spectator buys a ticket for a match, they will also be offered a bet slip. Also, according to Drake, you can add a bet on who will score a goal, and even those who are not interested in gambling can try it as entertainment. One of the meeting participants says that from a spectator's point of view, to win, they will simply have to bet on the team losing. Emma looks at Drake and notes that he is in charge of the planning, unlike the previous owner. She recalls that the previous owner simply listened to the plans and decided whether to approve it or not. However, even this does not allow her to close her eyes to the fact that Drake tried to sell the club as soon as he became the owner, and she decides to continue to monitor him in the future. Drake finishes his explanation by noting that it's getting too hot in here, taking out a handkerchief to wipe his face. The head of the club notes that in his opinion this is a good decision, inviting others to also express their opinions. He adds that no one should be embarrassed to express their opinions as leaders of different teams, adding that if there are no objections, he would like this plan to be implemented as soon as possible. Drake looks around to see if anyone has any comments, but no one objects to his idea. Drake briefly glances at Emma Charlotte while Richard says that since no one has any objections, they unanimously approve of the plan. Drake is surprised by this outcome and reflects that his grandfather's brilliant talent was passed on to him. Richard asks the others what else they need to discuss, to which Drake says he has something else to tell them. He states that he also wanted to organize some kind of event and Richard asks him what kind of event he wants to organize. Drake says he's thinking about pulling off a random prank, confusing everyone present. He reveals his idea, saying that bets alone will not be enough to attract spectators, so the drawing will be carried out according to the numbers of entrance tickets, calling the numbers of the three lucky tickets and rewarding the spectators who bought them. Drake points out that in Korea, TVs, refrigerators and other household items are given away as prizes but they will offer winners five free tickets, adding that if profits increase over time, they will be able to give away more expensive prizes. 
He also states that the giveaway doesn't have to happen during the upcoming match, as they will randomly choose which match to do the giveaway at. He asks others what they think about this, to which he is told that these measures sound like something not too expensive. Drake proudly notes that his opinion has never been so seriously discussed in Korea, mentally wondering how this plan differs from the previous one. Richard says that in order for the number of viewers to grow, they also recommend increasing the amount of advertising to promote innovations. He emphasizes that local advertising includes articles on websites, outdoor advertising and advertising on regional TV channels, adding that even broadcasting advertising on TV will not cost that much. With that, Drake calls out to the marketing manager, who nervously gets up from her seat. She stammers and asks Drake if he has any instructions for her. Drake asks the marketing manager to make a large, highly visible banner and place it in every shopping center. He adds that they will need banners for special matches, adding that it will be advisable to put them up two weeks in advance, to which the girl asks him what he means by special matches. Drake explains his idea by saying that these matches will be matches against the top teams in the league, such as Rochdale or Preston. Drake asks the manager to make the banner catchy and unusual, adding that they can depict their opponents with food. Drake says they can portray the goalkeeper named Dales as Bolton's tasty catch and asks the others what they think of the idea. Drake says that as an act of solidarity, they can portray the teams together as if they are on the same level as Bolton. Drake looks into the conference room but is met only by deathly silence and looks of complete incomprehension. Drake reflects on how he seems to have gone overboard, asking other people for their advertising suggestions. Not waiting for an answer, he turns to the manager saying that he has one more proposal. He adds that he would like to negotiate with a local radio station about scheduled broadcasts about the Bolton Club, to which Richard asks him why he would do this. Drake says that with this, he will fire the first bullet, adding that he needs to make himself known to other teams. He also adds that at the moment it should turn out to be the most spectacular. Meanwhile, evening falls in Manchester County and all employees go home. Manchester Blue Moon's strategic analyst, Neil Bardock, sits at home and reflects on the current team lineups. He notes that Manchester now ranks first thanks to his painstaking efforts. He reflects that this season the tactics he proposed have already brought several victories, noting that if this continues, they will live happily ever after. However, he notes that to his great regret, a user named Mad suddenly disappeared somewhere and has not appeared for a month. He adds that the reason the head coach trusts him is because he followed the advice of Mad's tactical expert. He continues to hypnotize Drake's account, wondering why he hasn't been online for so long, suggesting that he might just be busy at work. He also expresses confidence that he is not the only trainer who relies on tips from this user. Meanwhile, at the Liverpool Red Phoenix's training ground, two coaches are just as eagerly awaiting Drake's return to the football app. One of the trainers says that he continues to send messages to all his accounts, but Mad has not read anything. Head coach named Selik Bubes notes that three months ago he first borrowed Mad Tactics. He adds that with just one borrowed strategy he was able to win four times in a row. At that time, they decided to borrow his tactics, impressed by its genius. He recalls how, impressed by this tactic, he told the manager to hire the man. Then he even personally sent him a message to his account, introducing himself as the Liverpool coach and making a business proposal. Then Drake, who did not believe that the sender was the real Bubash, rudely dismissed him. Jellick was stunned by such a sharp and aggressive response. He continued to try to negotiate with Drake, but Drake told him that if he continued to pester him with his requests, he would block him. Jelik sadly notes that in the end Mad blocked him anyway. He reflects that he still sends emails to this user through another email. But judging by the fact that new tactics have not been loaded for almost a month, someone else might have hired him. He ponders the possibility that he might have been taken by the EPL, suggesting that the likes of Trafford, Chelsea or Arsenal London could certainly offer him an important job. Meanwhile, Drake goes to a radio station to record the first podcast about Bolton's life. Commentator Erin Bench announces that today they have a special guest who is the current owner of Bolton, Mr. Drake. He says that he is honored to meet Drake, to which Drake replies that he is just as pleased to meet him. Erin Bench suggests starting a podcast and says that first of all, he would like to ask him one main question. He says Bolton Wanderers are on the brink of relegation after losing a recent match adding that as a Bolton supporter, he is genuinely worried about them. Drake smiles, noting that he knew the host would bring up this topic on today's podcast. He says that things are exactly as the presenter describes, adding that to get out of this situation, they decided to change key Bolton players, including Owen Doyle. Meanwhile, Nathan spends his first team training session with Bolton Wanderers, 
while listening to this podcast on the radio. After some time, a man accosts him, asking him what he is listening to. Nathan greets the man, who turns out to be the director, saying that he's listening to the radio, which is currently playing an interview with Drake. The director is interested in what was said and comes up to listen to the interview. This interview is gaining wide popularity among Bolton residents, and they listen to it during their working hours. Everyone hears the host's question about what kind of strategy Drake came up with to get his club out of a desperate situation. Erin Bench asks a legitimate question about the reason for the suspension of six active players, adding that one of them is Nihoon Doyle, who has been fighting for the team's fate for several seasons now. Drake smiles insidiously, mentally noting that he knew that he would be asked about this decision. Drake says that everyone already knows that the current situation at the football club is far from ideal. He adds that he understands perfectly well the doubts about the rationality of his decisions, but despite the fact that the players' contribution to the team and their dedication used to be great, this is now a thing of the past. Aaron says that some fans are not ready to agree with such statements. Drake reflects that if he could, he would say that he is well aware of this. Drake gives the example of Owen Doyle, saying he was absolutely loyal to the team and he has truly become a cult favourite among Bolton players over the last few years. However, from Drake's point of view, Owen is now on the verge of retirement, as he will soon be over 30 years old, and in his last 20 matches, he has made mistakes and only scored three goals. Drake says he doesn't want to criticise players individually, but fans can't deny that Owen Doyle's skills have noticeably declined, to which listeners complain that they have nothing to complain about. Drake continues to argue that Doyle alone cannot change anything if the team itself is weak, which infuriates some viewers who believe that parting with the legend is a mistake. Erin says that while respecting and understanding the situation, leaving key players will inevitably worsen the atmosphere and affect team morale and company revenue. Drake notes that the current state is already worse than ever, so they desperately need drastic changes to move forward, albeit through losses adding that in the fact that some fans are against the resignation of players, he sees only a kind of obsession with the past, which, as we know, never leads to progress. Drake states that if they don't get their act together and get rid of this obsession, eventually their team will only face relegation and further decline. Erin wants to object to Drake, but he gestures to him that he has not finished his speech yet. He sums up the above by saying that he wants to make a final statement. Drake says he has no intention of reversing his decision to resign the six team members he previously named. He adds that they may cut unnecessary information from the broadcast, but they must leave this information as he plans to thoroughly prepare for the new period of Bolton's history. He again thanks the host and all the listeners for their dedication to Bolton, adding that it can no longer continue as before. Erin notes that Drake exudes confidence in his intentions, concluding that he does seem to have some kind of clear plan of action. Drake responds to the host, asking him to just wait patiently, noting that changes will be noticeable this season. According to him, he plans to do everything in his power to save the team. He asks everyone to just keep an eye on them, adding that everyone who remains loyal to the team will be pleasantly surprised. Nathan listens to Drake's speech on the radio and mentally notes that his brother has learned to give very good speeches. Drake tells the host that they will definitely achieve huge success in the very near future. In the media, Drake's statements caused a great stir and became a hotly discussed topic. And, despite the fact that initially his interview for the radio station was published only in a local newspaper, articles were later published in the media of other regions about the impending restructuring of Bolton. However, there were many people who were still categorically against change. Current Bolton player Falcon Jonks says the idea of disbanding the first team is the dumbest idea he's ever heard. He complains to his uncle about how he even asked Derek the reason why he was kicked off the team. His uncle named Joseph Vieira asks his nephew what the new owner of the club answered him. Falcon complains that Drake told him that they were spending too much money on their salaries, adding that any other club would offer him much more than here, but he still thoughtlessly extended his contract with the Bolton club. He continues to complain to his uncle, saying that Drake dares to act so arrogantly adding that it is Drake who should be worried about whether the players will stay in his club or not. The uncle sighs heavily and puts his hand on Falcon's shoulder, suggesting that he first calm down, after which he says that he is a player who deserves better treatment. He tells him that he is the trump card of this team, mentally realising that he is blatantly lying to his nephew. Falcon says that he told the owner what he thinks about it and is not going to change his opinion. Joseph tells Falcon that he did the right thing, suggesting that he close the topic for a while and return to it later. After a while, he sits down on the curb near the club building to think it over. 
He admits to himself that his nephew is truly an unnecessary player on the team, despite all his pride. He takes out a cigarette and sadly reflects on the fact that he did not have the courage to tell his nephew the bitter truth and remembers his recent conversation with Drake. Drake was adamant during this conversation and said that Falcon was on the list of retired players. He added that under any circumstances, Falcon will no longer be a starter. However, according to Drake, there is only one option in which Falcon remains at the club. According to this option, Falcon's salary will be reduced by 70% and he will no longer be included in the main team. Drake asks Joseph if he agrees with this logic. He adds that if Joseph were a great player, he wouldn't cut it by asking Joseph if he understood him or not. He sums it up by saying that Jones could stay, but he won't see the starting lineup, and if he's unhappy, he could transfer to another team. Joseph exhales heavily from cigarette smoke, admitting to himself that he is very annoyed by Drake. He thinks that Falcon really has somewhere to go, but even if these clubs agree to take him, they will all put forward a condition that his fee be cut by at least half. He adds that he had not even considered these options before, since he did not expect that Falcon would soon be kicked out of the team. Joseph annoyingly notices that Falcon not only does not understand the situation, but also sincerely believes that even in Bolton he is paid too little. However, Joseph concludes that what remains unchanged is that he and his nephew have the right to choose what to do, and even if Falcon is suspended, he can still remain on the team. He recalls that there are three whole years left until the end of the contract, but there is little pleasant in this. With these words, he remembers Drake's words and becomes angry at the thought of him. Meanwhile, Richard Gears tells Drake that the reaction of the people who heard the radio broadcast had a big impact on the team and also raised the company's rating slightly, concluding that overall it was a good move. Drake muses that in the end, it's better to address the controversy head on than sit in the corner, adding that now is the time to promote ticketed events. He notes that his speech was received mostly positively and most fans calmed down a little and came to terms with the upcoming change in the team's composition. Richard Gears tells Drake that even though the conflict has subsided a little, he still needs to remain vigilant, as there will be many people who will remind them of the loss of the 27th league match. Drake thinks that this is logical, since their team is currently in last place on the list. He says, there are some positives, saying four of the six suspended players have already left the team, adding that paying contract penalties has cost a lot of money, and the budget has been cut by between £600,000 and £900,000. However, from Drake's point of view, they have cut their future costs, and now with the remaining budget, they can focus on recruiting new players. Richard Gears looks at Drake with concern, telling him that his nose is bleeding. After some time, a new football match begins, and the commentator announces the start of the 28th round of the league. He says that today's match will be between Bolton and Accrington, who finished 22nd in the league. However, the match ends in a zero, zero draw, which makes Drake very angry. Richard Gears tells the main character that today, their team played with three defenders. Drake says he's already seeing small changes in everything that's happened. According to him, even purely visually, the number of spectators has increased significantly since the previous game. He asks Richard how many tickets they sold today, to which he replies that there were 5,783 fans in the stands. He adds that this is 3,427 more people than in the previous 27th match, which Drake mentally rejoices. He reasons that his plan is finally starting to bear fruit. Meanwhile, Derek angrily glares at Drake from the football field, mentally casting every possible curse at him. He is indignant that Drake still cannot come to his senses and is angry with him, although the only one who is supposed to be angry in this situation is Derek. Drake muses that such pranks can attract spectators, but in the end, fans only want to win. From his point of view, if draws or even more so defeats continue to be repeated, then all the spectators they had collected with such difficulty will evaporate in an instant. He looks at Derek and angrily argues that the bastard continues to ignore his words, suggesting that he would be better off firing him the hell and finding someone else. He asks the club manager what is on their schedule today, to which he replies that they have an appointment with an agent firm. Drake asks Richard if this agency firm is the same one with which the previous owner entered into a contract to which he replies that this agency was directly recommended to the former owner by manager Derek Scott. Richard adds that the head of agency A, named James, personally selected potential players for them, who were subsequently hired by the previous owner, but practice has shown that the new recruits were useless. He adds that this is the main reason why the Bolton Club fell to the bottom. Drake muses that there is something wrong with this man and that it all looks a lot like some kind of corruption scheme. 
and then tells Richard that he wouldn't mind taking a walk to see this man right now. Arriving at the company, they meet James Wayne, who happily greets them. He introduces himself as the general manager of Agency A and states that he is incredibly glad to see them. Drake says that he wants to go to the main one, stating that they need a striker, a central defender, and a central midfielder, to which he replies that he will easily arrange everything. He adds that their agency is full of players of every possible position, to which Drake says that now he wants to get down to details. He tells James that the striker must be fast and nimble. He adds that he's going to place him to the right of two defenders, and with those two having to support him, then the range in which he can successfully hit the ball will be ideal. James asks Drake what he thinks about Guthrie, adding that he plays in EFL2 as the best striker. Drake looks at James in bewilderment and tries to understand whether he is seriously offering him such strange options. He asks James why he offers such expensive players, clarifying that this Guthrie is a striker who ranks first in the EFL2 rankings. James says they are desperate to stay in the league, so buying expensive strong players would be a safer bet. Drake asks James why a top-ranked EFL2 player would come to Bolton who are on the brink of relegation. James turns away thoughtfully, without giving a definite answer to Drake's question. Drake says they'll put that on hold for now, adding that he needs a centre-back with outstanding defensive skills. James asks Drake what he thinks of EFL 2's Julian, to which Drake replies that he knows he's just as precious. James offers him a player named Gabriel, adding that he is slightly cheaper than Julian. Drake replies that this player's time has passed and he no longer runs as close. Drake grits his teeth in irritation, arguing that James thinks too much of himself. James continues to look at his guests, not revealing his true intentions behind his false goodwill. He reflects that now his team is already at the bottom, noting that a little more and he will be relegated from the league, adding that he can only test how well he knows football if he puts such demands on the players. He notes that Drake's knowledge is somewhat impressive, but does not compare to his extensive experience. Drake says that based on the statistics of the last 10 EPL1 seasons, the team needs to score at least 50 points to avoid relegation. He adds that Bolton scored only 14 points in 28 matches of the season, noting that in order not to be relegated, they need at least 36 more. He continues to put pressure on James, saying that for each victory three points are awarded. Since their team plays 46 games in the season, it is vital for them to win 12 matches out of the remaining 18. James asks Drake what he wants to say, to which Drake just slams the table in irritation. He asks James if he is a professional in his field, noting that his words should have pretty accurately described the kind of player he wants. He tells James that the main rule in business is that the customer is always right. He says Bolton conceded 50 goals this season while scoring just 16. Drake adds that according to league statistics, they need to score 30 more goals to stay and also not allow more than 20 goals going forward. Richard watches Drake nervously, thinking that he doesn't understand anything. Drake hopes that everything is now clear to James. He again asks James if there are players in the agency who meet his requirements, to which James only begins to hesitate uncertainly. Drake notices James's insecurity and realizes that he does not have such players and never has had them. He gets up from his seat, saying that this is the end of their conversation. He adds that he didn't really come here to buy players, after which James asks him what he means. Drake says the Bolton Club have been working with Agency A for a long time, adding that they currently have an existing contract. James replies that this is true, to which Drake says that unfortunately, based on the data he has looked at, the players James is offering are worthless. Drake adds that he came here as a consumer to complain and cancel the contract, at which point James gets an angry grin on his face. Drake leaves, saying that next time they will meet for a more serious conversation. Suddenly, the main character stops, saying that he would like to clarify one more point. He says that Derek Scott, who is now in charge of the team's plan, was an employee of their agency, and then asks James if his information is correct. James wonders in a panic if Derek said something unnecessary while he was working in Bolton. Drake and Richard leave the agency and the club leader begins to think. He notes that Drake was very cruel, and James being always shameless turned red with anger. Drake says all the players James offered are no different from the ones he sent away. He tells Richard that he has come up with a good way to terminate the contract with Agency A. After which he notes that after listening to his speeches today, he has made his final decision. According to Drake, if everything works out, he will be able to kick out Derek Scott without any fine. He reasons that he will definitely carry out a purge, after which he will update the team and its leadership. Night falls and a light is on in one of the windows of the football club building. Richard Gears is getting ready to go home and walks down the hallway, noticing the light behind the doors. He approaches the door, 
surprised that the owner decided to stay up today, noting that he never thought that he would work so hard for Bolton. Richard recalls that the club employees do nothing but weave unpleasant gossip about him. He also recalls that the employees are sure that Drake wants to sell the club and show off with the money he earned. He notes that he himself thought so before, but soon recognized Drake as a man full of enthusiasm. From his point of view, if the owner Drake was no different from his grandfather, then Bolton would continue to fall to the bottom. He sums up his idea, coming to the conclusion that in order for efforts to bear fruit, mere words are not enough, since the owner is required to be able to manage the team and the company, and since he has decided to take control of the entire work of the club, it is on his shoulders there is a big burden. Drake greets the club leader, saying that he is very glad to see him. He barbecues with his brother Nathan, saying he came just in time. Richard Gears freezes in amazement, not finding the strength to answer anything. After some time, he asks Drake what he is doing, to which Drake replies that they made great ramen. Richard asks why he chose this particular location, to which Drake calmly replies that it's his office anyway, so there's nothing wrong with it. With these words, he hands Richard a package of ramen, saying that they have another one. He looks at him kindly and asks him what he will choose between chopsticks and a fork. Drake and Nathan begin to eat, and Richard sits shyly in his chair, thinking that he was sure that Drake was immersed in work. Drake says it's some of the best ramen he's ever eaten, while Richard Gears is still wondering if it's right to eat in the club owner's office. Drake asks Richard if he has learned anything about Derek Scott, bringing him to his senses. Richard says that, in his opinion, he is a common parasite, from which there is no benefit, to which Drake says that he agrees with this, asking him not to hold back his expressions. Richard adds that the relationship between him and his former owner became very distant after he became director. He recalls that it was very difficult for him to silently observe what was happening, especially due to the fact that the previous owner did not even look at the plan for the upcoming games, while Scott took advantage of this attitude and threw dust in his eyes, easily manipulating. Drake tells Richard that he's certainly been through a lot working with a jerk like Derek. With these words, he hands Richard a bottle of soju, saying that in combination with ramen it is the best cure for suffering, to which Richard says that he will drink only one glass. Richard asks Drake how long he has been drinking like this, to which Drake replies that he does it not so often and only in memory of his homeland. Drake congratulates Richard on his first drink and they clink glasses for some soju. After some time, a fairly tipsy Richard Gear says that this is the best thing he has ever drunk. Drake and Nathan, while still sober, mentally note that while drunk, Richard turned out to be surprisingly talkative. Meanwhile, Richard Gears, having gained a taste for it, asks Drake and Nathan to pour him another glass. They agree, and the whole night passes by talking and drinking. In the morning, Richard Gears gets up, holding his head, which hurts from a hangover, and asks for forgiveness from his drinking buddies, saying that he hasn't drank so much for a long time. Nathan says it's no big deal, and Drake notes that his brother seems to have a pretty bad tolerance for alcohol. Drake turns to Richard and says that he has something he would like to show him. Richard curiously asks Drake what he is offering him, to which he replies that this is a complete list of players recommended by Agency A. Drake says that after carefully studying these documents, he realized that Derek Scott had two relatives here. Richard notes that such detailed details were not included in the players' profiles and asks Drake where he got such information. Drake says that when he has free time, he visits the first team's training center to keep himself in shape adding that during these trainings he got to know some of the players. Drake continues the story, saying that when they became friends enough, they shared some secrets with him, noting that among other things, some players complained about nepotism in assigning players to the team. Nathan studies the documents, saying that he is familiar with this scheme, since they have already encountered this in the Korean Third League. He recalls an incident when the manager's son brought his players to the team through an agency, and later it was revealed that they were his relatives, but when information about this hit the media, he was not only fired from his job, but also prosecuted. Richard Gears says that if Derek really did something like this, it is a very serious crime. Richard asks Drake if they should report this to the police and seek legal proceedings, to which Drake responds that this would be the best option, but it would take a lot of time and cause a lot of unnecessary headaches. Nathan asks Drake how they can bring Derek Scott to light. Drake asks Nathan who the last player purchased from the agency was, to which his brother states that he can find out. He immediately asks Drake why he needs this if he fired all the players from there. Drake says that he can try to negotiate with them, to which Nathan asks him in surprise what kind of agreement Drake can offer them. Drake approaches Richard Gears, asking him for a recommendation to several companies, 
so that they would get the impression that Drake is an extremely reliable person. Richard Gears asks Drake what he is up to, to which he replies that he has a great plan and he needs people to help implement it. He also adds that there is a person on his team who is excellent at talking to other people. Drake asks Nathan and Richard if they agree to help him, to which they answer that they will definitely do what is required of them. Nathan offers to start work, saying that first Drake needs to outline his plan in more detail. Drake enthusiastically replies that his plan is to re-enter the League and start a war, adding that this is Bolton's main problem. Meanwhile, at the Bolton Wanderers' reception, a regular working day employee named Tom Robertson passes by. He asks his colleague if he has heard any strange rumours in recent days. A colleague asks him what he means, and Tom explains his thought, saying that Agency A again came to sell them new players at exorbitant prices, adding that they again managed to hit the big jackpot by pushing mediocre and worthless players into the team. A colleague asks him in surprise whether this is really true, to which Tom replies that it is already clear to everyone that Bolton will soon fall apart, so the agency decided to take advantage of this opportunity. He adds that the club's new owner is frantically recruiting cheap players for next season, adding that in his opinion it is still a waste of time and money. A colleague says that if this is true, it makes it even worse for the players who were recently fired. He asks Thomas how he knew about this, to which he replies that every second person in the organization already knows about it, adding that nevertheless, they should keep their conversation a secret. The next day in the training room locker room, Falcon Jones laces up his boots. Suddenly he hears a conversation between two people who are talking about something secret. Falcon decides to eavesdrop on them and hears that one of the speakers says that he is very close to the guys from the marketing department. He adds that he was told something about certain people and he thinks that the owner of the club is right after all. His interlocutor asks if he means Agency A, which sells players at inflated prices, to which he replies that he meant them, amazed at where they get so much money from. The interlocutor continues his story, saying that he heard that the owner is going to recruit new players using money from the sale of old ones, adding that in his opinion, the owner has decided to completely change the roster. His interlocutor says that he agrees with his point of view, adding that due to the fact that there was a rumor that Agency A is selling garbage players for gold, most clubs will probably refuse to cooperate with them, to which the first person asks if there is the likelihood that no one will hire the fired players anywhere else. His interlocutor says that everything will happen exactly like this, adding that if he were the club owners, he would immediately leave such an agency, after which Falcon Jones thinks about whether the agency where his uncle works is really carrying out such murky schemes. He thinks hard about how this could even happen. Meanwhile, on social networks on the Bolton forum, users say that they have heard about the impending trial between Bolton and Agency A. Drake, pretending to be a forum user, begins to spread rumors about this, adding that his friend is a member of Agency A, who confirmed this information to him, noting that all the players that this agency sells are mediocre. He puts down the tablet, having previously written that the prices for players in this agency are too high. He slumps back in his chair, chuckling contentedly, to which Richard tells her that he has exceeded all his expectations. Drake says that the rumors spread so quickly that it didn't even take a day for everyone to know about it, to which Richard replies that they did a good job. Drake says happily that he thinks their plan will reach the final phase much faster than he expected. After a few seconds, the office phone on Drake's desk begins to ring loudly. Drake picks up the phone and the secretary tells him that the interview with the local newspaper will begin in five minutes, to which he replies that he will arrive there as soon as possible. He gets up from his seat and says that the timing is just perfect for his plans. Drake calls Richard to follow him, saying that it's time for them to clean up the trash. Drake gives an interview to a journalist, saying that time for change is the true face of Bolton Wanderers, adding that rumours have begun to circulate that manager Derek Scott is closely linked to the A agency. Drake adds that unfortunately this is true, as he even had a list of players in his hands. Derek Scott reads Derek's interview and with trembling hands admits to himself that he doesn't believe his eyes. He starts yelling at Drake in anger, saying that he doesn't even dare talk about him like that. This interview also quickly reached the ears of James Wayne, who hastened to cut off all ties with Bolton and hastily laid low. He immediately called Derek and said that until Bolton changed their policy and stopped sacking their players, they would not deal with him. Also, after this, all the players who were fired from the team also took out their dissatisfaction on him while he could not object to them. He notes that Drake may be crazy, but he was smart enough to set him up in an interview. Derek suspects that Drake and James Wayne may have made a deal to kick him out of the Bolton club. 
An irritated Derek tells himself that Drake is an Asian bastard who is deliberately setting everything up to get him fired, and then comes to Drake in person to complain. Drake, calmly eating noodles, asks Derek what he means. Derek says that Drake doesn't have to play dumb, adding that everyone already knows that it was he himself who spread the rumors discrediting Derek. Drake says he doesn't understand what he's talking about, adding that if there are strange rumors going around the club, he will report it to him immediately, to which Derek tells him that there are rumors going around the club that he is collaborating with Agency A and recruiting weak players for a high price, and as evidence, Drake has a list of all the agency's players. Drake continues to eat his ramen calmly, saying that he now understands what he means. He tells Derek that he never said anything like that in his interview. Derek says he clearly saw Drake say he wanted to invest more in players, but the budget wouldn't allow for it during his interview with the local press. Derek asks Drake if he remembers these words, to which Derek replies that he did say that, but he did not make any investments in Agency A. Derek mentally tells himself that Drake is a crazy bastard, while Drake says that he has a list of players associated with the agency, but he should already know this, adding that he was simply recommended some players. But for some unknown reason, this is why strange rumors arose from this. With these words, he notes that Derek is very biased towards him, asking him what he doesn't like about his proposed plan. Derek fumes with anger, arguing that Drake is acting like a big child and playing dumb. The main character puts the ramen on the table, saying that now it's time to talk about other rumors. He tells Derek that it appears two of his relatives are among the Bolton players, asking him if the rumors are true. Drake says he saw it in one of the documents, adding that he also found it in a list he received that belonged to Agency A. Derek wonders what Drake is getting at as he continues to pester him about it being time to check their game stats. Drake says that these players have very sad results, asking Derek if he finds this strange. Drake turns the tablet towards Derek, which shows an article exposing illegal collusion between Derek and the agency, asking him if he wants to look at the information about it. The article contains information that Owen Doyle, who has a contract with Agency A, claims that the decision to release six Bolton players was made by Scott and James. The article also says that Scott and James convinced Doyle to become part of their dubious adventure, promising that a contract with Bolton would allow him to receive a larger fee than anywhere else. Derek's face changes as Drake stands up abruptly from his seat, looking at him menacingly. Derek says he doesn't understand where this information came from, trying to come up with some kind of excuse. Drake says he's heard enough, asking him if he thinks he doesn't know anything. He glares at Derek, saying that he will see him in court, calling Derek a greedy pig. After this, the situation calmed down, and the investigation soon established the circumstances of corruption between Scott and James. During the investigation, it was also revealed that the amounts for the transfer of players were significantly higher than reported to the EFA, thanks to which he concealed part of the income, receiving undue benefits from this. James Wayne was accused of forgery and money laundering, and the EFA banned Agency A from working with clubs in the third and higher leagues for the next five years. As a result, Agency A filed an appeal with the arbitration court, which was accepted for consideration, but the subsequent demand from Agency A to compensate for damage to their reputation was rejected. Drake muses that he has asked for about 3 billion Korean won in compensation for the damage he caused, adding that once they receive the money, their budget will be enough to attract three good EFL1 players, after which he muses that it will take some time until all legal proceedings are completed, but it will be difficult for one agent to convince the EFA to change its decision. Drake also notes with satisfaction that at the same time the coaching staff was reduced even without a fine or payments, noting that this is a huge step towards success, and now all that remains is to walk the path of the winner. After some time, the next match begins, in which Bolton Wanderers again do not perform at a good level. The commentator notes that the score was restored in the 43rd minute of the second half, adding that Bolton were losing again, noting that even after the departure of Derek Scott, Bolton continued to play in a formation with three defenders. Drake understands that Derek Scott's assistant has taken over as interim head coach. The commentator says that in the 29th round of the league, the match between Bolton and Bristol ended with a score of 1-0. Drake grabs a chair in anger, yelling at his team to play better. He wants to break the window with his chair, thinking that nothing has changed in the team's game, but his assistants hold him back. After a while, Nathan sits next to Drake, who is trying to come to his senses. Drake sadly says that he thought things would change with Derek Scott gone, to which Nathan tells him that Drake should get some rest adding that he is very exhausted. Drake gets up from the couch and curses loudly, 
saying that he doesn't understand why things are happening the way they are. Drake says that the problem is not only with the players, but also with the new coach, to which Nathan replies that this is true, adding that judging by the last game, the team was using the old schemes, which suggests that Derek's influence remains despite his departure. Drake says that the problem is that the new coach studied Derek a lot, to which Nate suggests that his brother hire a new coach. Drake says that this is the only way out, emphasizing that otherwise nothing will change, after which he says that unfortunately, it will not be easy to find someone willing to join the collapsing team. He asks if there are any good trainers for a low fee, to which Nate says that he can't advise anything on that. He adds that Drake is the owner of the club after all, giving Drake a brilliant idea. Nathan says Drake will have to take care of all this trouble himself. Noticing that the main character has changed his face, Nathan asks him why he made such a serious face, adding that he should not take his words so personally, after which he expresses confidence that Drake will be able to find a suitable trainer. He asks Drake why he keeps looking like he's posing for an interview, adding that it looks a little disgusting. Drake congratulates Nathan, saying that at 21 he has come a long and hard way, thanks to which he is now the head coach of the team. Nathan asks Drake if he is confident in his decision, to which he replies that Nathan will now be the head coach. Nathan hugs his brother, saying that his grandmother was right when she told him to be friends with him. He reflects on the fact that he has now become the head coach of EFL1, although until recently he was a coach of K3 and could not even dream of such a thing. Suddenly the catch of this situation dawns on him and he asks Drake to hold his horses. He asks his brother who would be the manager if he suddenly decided to appoint him as head coach, to which Drake says that there is no catch. He asks Nathan to trust him, trying to impress him with a very confident look. Drake says that as Nathan already knows, he will now be taking on a new role as owner and manager of the club. He asks Nathan if he will be able to get the team back on its feet, to which Nathan wearily reflects on the fact that Drake has decided to put the entire burden on him. Drake reflects on the fact that there are a lot of weirdos among club owners, noting that there have been cases where the owner himself played in the first team. He also notes that there were often cases when celebrities and stars were invited to the team. The main character says that compared to these idiots, he is not such an eccentric, since he has experience in sports and an understanding of football tactics. However, nevertheless, on the Bolton Forum, the news that Drake will now be personally responsible for strategies for games turned out to be more than shocking news. At the coaches' meeting, Drake says that 29 games have already been played, and by his calculations, there are still 17 games left to play. Drake says they must win at least 12 games to remain in EFL 1. Drake says that due to the disbandment of the main roster and Derek Scott's betrayal, the team's morale has noticeably decreased, noting that this was unfortunately inevitable. He states that now they do not have time to sit in despondency and be sad. Drake's speech is interrupted by one of the analysts, saying that he has thoughts on this matter. An analyst named Neil Rose says that a team needs a win to boost morale and gain strength to fight on. He honestly admits that he was somewhat disappointed with the changes, to which Drake replies that if they wanted to stay in the league so much, they would have found a replacement for Derek Scott. The coaching staff irritably reflects on the fact that they spent years training the players, and Drake appoints a new head coach without even telling them a word, noting that Drake is too arrogant towards his employees. They conclude that Drake may be a good manager, but taking professional football lightly is simply stupid. Drake asks everyone to not hold back if they have something to say, adding that he will listen to every piece of advice they have. After this, he states that if they want to discuss his decisions, then they can forget about it, since they will be wasting their precious time. Neil Rose irritably slams his fist on the table to protest the decision. Drake says that this season he plans to make do with only his knowledge, noting that if his decision turns out to be wrong and the reporters continue to press them, they will have something to answer them. The main character says that they can answer that Drake has his own plans for this. Drake says that's the end of his thought, and the trainers wonder if Drake came from North Korea. Drake says that they can curse him as much as they want, but not during work and meetings, adding that he is not one to listen to it silently. He adds that if they want to discuss it with him, then they should do it behind his back. After some time, he calls Nathan's office and places a huge stack of papers in front of him, saying that these are materials that he needs to study. Drake says he also needs to organize a training plan for the team's players, adding that he has already selected six key players. Nathan says that this will take a lot of time, asking him if it will be possible to quickly rebuild everything with the help of a new composition. Drake says that in order to solve the problems they currently have, things need to change aggressively. Nathan says public opinion of him has now deteriorated, 
and his safety is at risk, adding that football-mad hooligans are common among fans in England. Drake says that it was for this reason that he decided to live in the club office, in order to avoid this whole situation, to which Nathan says that most likely he did it to save on rent. Drake says that those who have not yet recognised him as a leader will be fired unconditionally, adding that players who are not useful to his tactics can also go through the woods along with those players whose salaries are too high and do not match their skills. Nathan says that this is not a change, but a massive reduction in the team. He notes that, however, given his recent statement, his logic can be understood in wondering whether he will be fine. Drake notes that after his official announcement, as he expected, the crowd responded with heated discussions and large bets on Bolton's elimination. Dante notes that they urgently need to recruit new players. He recalls that for four average-priced players, he would have to pay around £600,000, but their situation requires not just average players, but the most effective for their strategy. He adds that they need money to support the players, but now the money needs to be invested in resources that will pay off well in the future, realising that, moreover, his tactics definitely need a guy with fast feet. Suddenly, Drake gets a great idea and begins to think actively. Drake recalls that in Korea, he knew a player named Park Chung Ah, who was very fast and scored goals at lightning speed. He recalls that they became good friends from that match and now sometimes communicate. He reflects that Park Chung is very easy to communicate and was born in England, which means he has a mixed origin and will have no problems getting used to the new club and will not have problems obtaining a visa. Drake notes that he doesn't know if he's in the K3 league now, but he's probably still as agile and fast. Drake dials Park Chung's number and greets him, asking how he's doing. He adds that he recently heard that he was fired, to which he asks him if he wants to make fun of him to which Drake says that he was sure that Pack would be fired. He adds that all this happened because the head coach did not understand how to use him correctly in the game, adding that even if he has all the skills, he will be useless without good tactics that utilize your strengths. Drake says he's just the man who knows how to make him a great player. Park Chung asks Drake what he means, to which he replies that he wants him as his player. After some time, Park Chung comes to England and Drake hires him, causing discontent among fans. After some time, Dominic Shield, nicknamed the Iron Wall, signed a contract with the Bolton Club. Dominic became a first-team defender at a cost of just £400,000 and, despite his slowness, proved to be very good in defence. Fans once again explode with angry comments, to which Drake points out that despite their opinions, Dominique is a great acquisition. The next day, Richard Gears comes to Drake, saying that the sale of players from the release list is completed. He adds that the cost of annual wages for first-team players has been cut by £9 million. He also notes that overall the club has successfully reduced its budget to £2.7 million per year. Drake is delighted that his financial decisions have paid off. Richard said that the number of players was reduced to 16 and all the remaining players were paid below the EFL1 average. Drake asks Richard if he is worried, to which he asks what Drake means. Drake says he means his actions, adding that everyone says he changes plans too quickly and criticises him for it. Richard says that he completely agrees with Drake's decisions adding that without him, they would not have been able to get out of this crisis. Drake asks Richard what they will do if his strategy fails and nothing works out. Drake admits to himself that he would be lying if he said he wasn't worried. He recalls that fans, the media, and even the club's management show an extremely negative reaction to his reforms, adding that he involuntarily begins to think that perhaps they are right and his actions could lead to big problems in the future. Richard says it's been a little over a month since he entrusted himself to Drake, adding that it was fairly recent. He says he was taken aback by Drake's actions, but he is confident that Drake is not the type to act thoughtlessly. Richard says that he's noticed that the players they've hired have something in common, to which Drake replies that Bolton are mostly played by average players, so they need a couple of people who are good at their jobs. Richard says that Drake stands out among all the other owners of the company because he cares more about the prosperity of the company than anyone else. He adds that he shouldn't listen to thugs who criticise his every move because now is the time to move forward. He tells Drake that even if they face setbacks, he must not give up and keep going. He also notes that if nothing works out, he will stand in the forefront of the crowd scolding him. He explains his words by saying that before he became manager of the club, he was one of Bolton's biggest fans, which brings a respectful smile to Drake's face. Richard says that they can wish them luck and then leaves Drake's office. Drake notes that this was the most memorable encouragement he's ever heard noting that he was threatened at the end, but somehow his doubts disappeared and he can now move on without any worries. After some time, 
Drake comes to the training field at Bolton Stadium to check on how the training is going. Drake pulls out a loudspeaker and asks everyone for a few minutes of attention. He greets them by saying that as of today, he is not only the owner, but also the managing manager, immediately warning that any disregard for his plans and tactics will result in immediate suspension from the game. He says that by this point, the players themselves understood this, adding that if anyone has any objections or dissatisfaction, they can safely get up and leave. Drake announces that their next opponents are a Manchester team called Rochdale, adding that since they are serious rivals, Drake and his team will have to show them the full strength of Bolton, after which he says that for the next match, he plans to select players who are good, will show themselves in training, regardless of their rating or bet size. Drake says that if any of the new guys want to make the team, they'll have to train hard, while one of the players says in frustration that he's getting more bored by the minute. This player turns out to be Derek Scott's starting midfielder named Victor Johnson, who declares that Drake is a coma and is already shaking up his rights here, expressing doubts that he even knows how to correctly draw up game tactics. Drake continues to give out commands, while Victor wonders why he is trying so hard, noting that nothing will work anyway. He notes that he never thought that the day would come when he would play with Asians, turning his gaze to Park Chung, adding that one of the Asians was too keen on being a coach and the other didn't even look like a professional. He notices the efforts of the newcomers and reflects that they really were inspired by his words and really want to get into the main team, after which he is surprised that Drake seriously wants to put these ignoramuses against Rochdale. Having looked at them carefully, he admits to himself that they do not evoke any emotions in him except laughter. A few days later, the Bolton Wanderers manager begins a press conference on the preparation for the match with Rochdale, in which Drake is told that over the past month, they have halved the club's roster. They ask Drake if he is aware that fans are extremely unhappy with this state of affairs, also asking about the reason for the inclusion of a recently hired player in the main roster. Drake mentally notes that these questions of the same type are beginning to irritate him, since they are all directly related to him. He notes that he does not feel any difference between reporters from Korea and England. He remembers Richard's encouraging words that he shouldn't listen to any scumbags who will be unhappy with his decisions anyway and just move on. He gathers his strength and loudly declares that everything is exactly as the journalists say. He states that he has long wanted to become a leader, expressing confidence that he will succeed, after which he says that all the reporters present here became them because they found their calling in this, which makes him very similar to them. He also says that the player Park Chung is a person with whom he was once on the same team, so he knows his abilities very well, and it is quite natural to attract talented people to the team. Drake notes that he is well aware that this information will do nothing to reduce the anger of fans and then offers a bold bet to calm the fans. He explains his decision, saying that he wants to make a real bet. He says that if he loses at least once in the next three matches, which will include the upcoming match with Rochdale, he will immediately resign as head of Bolton. The reporters freeze in amazement and an awkward silence hangs in the room for a while. Without waiting for the next questions, Drake gets up from his seat saying that this concludes the press conference. A few seconds later, someone turns off the broadcast of this press conference on the TV, grinning slightly. Rochdale team coach Daniel Bertland, showing this broadcast to his colleagues, says that their opponent has decided to go to the end. He adds that Bolton Wanderers are just amateurs, noting that he finds it hard to believe that such a team managed to sneak into League One. With these words, he turns to his colleagues and asks them what they think about this. His colleagues respond that this game will be as easy as playing against a team that does not have a coach, after which they are interested in whether Drake has come up with at least some tactics against them, simultaneously dubbing him an ordinary upstart and offering to give the main team a day off by sending him to field of substitute players. They add that he feels a little sorry for the owner of the Bolton club, since his first match as the team's chief tactician will definitely end in a crushing defeat and he will immediately resign as manager. Daniel Bertland reflects that Derek Scott was a guy whose experience could not be ignored, adding that the Bolton club were greatly weakened by having an inexperienced boy in the place of a professional coach. Having seen the scandalous press conference, Emma Charlotta walks down the corridor, announcing her approach with the loud and confident click of her heels. She unceremoniously enters Derek's office, demanding a few minutes of attention. Derek asks her what happened, saying that he is very busy with important things right now. Emma angrily states that she has prepared answers to every question he could possibly be asked, adding that she's less concerned about Drake ignoring her work than he is about him jeopardizing the fate of the entire club. 
Drake sluggishly replies that journalists love to punch them in the gut and he just played along with them. To which Emma replies that inciting Drake to make crazy statements was what the journalists are trying to achieve. Emma indignantly says that she emphasized all the important points for Drake, rhetorically asking him why he could not control himself, and then asks what kind of bet he mentioned in the interview. Drake tries to answer evasively, which infuriates Emma Charlotte even more. Emma loudly demands that Drake stop acting like a little child, saying that words thoughtlessly thrown in a momentary impulse put their club and its reputation in a very precarious position. She reflects that the manager, Richard Gears, has complete trust in the owner, but she does not have that luxury. Drake calmly asks Emma Charlotte to just trust him and his actions. He explains that he did not blurt out anything in a fit of emotion, but said a speech planned from the very beginning. Emma states that this is a blatant lie, since no one will deliberately risk their reputation, to which Drake calmly replies that he absolutely calmly went for it. Emma angrily asks Drake if he considers everything that is happening to be some kind of game, adding that he is too confident in himself. Emma says that it would be great if they actually got three wins in a row, as Drake said, and then asks him about the guarantee that they can actually do this without losing a single game. In response to this, Drake names his three future rivals, who are Rochdale, Salopia and Victoria. He adds that all three teams are bottom of the league and would therefore be ideal opponents for Bolton Wanderers. Emma says that Drake's words are not far from the truth, but Bolton Wanderers are even lower on the list, to which Drake replies that that is why he plans to move it up. He notes that the difference between Bolton Wanderers and their opponents is only in the skill of the players, which he plans to significantly improve, adding that this is why he called these opponents very convenient, since now everything will depend on the coach and strategy and not on the specific composition of the players. Emma irritably wonders why Drake thinks he's better than all the club's coaches and analysts. She remembers that Drake inherited this club and knows nothing about football, wondering what his self-confidence rests on. Drake asks Emma if she knows that bad people are always more popular than good people. Emma asks Drake what he means, to which he replies that he is the perfect villain for the media. He says that the media portrays him as an owner who tried to sell the club, after which he fired the team's old players and earned the universal hatred of the fans. Drake says that in their eyes he is the very embodiment of evil and deceit. He adds that fans with all their might wish him to die as soon as possible and leave the post of team leader. But at the same time, they absolutely do not expect that someone like him is perfectly able to draw up strategic plans. Emma pauses for a moment, lowering her gaze, and Drake realizes that he managed to convey his idea to her. Drake says he intentionally stoked the flames of hatred and bet on his coaching abilities in the next three matches knowing that fans and opponents would be eagerly awaiting his mistakes. Drake tells Emma that everyone will be watching with interest as the self-confident villain falls before everyone's eyes, and Emma understands that Drake was guided by the desire to attract as many spectators as possible to the matches. She asks Drake if this was his plan, to which he snaps his fingers in delight. He tells Emma that she catches everything on the fly, praising her for her intelligence. Emma falls silent again, not believing what she just heard. She is again indignant saying that even if this was his plan, it is still absurd, to which Drake replies that in order to fill the empty stands, something has to be sacrificed. He asks Emma to remember one very important thing that he is about to say. He states that he will never take his club lightly as he is the owner, and if the club goes bankrupt, his life will also be ruined. He asks Emma to show him all her love for this club and work with double enthusiasm, adding that he will work with her with no less dedication and will definitely bring victory to the club. After some time, the 30th round of the league begins, in which Bolton Wanderers meet in a match against the Rochdale team at Bolton's home stadium. The commentator announces the exit of the teams and the coaches following them, and Drake hears the dissatisfied screams of the Bolton fans, who promise to strangle him if their team loses today. Drake calmly waves to the crowd, thanking them for their loyalty and support for Bolton Football Club. Daniel Bertland reflects that Drake is a typical kid who just wants the attention of the crowd. Bertland turns to the stands, discovering that the fans are just as unhappy to see him, saying that they only support him because he is Drake's opponent today. Daniel Bertland mentally admits to himself that he's sorry to see this, but he will soon make up for it when he smashes the Bolton club to the wall. His assistant says that there are quite a lot of spectators here, to which he replies that he heard that about 32,000 tickets were sold. The assistant says that he thought that this was only possible for big teams like Sunderland, to which he replies that he replies that everyone wanted to see the personal humiliation of the owner of the Bolton Club. 
He mentally notes that the spectators did not come here for the players, since most of them are no names for the football audience, and that guy of Asian appearance was actually recruited because of some kind of internal affairs with the owner. The commentator says the game starts with Bolton attacking, and Bertland is excited about Drake giving it his all in the first and last game. Suddenly he notices a change on the football field, while the commentator says that Dignity is sending the ball straight towards the goal. The commentator looks at Park Chung, noting that he is catching up to the ball thanks to his incredible speed, saying that he quickly managed to narrow the angle of attack at such an unexpected speed. Park Chung strikes with lightning speed, stunning the goalkeeper and scoring the first goal of the match. The Rochdale coaches look on in shock as Nathan jumps up and down in joy. Bolton fans cheer, jumping to their feet and chanting the team name. The commentator happily says that Bolton Wanderers opened the scoring in the seventh minute of the match, adding that dubious recruitment turned into a convincing first goal in the debut match. Nathan says he is shocked by what happened, happily noting that he could not have expected such good results. He reflects that Park Chung, who had no place in the K3 league, has now scored his first goal. He turns his head and Drake turned to the stands with a feeling of superiority and without mincing words, tells them that it's all thanks to him. He continues to shout at them while the fans change their anger to mercy, saying that they adore him. He turns around and sees Park Chung, who looks at him happily, running closer. Drake muses that he can't believe Park scored on his debut, just like he did back then, noting that he told him to just run for the goal. Drake realizes that the opponent's strength against them is not 1.5, but close to 1.7, noting that the opponent was careless, and if their defensive line had played seriously, they would not have snatched the goal so easily. He walks up to Park Jung and hugs him, saying that he is very proud of him. Daniel Bertland nervously says that it doesn't mean anything because he's just letting his guard down and they can score the return goal right away. However, the commentator immediately notes that a player named Quick Floyd takes over the ball. He notes that Quick handles the ball very skillfully dashingly spinning it to pass. Park Chung again throws towards the ball, flying towards the goal, and the commentator says that he is still as fast in his attacks. Park Chung kicks the ball, but the ball misses the goal, and the commentator notes that he was grabbed by his clothes, so he did not have time to aim properly. Bertland's assistant asks him if he should hold back their offensive line, to which he muses that he switched them to a more aggressive formation in order to even the score, but this did not help. He looks at Park Chung and asks why the hell he is so fast. Drake praises Park Chung, telling him to enjoy his position. He puts his hand on his shoulder, saying that he scored a goal in the first seven minutes, but the match is not over yet, and it is too early for them to talk about victory, so they need a second goal. He tells Park Jung that he scored a goal and now the opponents know about his speed, and then asks what his actions are. Park Chung suggests that now he should also run and divert attention to himself. Drake says that Park Chung is right in suggesting that he constantly be an eyesore for his opponent, while in the penalty area, adding that there is nothing wrong with the fact that he cannot immediately find a good angle and he just needs to be there constantly. Drake tells Park Chung that football is a very tough fight and he begins to wonder if Drake expects him to score another goal, noting that he's not sure about it, but he knows for sure that Drake has some kind of plan. After a while, the commentator announces that there are only 12 minutes left in normal time while Dalekit flanks the enemy, rushing forward. Park Chung watches him closely realizing that he is about to make a deceptive maneuver. The commentator notes a successful pass aimed straight at the goal. Drake notices this maneuver, thinking that this is a great opportunity. Park Chung receives a pass from Dalekit and begins to run towards the opponent's goal. Daniel Bertland yells at his team to keep their eyes open and hold him. He orders the players to remove him from the danger zone, adding that Park Chung must not reach the goal. One of the Rochdale players can't think of anything better than a forbidden move and tries to trip Park Chung but Drake mentally notes that he ordered him to be an eyesore for this very reason. The hook succeeds, and Park Chung falls to the ground at high speed, hitting his shoulder on the hard ground. The referee does not allow such violations and immediately blows his whistle, stopping the match. The commentator reports that the referee is awarding a penalty because the Rochdale defender fouled the player in the penalty area, while Park Chung tells the referee that he should have given the player a red card. Bertland looks on with irritation, calling his players worthless idiots. Drake muses that a red card in football means a player is sent off for the rest of the match, adding that the manager's tactics are simply disgusting. He notes that the current Rochdale team cannot work coherently, and this did not catch the eye until their dark horse named Park Chung scored an unexpected goal, attracting all the eyes of the opponents. According to Drake's plan, 
This decision opens the way for the rest of the Bolton Wanderers team. Drake also recalls that the Bolton team, however, did not have a player who could confidently take responsibility for a goal at such a crucial moment, so it would be difficult for them to hope for additional points under normal conditions. In the end, Drake decides to bet that the opposing team will be too concerned with their main weapon, which only lured them into the penalty area. This maneuver worked, and Park was able to successfully score another goal into the opponent's goal via a penalty kick. The crowd erupts into cheers again, chanting the name of their favorite team. Drake looks at them proudly, saying that they should not have underestimated his strategic genius. He notes irritably that just a couple of goals was enough to make them happy, while the commentator announces the end of the first half. The commentator adds that the result of the first half is Bolton's superiority, causing Daniel Bertland to grit his teeth in anger. Arriving at his team's locker room, he calls them idiots, asking them when they will come to their senses and how they can possibly be two goals behind the weakest team in the league. He tells his team that in the second half, the opponents will play pretend football, stretching out the time as much as possible to win, and asks them how they are now going to score goals. His assistant says that such tactics are typical of the Middle East, and Bolton's owner is from Korea, to which he rudely replies that this is all Asia. He adds that even if Bolton is not an Asian team, a situation in which a weak team, the first to score a goal against a strong one, will play for time as much as possible in the second half, will be quite natural and expected. He concludes that they cannot easily lose to the newcomers, so they will have to change tactics in the second half. Daniel Bertland suggests an attack from all directions, noting that the opposing team has only recently been assembled, which means they have not yet played well and do not know how to react correctly to pressure. From his point of view, when using this strategy, if they score a return goal, then Bolton Wanderers will lose their rhythm and victory will be in their pocket, then says that if they cannot pull it off against such a weak team, then they will not be able to be considered professionals. He asks his team if they understand everything, to which they unanimously affirm in the affirmative. The second half of the match begins, and the commentator reports that this time the Rochdale team is starting the attack. Suddenly, Daniel Bertland's face changes, stunned by Team Bolton's strategy. The commentator enthusiastically notes that he did not expect the Bolton team to put such pressure on the opponent from the very beginning of the second half. He adds that Bolton are two goals ahead and Rochdale can only hold their breath. Nathan admits to his brother that he is very worried about the outcome of this match. He asks Drake if they really need to play so aggressively when they are already winning, to which Drake just breaks into a satisfied smile. Some time ago, when Park Chung scored the second goal from the penalty spot, the commentator said that the Bolton team was confidently taking the lead. During the celebrations, the commentator states that with an additional goal, the gap between the teams increases to two points. Nathan said that now they just need to stall for time and build a tight defense in the second half, but Drake categorically rejects this idea. He is surprised to ask Drake why he decided this and what prevents them from playing conservatively. Drake says that people came here to see drama, so they can't disappoint them. In the present tense, the commentator reports that all Bolton players, apart from Dominic Shield, are on this side of the field and are putting powerful pressure on the Rochdale defensive line, suggesting that they want to increase the gap even more. Drake says that this is no longer a game of chance, but a real psychological war. He notes that you only need to watch one or two Bolton games to understand that this team is very weak in defense, and it will be a real miracle if they do not score the ball into their own goal, trying to clumsily block the opponent's attack. Drake says that their pressure on their defensive line is not really an attack, from his point of view, there is really no need for them to attack now, but they still need to remain very persistent, being in a state of aggressive defense. The commentator reports that Light cannot cope with the pressure and knocks the ball straight at the goalkeeper. A goalkeeper named Gordon receives the ball and passes a very long pass. Drake explains that the biggest disadvantage of pressing tactics is that players rushing forward to attack are weak against long passes aimed behind them. However, if you place a good defender in the rear, this disadvantage can be well compensated. The commentator states that Dominic, left in defense, confidently receives the ball, hitting it with his head. Drake says that against the clunky strikes of Rochdale's fringe players, he brought in Dominic, who has refined skills with the ball in the air. Bolton centre-back Quincy Quick Floyd rushes forward to intercept the ball. Drake turns his attention to Floyd, reflecting on the fact that he made a bet on this player for a reason. He recalls that he is 184 centimeters tall, which is quite short for a central defender. However, according to Drake, Quincy's distinguishing feature is his fantastic ball control, 
which allows him to easily pass his opponents and quickly get ahead. Nathan shouts to Floyd that he is a great guy, to which Drake asks him if it's time for them to call him Quick Flash. Nathan asks him if this nickname is the name of some superhero, to which he replies that he reads his thoughts. Meanwhile, the commentator is shouting with delight as Quick Floyd instantly moves deep into the Rochdale defense from the right flank. Quick Floyd approaches the opponent's goal and Park Chung waves to him, asking him to pass the ball to him. The defenders are catching up with Floyd, trying to prevent his deception. One of them tries to knock the ball away from Floyd, closing the hole in his defense. However, Floyd manages to react to this, placing his foot on the ball and preventing his opponent from knocking it out. Using a skillful feint, Quick Floyd passes the ball to Delicate, who runs up from behind. Nathan says he's very impressed with Floyd's skills, to which Drake replies that it's not that simple. He adds that Floyd does not know how to set up a normal trip, adding that he does not know how to do anything except dribble. Drake says the reason Floyd is at fullback is because despite his level of dribbling, his attack is terrible, so he has no use as a striker. But it wouldn't be fair to leave him to rot on the bench, and he could be used instead use at least in the central position. Drake says he put him in as a pass defender for another reason. He adds that a wide forward dribbling as aggressively as he does now cannot help but attract all the attention of the opposition. But once everyone falls under his spell, they will lose sight of the forwards flying like a rudder. Park Chung shouts that the time has come and Delicate passes him a lightning fast pass. The commentator shouts that Delicate throws a forward pass, adding that the left side of the field is practically empty and the ball flies straight there without any difficulty. Park Chung jumps up and the commentator says that this is his chance to score a goal with his head. Unfortunately, however, Park Chung's skills are not enough and he misses the soccer ball. However, another Bolton striker runs up to his aid, delivering an unexpected powerful header directly at the ball. The goalkeeper tries to catch the ball but he fails and Bolton earns another point in this match. The commentator loudly reports that a player named Slow Bulky brought the team another point by scoring a difficult goal. He adds that 19-year-old Winslow Bulky draws the line in this half. Drake screams joyfully, thinking that despite all the shortcomings of this little guy, he still has some use. Nathan looks at Drake and suggests that Park Chung set an example for everyone and change the atmosphere in the team with his sudden goal. The match continues and the commentator reports that Yannick collected the ball without much effort, preventing the Rochdale striker from crossing the center line so easily. Emma Charlotte watches the match as the commentator continues to rave about how Bolton have completely crushed their opponent's hopes of winning, adding that he simply cannot believe that this is the same team that just recently lost to Bristol in the last half. He continues his speech by saying that Bolton's owner, whom everyone calls Mr. Drake, who also holds the post of manager, dispels all doubts of the fans in just one game. The coaching staff asks each other if they are now in a dream noting that they do not believe that this is their team. Emma Charlotte remembers Drake saying that he never takes his club lightly and will do anything to bring them victory. Emma notes that at the time it didn't sound convincing at all and she decided that Drake was bluffing. She watches the broadcast, realizing that Drake is indeed the owner who put his life on the line. Daniel Bertland yells at his team, ordering Kemble to take the right side and defend it. Kemble listens to these commands, noting that it is easier said than done trying to figure out how to penetrate Bolton's defence. All Bolton players continue their aggressive defensive tactics, blocking the Rochdale players. Kemble faces two attackers, noting that he cannot pass to anyone. The commentator reports that Rochdale's players are struggling to cope with Bolton's pressure, adding that their passing accuracy is deteriorating. Suddenly, Drake decides to change strategy, and the commentator reports that Bolton is announcing a replacement player. He continues to talk about what is happening, saying that the Bolton team decides to replace Quick Floyd and invites the fans to applaud him for his fearless attacks throughout the game. All the fans stand up to send Quick Floyd off with thunderous applause and the commentator emphasizes that he deserved it. Drake puts his hand on his shoulder, telling him that he did a great job, asking him to do just as well next time, to which he replies that he will definitely fulfill his request. Before leaving, Floyd sincerely thanks Drake for the chance. The referee blows his whistle, announcing the end of this football match. Bolton Wanderers fans are bursting with excitement, tearing their clothes with enthusiasm. The commentator reports that the match ends with a final score of three, zero in favor of the Bolton team. He adds that Bolton, who broke the record for the most consecutive matches lost, demonstrated unprecedented power. Immediately after the match, the fan community chat explodes with messages that the Bolton dogs have finally risen from the mud they have been in for so long. Two days after a football match, 
Bolton Wanderer's Captain David Dignity wipes sweat from his brow after an intense training session. He asks how many more rounds of Rondo they must complete for the training to be considered successful. He reflects on the fact that they are doing the same exercise over and over again, wondering if they are going to do any tactical training today. Drake asks his team if they are so exhausted that they can't do another lap. Meanwhile, everyone surrounds Quick Floyd for another practice round. Players in green jerseys try to take the ball away from Floyd using various tactics. Quick takes the ball back and passes it to another player on the team. He reflects that he is not against this training, wondering why he was put in the center for the second time in a row. He notes that in this position, it will be more difficult for him than anyone, since from the center, he has to monitor the entire field while he is attacked from all sides. Nathan looks at the team and asks Drake if his players are exhausted, to which he replies that they should learn to overcome difficulties. He notes that the current Bolton squad is too slack and they are not giving it their all. So his plan is to improve their organization and work on their footwork through rondos. Rondo is a training exercise in which players are divided into a group of passers and a group of dribblers, and the passers take positions around the dribbling group, closing them in a ring, after which they pass the ball to each other, choosing to pass around the attackers who try to get the ball from take them away. Drake emphasizes that this is the optimal training for their team, as Hugo can work on his ball control and his passing, while Tugger Joe works on his endurance and will once again practice suppressing his opponent. Also, according to his plan, Quick, placed in the very center and surrounded by attackers, will be able to develop the ability to cope with enemy pressure as well as concentration in order to break through dense pressure. Drake says that after all, their football team should have at least one joker, adding that it's nice to have a card in our hands that can turn even the most hopeless game in our favor. Drake says Quick's dribbling skills alone make him a valuable player. He notes that everything else about him, however, leaves much to be desired, especially the accuracy of his passes. He admits that Bolton's problem is that they don't have an all-rounder who is good at everything, so we have to compensate for each other's shortcomings. So in these circumstances, teamwork is more important than ever. After a while, Drake takes out the loudspeaker again and announces a 10-minute break. Park Chung turns to Drake and asks him why the training ended so quickly. Drake says that training isn't over for him yet, adding that he has a class with him next, inviting him to follow him. Other players wonder why they have to spend hours doing rondos while he is the only one who will be practicing individually. One of the players reflects on the fact that Park Chung constantly sucks up to Drake, contemptuously spitting on the grass. Drake tells Park Young that he was able to play well in the last match, but English football is much more difficult and tough than the K3 league. He adds that here they will not punish any attempt to cut another player with a foul. He says that here contact of the leg with the ankle and foot is not considered a violation, adding that only contact in the shin area is considered a foul. Drake notes that Park Chung's advantage is speed and agility, so he should be prepared for situations in which the opponent will think about how to knock him down, which increases the risk of serious injury. Drake adds that Park Young shouldn't worry since he's here to teach him some self-defense. Drake says he might call this a deception tactic. Drake assures Puck that if he gets comfortable with this tactic, he will minimize the risk of injury, after which Puck thinks about what kind of cheating tactics there might be in football. Puck asks Drake if he means tricky maneuvers by deception, to which he replies that he meant something else. He says that Park will have to put on a show worthy of an Oscar, which causes sincere misunderstanding of the young athlete. Drake asks him to remember Neymar, who lay on the grass as if his life was in danger, although he was only tripped. From Drake's point of view with this kind of acting, Pack's opponents will be too scared and will think twice before trying to knock him down. Drake sums it up by saying that Park Chong is now a real football player whose acting should be on par with Hollywood actors. The players, continuing their training, suddenly turn around at the shouts of Drake, who is training Park Chung. He orders him to pull himself together and theatrically kicks him in the ankle. Park Chung falls to the ground, beginning to genuinely writhe in pain, naturalistically exaggerating the suffering of the fall. He rolls back and forth on the ground until Drake stops his attempt with a whistle. Park Chung gets to his feet and Drake praises him for his attempt, adding that he was a little over the top. Drake says that Park Jung won't be able to fool anyone with weak acting, adding that he will have to try harder if he doesn't want to go back to Korea. He says that the sight of him should cause the audience to panic and believe in their pain, ordering him to try again, after which Puck falls to the ground again, theatrically asking why he is doing all this. Drake continues to train his comrade, saying that now he is doing much better, adding that his game must be distinguished by filigree precision, while the other team members watch in horror. A few hours later, Drake is approached by one of the club's employees, 
saying that he has done a good job caring about his team's results. However, in her opinion, Drake should not forget about his responsibilities as an owner, adding that they are having some difficulties with the marketing department, strategic planning, and especially with the front office staff, since they lost six employees in two months and now have acute shortage of support staff. Drake closes his eyes in irritation, thinking that he has much more serious concerns than taking care of some staff. He notes that the good news in this is that none of them left the club of their own free will or expressed any protest, since all six were personally fired by Drake. Suddenly there is a knock on the door of Drake's office and he calmly asks him to come in. The door opens and a child appears in front of Drake and the employee, who politely greets the main character, holding a flower pot in his hands. Drake greets the boy, calling him Nicky, saying that he thinks he has become taller, to which the child responds with sincere joy that he has grown a whole centimeter. Drake says that at this rate, Nicky will catch up with him very soon, after which the employee asks Drake for a moment of attention. She asks him who the boy is, to which Drake replies that his name is Nicky and he is the son of Thompson, who works on the facilities management team. Nicky says that he wants to be like Dad, so he is interested in the history and life of the club, and also carries out small tasks, one of which is arranging flower pots. Having completed his task, Nicky leaves the office, saying goodbye to Drake, to which he just as politely tells him that they will see each other next time. Drake tells the employee that Thompson asked his permission to sometimes bring his son to the club, after which he grins, saying that sometimes he feels like he's working as a babysitter. Drake talks about how someday he will take him to the stadium in exchange for some small help, which in any case will be more useful than him just hanging around there with nothing to do. Suddenly Drake is amazed at how he didn't think of this before and plunges into thought. He recalls that now some farms have a service for tourists, which means that for a fee you can be a gardener and pick fruit for the farm. Drake begins to wonder what kind of results such tactics might bring them, while an employee watching his face tells him that he looks like he's thinking about something devious. Drake cheerfully replies that he never thinks anything bad, adding that he has an interesting idea. The next morning, a man comes out of a convenience store next to the Bolton Club with his son. The father tells his son that he will now check the list in case they forgot something. Suddenly, something catches the little boy's attention, and he asks his father to look at what he is showing. The father turns his head and notices that the child's attention was attracted by a small lottery where people had gathered. As he gets closer, he recognizes the club's logo, surprised that Bolton decided to hold a lottery. He looks at his son and asks him if he would like to try and buy one ticket, to which he enthusiastically responds in the affirmative. The father notices that one ticket costs as much as two pounds and reflects that this is an unusually high price for the lottery. Suddenly, one of the lottery participants opens his winnings and finds himself with a ticket to the next match. The father is impressed by the size of the prize and mentally admits that he himself was thinking about buying tickets to the next game. The boy's father says that it is better to be deceived once than to never try at all and buys a ticket, delighting his son. Father and son open the winning ticket and discover that they have received a voucher for a one-day experience with the Bolton Club staff. The father is surprised by such an unusual prize, noticing that other participants have won similar prizes. The next day, Nathan goes down to the first floor of the Bolton Club reception area and is very surprised by what he sees. He observes a large influx of visitors who look around with interest. Drake, also watching this, tells his brother that everything is going even better than he expected. He says that when he saw Nicky's enthusiasm, he had a great idea, which was to find and hire people who would be willing to do their work for them. According to Drake, visitors are true football fans, and therefore, they are interested not only in the game and the players, but also in everything that concerns the management of the club, which means they are ready to experience for themselves what their favorite club is like. He adds that naturally this work will be paid, despite the fact that for them, it is an experience that has no price, since it gives them a feeling of belonging to the club and satisfying their curiosity. One of the visitors passes by them, who received a coupon for work experience as a technical employee for 24 hours. Drake says he was previously worried that the promotion wouldn't get much traction since everyone was busy with work or school, but to his surprise, the club's employee experience quota was full and they even had a waiting list, adding that of the trial batch of tickets put into circulation, almost 100% were sold and brought people to them. Nathan says he really likes the idea, asking Drake if he's ever thought about giving away these tickets for free, to which Drake asks in bewilderment how he came up with such a strange idea. He asks his brother to leave this childish talk, adding that after all they allow them to enter the Sanctum Sanctorum and become part of their family, 
and as it should be in a family, they should help each other. Nathan is blinded by the power of his brother's corporate rhetoric, and he ironically remarks that there really is a real family idol going on here. After some time, Drake arrives at the Kearsley radio station, and the host welcomes listeners to the Daily Miracles program, saying that today they have a special guest named Mr. Drake, who is the owner and part-time coach of the Bolton team. The host greets Drake by introducing himself as Harry Bench, after which Drake greets him with the same polite manner. Harry says Drake was previously interviewed by his brother Aaron from Horwich Radio. Drake muses that this is not your average local radio station, unlike Horwich, adding that Kearsley's radio is somewhat unique and goes its own way, different from other stations, and that is why he came here. From his point of view, it's time to start managing public opinion and the rumours swirling around them, and this is a great place to start, but there is open hostility towards him in everything that is said here. Drake reflects on why they are not given the honour they deserve despite their victory, noting that he is well aware that this is the local media, and the local fans do not like Bolton, but journalists must be true to their cause and remain neutral. Harry says that since Drake became the owner, he has cut nine players from the team and only brought in two, adding that many consider his team to be too small, asking Drake what he thinks about this. The main character calmly replies that in his opinion, there are enough players in the Bolton Wanderers team, to which Harry says that this is not at all the answer that the fans expected. Harry says that of the 24 EFL1 teams this season, Bolton are the only one with fewer than 20 players in their first team squad, suggesting Bolton's team policy is rather unusual. Drake laughingly states that he has heard similar statements from his coaching staff many times. He adds that, nevertheless, his decision remains unchanged and asks everyone to remember what happened under Derek Scott. Drake points out that Scott has only ever used 16 players throughout his career, with hordes of substitutes sitting idle on the bench, emphasizing that their current system is almost the same as the old one, other than having a horde of substitute players. Drake says that he is well aware that the more players there are on a team, the more different tactics can be used. However, from Drake's point of view, this is only relevant if they have enough time to practice, and then asks why they should care about a shortened team right now, in the middle of the season. Drake adds that everyone could notice from the results of the last match that you can win against lower teams in the league with a limited set of tactics. And even if the club is small in numbers, in Drake's opinion, there is no need to rush and add just anyone to the team, mindlessly repeating the mistakes of the past. Harry says that they have now heard a great speech from the owner of the club, to which Drake comments that he is no stranger to such difficult issues, and that is why he has nerves of steel. Harry tells Drake that he wanted to talk about one last thing and reminds him about the bet he announced at the last press conference. He clarifies that Drake promised that he would resign as manager and stop taking part in the team's training if he lost at least one of the three games. Gary looks at Drake seriously and asks him if the bet is still valid. Drake smiles and understands that it is one thing to use broadcasting to sway public opinion in his favour, but quite another to take care of growing his audience in the process. He decides that the time has come and confidently says that the bet is still valid and they have two matches left. The main character says that he wants to appeal to everyone who doubts his words in order to clarify everything once and for all, declaring that if they lose, he will resign as manager and promises in this case to do everything possible to find a new coach, which the fans will be pleased with. However, according to Drake, he does not even allow the thought that they could lose. Harry says he senses an incredible amount of confidence in Drake and thanks him for his words. Harry adds that he only says this because he believes in him unconditionally. According to Drake, athletes have great potential and there are many opportunities ahead for them to prove themselves, noting that the same applies to him. He says that they started from the very bottom and they have no other way but to climb up to victory, after which he assures that they will go as far as they can. After some time, he holds a briefing between the coaches, saying that their opponent in the 31st round is Salopia's team. Nathan notes that they are currently 18th in the league. He points out that Salopia's main striker is Harold Chapman, who played in every game of the season and has 10 goals and 4 assists. He also turns his attention to striker Jamie Willis, who is a good threat for them along with his seven goals and seven assists. Nathan argues that even if you don't count the number of points they score, such players give the team a good chance of winning by distracting the defence and threatening to make bold passes. He suggests that their tactics should be aimed at suppressing these players, trying to prevent them from gaining possession of the ball as much as possible. Nathan finishes the story and tells Drake to say something 
to which he smiles and thinks about what options they can take. Neil Rose says that Salopia is a defensive team rather than an attacking team. From his point of view, the difficulty of the upcoming match cannot be compared with Rochdale, so it will be incredibly difficult for Bolton. Drake asks Neil why he came to this conclusion. Neil says that while Rochdale had already lost three games in a row heading into the match with Bolton, Salopia is currently on a three-game winning streak. Neil invites the entire cast, including Drake, to review the tactics board. He says they owe their performance to their signature defensive tactic of grouping nine defenders in two rows. In his opinion, the players stand very tightly, and this makes it difficult for the enemy to pass, and they also do not play in such a dense formation, so their players will be in the minority, and even one or two passes will be difficult. Having carefully reviewed the diagram, Drake points his finger at the big one. Drake tells everyone else that the enemy team is using Chapman as bait. He explains his guess by saying that he has the highest percentage of goals scored on the team and is also the first player to run on the counter-attack, so it is natural that he will try to divert attention to himself. Drake says this move opens up the ball for James, who is quick and decisive. The protagonist says that even if they intercept the ball at this moment and carry out a counter-attack, the back four will still be firmly in their way. Drake says he's not surprised why this tactic brought them three wins in a row. Neil thinks about the fact that we have sorted out their tactics and says that he wants to add a couple more words. He says that because they will be playing against a packed defense, they need a strategy that allows them to launch effective counter-attacks, as well as exploit the differences in height and agility of their players to maintain prolonged contact with the ball. He also notes that the spearhead of attacks can be Park Chon's irreplaceable ability, namely his speed. One of the members of the coaching staff says that he is not a good enough analyst to advise anything, but he suggests Victor Johnson as a starter. Drake is surprised by this proposal, mentally admitting that such a proposal truly discourages him. Neil reflects that he doesn't believe anyone would actually recommend replacement players over proven starters. Drake, after thinking carefully, invites everyone to use Owen Priestess on the field. He says that this time he is thinking of making him the starter. Neil says Owen is an attacking midfielder who tore his knee ligament two years ago. He adds that Owen finally returned a few months ago, but he's no longer playing like he used to and is unlikely to be included in the starting lineup. Drake says that they should still try to include him on the list, to which Drake asks him in bewilderment why he decided so. Drake says he doesn't have any particular reason for this, adding that he's recently been criticized for having such a small lineup. Neil looks at Drake with irritation, admitting to himself that Drake surprises him every day. He reflects on the fact that once Drake has his mind on something, he goes towards his goal, not paying attention to anything else. Neil begins to rub his head, thinking that dissuading Drake is the most useless undertaking in his life. He decides to get at least some explanation and asks Drake why he made this decision, arguing that he can say with complete confidence that Owen's time is already in the past. Drake says he doesn't need a specific reason to include a player in the team's starting lineup. The main character explains that in Bolton's current lineup, no one has the same accurate strike as Owen. After some time, Owen notices a message on the notice board that he has been assigned to the main roster. He is surprised to admit to himself that he cannot believe that they actually included him in the main team. He recalls recently running into the club owner at the second team training ground. In the flashback, he was incredibly surprised when Drake suddenly asked him if he wanted to join the main cast. Drake then said that it would have been much better if he had not been injured, but he was distracted by Richard, who asked for a minute of his attention. Owen looked at Drake in disbelief guessing that he must be playing a prank on him. Drake told Owen that they would have to leave this conversation until next time, adding that he was currently overwhelmed with work. With this, Owen and Drake's first meeting ended, and back in the present, he admitted to himself that he had already thought about retiring from football, given the condition of his knee. He rubs his hair and shakes his head, trying to figure out if he's all dreaming. Drake quietly approaches Owen and says that he is not dreaming, adding that he never found the time to continue the conversation. Owen looks at Drake in surprise, asking him what he wanted to tell him. He asks him what this all means, to which Drake looks at him with confusion, asking him what he means. Owen tells Drake that he would like to know why he was named in the starting lineup, to which Drake calmly replies that the reason he chose him is because he needs him. Owen still doesn't understand and asks Drake how he can be on the main roster. He reflects that the transition to the main team certainly gives him a joyful and exciting experience. However, from his point of view, there must be a good reason for such a promotion. After which he remembers that he is left on the bench, even in second team games. Drake says that Owen trains every week, adding that he watched him one day and noticed that he had a very good shot. 
He asks him how much he practiced to achieve such results, adding that he can't wait to see how his legs serve the team in the next game. Drake tells Owen that he will play in the starting lineup as a forward. Owen asks Drake if he is playing a prank on him by putting him in the role of striker, to which Drake asks Owen if he is playing the fool himself. He says that for a normal forward, getting a torn ACL is a death sentence. But from Drake's point of view, even with a bad knee, Owen can play as well as the kids in the youth league. Owen begins to get angry and clenches his fists, and Drake noticing this rejoices, mentally noting that he was afraid that there was nothing left of Owen's fighting spirit. But these fears turned out to be groundless. Owen says that everything Drake said is true, but he can't run properly and will be a burden to the team. Drake says that Owen should stop talking and listen to him, adding that no one told him to run. Owen looks at Drake in bewilderment, to which he tells him that he will just stand in one place rooted to the spot. He continues to explain his plan, saying that Owen will have to stand and wait for one of the attackers to approach the penalty area, after which he must accept the pass and hit the ball with all his might. Owen asks Drake what this strange attack strategy is, to which he tells him not to ask such questions and follow the demands of his coach. He asks Owen to be confident and trust his decision, noting that Owen is his number one for this subtle strategy. Drake turns back, saying that he doesn't really care whether he agrees or not, since he's promoting him to the main roster anyway. He waves goodbye to him, saying that he will see him at the next training session. Some time passes and Drake decides to relax in his office. He wearily says that time drags on incredibly long, noting that being both a manager and owner of a club is very, very difficult. Remembering management, he glances at his old laptop. He recalls that he was only active on the football management app for a few months, but it was the first place where someone recognized his talent. After some thought, Drake decides that he can come in for a while to see what happened in his absence. He notices that he has accumulated several messages, the content of which is approximately the same. Drake is surprised to notice that for some reason all the messages are deliberately complimentary. Among the messages, he finds a message in which the sender swears that he is the real Jalik Bubash. Drake is annoyed that this imposter keeps messaging him from different accounts. He decides that he's had enough and blocks the annoying user, who, in his opinion, is an information mite. Jellick becomes depressed, not understanding what caused such a prejudiced attitude. The next day at the University of Bolton Stadium, training begins in the strangest format possible. Owen takes possession of the ball, trying to pass the assist to his teammate. Park Chung runs forward, trying to receive the ball sent across half the field by Owen. Drake tells his team that today they will be split into two groups to play a practice match, and some of the players will be in several different positions. He turns to one of the players, calling him thin, saying that he wants him to play today as an attacking midfielder and not as a defender. Slimy replies that he has never played midfield, but Drake ignores him and turns to Owen. He says that Owen will be the centre forward and will be paired with Park Chung, noting that his job will be to stay in one place and distribute passes. Ira starts and Owen passes the ball to Park Chung, who tries to take it. However, he is intercepted by the defender of the opposing team, skillfully parrying the ball to Park Chung with his head. Nathan watches the game, noting that Park Chung's tactic of breaking through the defence and then making a well-timed pass to Owen looks good based on his attacking technique alone. Drake is thinking the same thing, wondering if this will all work in practice when the team is having a hard time adjusting to the new state of things. Thin dribbles the ball, trying to prevent the opposing players from taking it away. He quickly looks around, analysing the situation and comes to the conclusion that the threat comes from the rear and right flank. The player understands that unlike playing defence when attacking, passes can be sent in all directions. Looking around, he comes to the conclusion that he needs to think about too many options at once, noting that getting the ball in such a situation will not be easy. They try to take the ball away from him, and Drake shouts that the players are showing too little dribbling. Owen watches everything happen, standing still and thinking about the fact that he is a disgrace to his team. He sees that the observers are now outnumbered, telling himself that he cannot just stand and watch them from afar. Owen moves and Drake immediately yells at him to stay where he is and wait for a pass from Park Chung. He gives Owen the command not to take a single step until the required pass comes. Owen wonders what this bizarre approach to football is. One of the opposing team's players mocks Owen, saying that he won't even need to shower after practice with a game like that. He wonders why Drake took a cripple onto the field, who cannot even run, if nothing would change from his presence or absence. The coaching staff says that even if Owen's shot is damn good, he still won't have the agility to make an accurate pass under heavy pressure. Drake tells his colleagues that they only won once, and they have already begun to act like God knows what, to which they respond that most likely he will still have to quit. 
Two days later, the 31st round of the league begins with a match between Bolton Wanderers and Salopia at Deep Enders Meadow. The commentator celebrates Salopia's goal in the 23rd minute of the game, saying that the score is now 1-0 in Salopia's favour, noting that Harold Chapman scores his 11th goal of the season. Bolton fans immediately blame Drake for everything, demanding that he resign from his post as head of the football club. He ignores these words and turns to Owen, saying that he must now take the field. He adds that there will be a replacement now, which means he will need to quickly prepare, to which Owen replies that he understands everything. One of the players on the bench says that their team barely survived half the first half and now suddenly wants to make a substitution, surprised at such a strange decision, to which his friend also complains that if they want Owen so much, then they should have released him with from the very beginning of the game and do not waste a replacement card on it. Another player says Owen's presence on the field doesn't matter because he's still a terrible player. The gloating player continues to watch the match, saying that things will only get worse from here. Drake puts his hand on Owen's shoulder and asks him if he forgot that his task is to be in the same place they practiced in training. Drake says that if football were an online game, then Owen would be a turret in it, sweeping away everyone who dares to approach it. A Bolton fan takes a closer look at the player entering the field and is surprised to recognize him as Owen Priestess. They are indignant at this decision, shouting that any cripple can overtake Owen. The commentator announces that Owen is coming onto the field, reminding everyone that he was recently included in the main squad, although before that he only played in reserve matches, as he is undergoing a long rehabilitation after an injury, adding that everyone can't wait to see what he can do after his return. The game continues and quite quickly one of the Bolton players passes an accurate and neat pass to Owen waiting in front. However, one of Salopius's team's attackers pushes him and Owen is unable to stay on his feet, falling from the push. Owen ends up losing the ball and the commentator states that his first appearance back from injury was quite disappointing. The game continues and the commentator notes all of Owen's failures, saying that he is still recovering from his injury and the decision to return him to the main lineup was hasty. He regrets that it is always painful for him to watch how injuries destroy truly talented players and expresses the hope that none of the players will suffer any serious injuries today. The gloating player on the bench says that everything that is happening can only be called a joke and not football. He watches Owen and asks what a slow guy like him can do with the ball. Drake also watches everything that happens, frowning with dissatisfaction. Park Chung goes to attack, but McGregor blocks him with his body, pushing him to the ground. Using the art of deception, Puck dramatically falls to the ground, starting to scream in unbearable pain. The trick succeeds, and the referee shows a disheartened McGregor a yellow card as a first warning. The commentator notes that Boltot receives a free kick from Pack's serve. Suddenly, Drake calls out to Owen and asks him to come to him now. He goes to Drake, and the stands explode with requests to remove Owen and put Victor Johnson in his place. Owen reflects that after such a disgrace, he will most likely definitely be replaced. However, to his surprise, he hears only words from Drake that he is excellent at coping with the task. Drake adds that today his skills are even better than in training and he acts almost like a goalkeeper. Drake notes that it would also be nice if he always did what he was told. From Drake's point of view, the longer Owen stands still, the better it will be since he is a turret. Owen reflects on how he feels taking the field clearly shows that his career as a player is over and doesn't understand what he can do right. Drake notices Owen's thoughts and suggests that he make his face simpler, saying that he thinks too much for a man who already has enough on his plate. Owen tells Drake that he himself saw that he cannot stand in that place and receive and pass passes as Drake asked, to which Drake mockingly tells Owen that he is participating in the most important game of the season and still dares to whine that it is going wrong as he wants. Drake notes that Owen completed all of his passes today, except for that pass to Quick when he fell and another one that went wide. Owen realizes that all this time he was fixated only on the fact that he did not succeed and completely lost sight of everything except that brawl and the goal scored. Drake says that today Owen was completely freed from running around, which means no one can blame him for being slow or immobile. Drake says that everyone appreciates Owen when he takes a pass well, but criticizes him when he loses the ball, adding that it's time for Owen to stop thinking too much and just shoot the ball. Drake admonishes Owen, saying that right now it doesn't really matter whether he has the ball or not, but when he gets it, he shouldn't give anyone a chance to take it away and just shoot straight into the goal with one touch. Drake adds that Owen is a linebacker with limited mobility, so he should give up mobility, which he doesn't have anyway, and focus on his feet. He turns Owen's attention to the stands and asks him if he can hear them booing him and Drake, 
after which he says that the crowd is already biased against them. According to Drake, even if they took off their clothes and danced naked in front of the entire stadium, their reputation could not fall any lower. He puts his hand on Owen's shoulder again and tells him to stop looking back at others after every step he takes. Instead, according to Drake, he should believe in himself, and if he can't, then he should believe in Drake, because he was the one he chose for this match. Owen is inspired by these words and returns to the field to the loud indignation of the spectators, whose expectations Drake again disappointed with great pleasure. Drake reflects that he really wanted to lighten his burden, but his entire strategy today depends on Owen alone. Drake closes his eyes and expresses sincere hopes that Owen will cope with his task, otherwise this club is doomed. The referee announces the start of the penalty kick, and the players stand in a special wall to protect the goal. Owen remembers Drake's enlightening and hopeful words for him to trust him. He suddenly raises his hand, and Puck begins to run from the flank of the defensive formation. McLeod turns around at the noise and realizes that Park Chung is quickly passing them. Owen takes the free kick, spinning it around to prevent defenders from intercepting it. However, Puck does not have time to receive the ball, and the commentator reports that the ball falls directly into the hands of goalkeeper Morello. The gloating player arrogantly wonders how anyone could try to fool his opponent with such a cheap trick. He understands that Puck was supposed to bypass the defense and break through the backs of the defenders, adding that Drake may have thought this was a smart tactic, but now it is in vain. With a satisfied grin, he reflects that their banal tactics were easily exposed and such tricks have long been ineffective. Owen takes another free kick in the third minute of overtime, breaking through the opponent's defense, but it does not lead to a goal. One of the spectators shouts that Owen is a complete non-entity, saying that even he could score this ball into the goal. He yells at Drake, demanding that he remove Owen from the field, but he understands that Drake is only irritably adjusting his plugs so as not to hear this nonsense. McGregor again prevents a goal from being scored by blocking Pack with a kick to the leg. However, Park again uses his deception tactics and the referee awards another penalty kick. The gloating player contemptuously notes that Park Chung is only good for collecting fouls. He looks at Drake and thinks that he will ruin everything with his ignorant, grandiose tactics, and he should have put him on the field to win. McLeod stands next to Puck, musing that he thinks they'll use the same tactic again, with Puck getting behind the defenders. This is exactly what happens, and McLeod is surprised that Bolton behaves so predictably. He gets angry at the pack, saying that it annoys him that he rushes back and forth at great speed, promising to catch up with him this time and hit him where necessary. However, Suddenly the ball cuts through the air near McLeod at great speed, and he barely has time to notice it. He looks around in surprise, and realizes that this time the blow was not delivered in a straight line, and was aimed straight at the goal. He watches the flight of the ball, having time to think only that things are bad. The goalkeeper trying to catch the ball is surprised that Owen made only one move, but it was enough to make a hole in their defense. The goalkeeper does not have time to catch the ball, and it crashes into the goal at full speed, stretching the net. The commentator happily announces that Bolton Wanderers have equalized and Owen shouts that he has finally done it. The commentator says that in extra time of the first half, Owen Precis scores a powerful goal from a direct free kick. A few days ago, Nathan and Drake had a conversation during which Drake said that he had a secret plan to surprise his opponent and Nate replied that when he sees Drake's sickening smile, he immediately becomes uneasy. With these words, Drake asked Owen to show their plan to Nathan and he raised his hand to strike. Drake says his strategy is to use Park Chung's speed on offense. Drake asked Nathan what he thought about this plan, to which he said that it looked good. However, he was quick to point out that their tactics in the penalty area were very limited, expressing doubts that they would be able to score goals like this over and over again. Since much would depend on whether Park Chung could score in one try, Drake replies that Nathan is right, and usually, if you don't make the first shot, then there may not be a second one but they will try again and again until they succeed, to which Nathan asks Drake in surprise if he wants to make the defenders nervous, repeatedly repeating Park Chon's sharp maneuvers. Nathan remembers this exchange, marveling at how things turned out during the match. Drake is pleased that Owen was able to break through and shoot the ball in such a difficult way. Nathan thinks that this is easier said than done, because even if it was a planned tactic, the trajectory of the goal that Owen just scored is simply mind-blowing since the gap in the defense flashed for only a split second. He remembers that Owen never practiced free kicks in practice. He irritably demands Drake to admit whether he gave Owen any individual instructions, to which Drake calmly replies that there is nothing wrong with it, since as a player it was extremely difficult for him due to a lot of problems and a lot of pressure. 
Drake says he's noticed his accuracy improves when he doesn't think about it, adding that he had a good shot in practice, but not nearly as good as this one. Drake smugly says that he wasn't mistaken about Owen after all, adding that he seems to have an instinct for good players, while Nathan excitedly notes that Drake has found himself another lapdog. He says that whatever it is, it's good because Bolton now have a dead ball specialist. After some time, the commentator announces the start of the second half, emphasising that this time it all started with Bolton's attack. Since after Owen Priestess's miracle goal just before the break, Bolton's morale was higher than ever. The commentator notices a long pass from Priestess to Park Chung, noting that Owen's shots have become more confident after scoring the goal. The commentator reports that the replay camera switches to Salopia head coach Hazel Modges, noting that he clearly has a displeased expression on his face since the match is not going in their favour. He angrily yells at his team, ordering them to keep up with Park Chung and stay directly in front of him. Park Chung breaks through the defenders and delivers a powerful shot towards goal, but unfortunately the ball hits the post. Hazel muses irritably that she can't believe they are losing so badly to such a weak team. He also notes that allowing Owen Priestess to do whatever he wants can be very costly for his team, so he marks him for blocking. However, Delicate covers Owen and takes a pass from him. And Hazel again notes that he has a good shot, and unlike Priestess, his behaviour on the field is subject to complex tactics. And even if they stop him, there will still be a guy named Puck looming behind him. He turns to his coaching staff, asking them why they're acting like a bunch of idiots and demanding that they not just sit their pants down and immediately come up with a tactic. The commentator notes that Delicate deftly gets rid of the pressure and passes the pass to Priestess, who is quickly getting into shape after a long break in his career. Bolton winger Aaron Lapid asks Owen to pass him the ball, picking up speed to receive the pass. Puck yells at Owen to pass the ball to him, and the commentator notes that Bolton's left and right wings are going up at the same time. Owen pauses briefly to quickly assess the situation and make a decision. He understands that thanks to Puck and Lapid, who drew off the enemy's defence, the centre was completely open. He again remembers Drake's words that he chose him for this match and hits the ball with a powerful blow. The goalkeeper, noticing Owen's plan too late, tries to jump to catch the ball with his hand. However, his speed is not enough, and the ball hits the goal again, as a result of which the football commentator again shouts in delight about Bolton's success. Owen happily stands on the field, while his comrades run up to him to praise him for such a good shot. The commentator says that today, Owen Priestess again asserted himself with effective goals, adding that this is a great comeback and a great game against Salopia. Owen turns to Drake, thanking him, to which he waves his hand, thinking that there is nothing to thank him for. He approaches Owen, inviting him into his arms with the thought that Owen is finally returning to big football. He hugs Owen and reflects that today's drama was a great success. He also notes that this increases their ratings and will have a positive effect on the crowd. After some time, he gives an interview to reporters who tell him that Bolton won a great victory with a large lead over their rivals. They ask him what his opinion is about today's game against the Salopia Club. Drake reflects that all the critics of the decision to withdraw Owen have been silenced and says that he is very happy and proud of his guys, especially thanking them for trusting him. One of the reporters says that before the match, most football fans favoured Salopia and predicted her victory, asking him if such one-sided expectations of the crowd did not disappoint him as a new coach, to which Drake calmly replies that he took them completely calmly. He adds that he finds them quite funny, which surprises the reporters. Drake says he's one of those people who enjoys subverting other people's expectations, but he certainly respects the opinions of his fans, adding that he believes two wins will help them reconsider their views on him. The reporter says Owen Priestess, who scored two goals in today's game, was named MVP, but he hasn't played in any official games this past half-season. He asks Drake what attracted Drake's attention, to which he replies that he was attracted to the precision of his feet, adding that he saw the potential for victory in his sharp kicks then says that when he sees an opportunity, he takes it and uses it. Her. The next reporter says that in today's game, Pressis barely moved, literally frozen between the centre circle and the penalty area, interested in what position Owen was playing in, despite the fact that he was announced as a striker. Drake says that no other position on the field is as active as Owen's, adding that he himself is of course less active than the outfield players, and in that regard is more like a goalkeeper. Reporters ask him what he means and what this new position on the field is, to which he replies that this is how he explained the role to Owen. He says Owen Priestess's role is called the turret, 
Two days after the 31st round of the league, Drake sits tensely, doing numerous calculations, and Nathan asks him what he is doing. Drake says that he hits the calculator like a real football club owner, to which Nathan says that he needs to maintain his dignity and not overexert himself. Nathan hands Drake a gift, saying that his dear brother brought him something to eat, noting that his wife is an amazing cook. Drake continues to be immersed in calculations, and Nathan says that he could at least look at him. Drake recounts the proceeds from ticket sales, t-shirts and the lottery, noting that they are currently on a winning streak, but they do not have any new sponsors yet. He remembers being on the radio talking so smugly about their compact team composition, admitting that it doesn't change the fact that a larger team size opens up a lot of tactical possibilities. He says that there may come a day when Owen or Park Jung get injured and the team's strength will be cut in half, which means they need to strengthen their roster. Suddenly a brilliant idea comes to his mind and he says that he can start selling merch. Nathan looks questioningly at Drake and asks him what kind of merch he decided to sell. Drake says they will be releasing Bolton Wanderers merchandise. Drake says that this is the most profitable and money-making idea that could ever come to his mind, to which Nathan agrees, saying that he really likes this idea. Nathan says they could make some money by creating a collection of merchandise with players like Owen, adding that his good looks and his bold shots are exactly what fans like. Drake looks at his brother with bewilderment and asks him what he's talking about. Drake says that this will be his merch with Handsome Drake, causing Nathan to be briefly speechless. He asks Drake if he is serious about this, adding that he must be delusional, to which Drake replies that he thinks it is a brilliant idea. Drake doesn't listen to Nathan and says that he's definitely a genius at coaching and maybe also a master marketer. Sometime later, at a meeting, the head of the business department of the Bolton Wanderers Club, named John Edward Bradley Jr., is surprised to learn the topic of the meeting. He is surprised that the club owner called a meeting to discuss merch, assuming that the conversation will probably turn to expanding the line of branded goods. He also speculates that Drake might be talking about a signature uniform, noting that they are not one of the most prestigious teams and they can only try to promote Owen Priestis. He concludes that there is no enthusiasm from the fan base yet and there is no sign of any enthusiasm for it. So the prospect of selling t-shirts and other merchandise seems vague to him. The head of the marketing department says that this is not about t-shirts at all and whispers to him about what they were all really collected for. John Edward Bradley indignantly asks why the hell the director came up with the idea to sell merchandise with him, adding that no one likes it, to which the head of the marketing department asks him to be quiet. John Bradley says that in such a situation, one cannot be quiet, and on the contrary, one should not be afraid and tell him everything they think about this idea, adding that everyone is cowardly and silent, and that is why the owner throws in such stupid thoughts. He says that it's not too late and they can all stop him together, but at that very second, Drake enters the office and asks with interest about who they want to stop. John Bradley approaches Drake, saying that he came just in time. He asks him if he really wants to launch merchandise with himself, to which Drake somewhat angrily replies that it is true and asks John what problems he has with this decision. John Edward Bradley says that Drake can stroke his ego anywhere else so as not to create this madness, adding that all this time he turned a blind eye to what he was doing, but there is a limit to everything. He asks Drake if he really thinks that beating two already struggling teams makes him some kind of super cool coach. He demands from Drake that he should not even think about starting a conversation about something like that again, and Drake is delightedly surprised. He immediately boils with anger and says that it seemed to him that he fired all the useless talkers from the club. After some time, Drake begins the meeting asking everyone's forgiveness for the delay caused by unforeseen circumstances. He suggests starting meetings, adding that John Edward Bradley Jr., due to personal reasons, resigned from his position and from the club in general. Drake says that this is very sad news, but they will have to move on without him, advising others to write him a kind letter. He smiles sunnily, inviting everyone to relax, asking them why they are so tense, inviting them to breathe in and out. Richard Gears tells Drake that the employees are divided on the branded items that are on the agenda, and Drake responds with surprise that he didn't expect that. He thinks that the director will definitely support his idea, and the dissenting head of the business department conveniently just quit, so it's unlikely that problems will arise. Suddenly he turns to the head of the marketing department, inviting everyone to listen to her opinion. The head of the marketing department named Velma Cardville answers hesitantly and fearfully that, in her opinion, Drake merch, as well as any other branded product, can now only lead to losses. Drake, in a completely non-threatening manner, asks her why she thinks so, 
to which Velka, with trembling hands, says that this has already happened after the release of blankets and keys. Mentally pleading for salvation, she continues to say that although Drake is the director and eminent representative of the Bolton Club, his popularity may not generate consumer demand among the fan club. Drake asks the others what they think, and most of the staff say that they are of the same opinion. He turns to Emma Charlotte and asks what she thinks about this, to which she coldly says that she agrees with her colleagues regarding the production of his personal branded goods. She adds that this decision could leave them with losses like they've never seen before. Emma says that the fan club may have an extremely negative reaction, from statements about the waste of the club's budgets to demands for his resignation, after which Velma looks at her sadly, thinking that they cannot lose her too. Suddenly Drake smiles calmly, thanking Emma for her honest opinion, asking how many letters came this time. Richard Gears places a stack of letters in front of Drake, saying that this time there were about half as many as last week. Drake suggests that the victories over Reuchdale and Salopia might have influenced people and says upset that this cannot be allowed to affect the number of letters, adding that he will have to take into account the chaos at the next interview, causing Emma Charlotte to ask a disgruntled question. Drake admits to her that he was joking, while Velma, who decided to read the letter, notes that it only contains obscene language and death threats. Velma says that these are all threatening letters, to which Drake replies that notoriety is also notoriety, smugly noting that he has succeeded in this matter. He states that he wants to use his bad reputation for the good of the club by making merchandise of himself for the fans who wish him dead. After some time, advertisements begin to appear on the internet about the start of sales of body pillows with the image of Drake. People online are annoyed and say that putting Drake on these pillows was the worst decision ever. The next day, Nathan, unaware of this decision, enters the store to look at its selection. He greets the seller and goes into the sales area to look at the goods. Suddenly he notices a stand with pillows with a picture of Drake and notes that just looking at it makes him feel nauseous. He also notices that the stand is empty and turns to the seller with a question about whether all the pillows were really sold out. The seller enthusiastically replies that in just two days after the start of sales, everything was sold out, even buying out everything that was in the warehouse. And Nathan thinks that everyone has been struck by some kind of brain infection. Taking a closer look, he notices a slogan hanging on a stand with pillows, provoking everyone to try to tear this pillow. He mentally wonders if the slogan really had an effect on so many people. After some time at the next meeting, Drake says that merch is a symbol of what people like and the embodiment of this in reality, in the form in which people would like to store this thing. Drake wonders what would happen if the merch became the embodiment of someone whom people literally hate, assuming that they would curse him and all his ancestors back to the seventh generation. Velma begins to nod vigorously, and Drake says that she's being too enthusiastic, warning her that nodding might cause her head to fall off. Drake says he constantly sees people come to the stadium with signs against him, and quite a few of them make their way to the very bottom rows so that he can hear them swear at him, adding that if they release merch with him, their number will only increase. He also says that customers will be able to physically take out their anger at him on this very merch, so he wants to release a lethal Drake Dakimakura. Drake says they need to make it out of materials that are strong enough so that it doesn't tear as easily, and then they'll have a pillow that can be punched like hell, which will act as an anti-stress punching bag. Drake offers advertising copy that recommends kicking the club director, embodied in the form of a little Drake pillow, adding that the more people who hate him, the higher merch sales will be. From Drake's point of view, since these pillows will not be stored but destroyed, they will be purchased again and again. Drake looks at Velma, saying that her face still shows uncertainty about his idea, suggesting that she start a TikTok challenge. The idea was warmly received and Velma was the first to volunteer to participate. Succumbing to her emotions, Velma spews out curses of incredible cruelty directed at Drake and begins to brutally beat the pillow. Drake records the beating on his phone and says that it turned out just great adding that he will probably upload the sound to the internet for a version without sound. The challenge was a great success, and a huge number of fans took part in it, thereby causing a huge demand for Drake merch. Emma Charlotte, looking at a toy Drake, is approached in a store by her colleague and asks her if she wants to hit him hard. Emma asks in surprise whether this toy really makes her colleague want to beat her, to which she said that she, like her 92-year-old grandmother, just dreams about it. He fiercely squeezes the soft toy and says that as soon as he gets home, he will also take part in the challenge and kick him with all his heart. She asks Emma if she will participate in this challenge, to which she embarrassedly says that she has never even thought about such a thing. 
A colleague suggests that Emma take advantage of this opportunity while it lasts, to which Emma asks her if she really dislikes the owner that much. Emma examines Drake's toy and mentally admits to herself that, in her opinion, he is just a cutie. A few days later, the 32nd round of the league ends with a victory for Bolton, which was brought by a well-aimed shot from Owen. Owen put the ball into the goal right at the end of the second half, giving Drake a third win in a row. In total, after lasting six matches, Bolton jumped to 19th place in the league. The news publication Horwich Times writes that since taking over as manager, Drake has brought the team five wins, two draws and three defeats. Drake says it's disappointing to see the rankings, adding that if they had continued their winning streak, they would have climbed much higher. He also notes with disappointment that after the team's results improved, sales of his merchandise fell sharply, and now what should have been destroyed is kept by fans as a talisman. He sits back and says that even despite his antics in interviews, his reputation is steadily growing, and then wonders why everyone in football is so focused on skill. He reflects that with only five points separating them from 21st place and the relegation zone, now is not the time to relax. He remembers that they had matches where Park Jung and Owen had to be sidelined due to injuries, and the team's results suffered more than he expected, after which he realises that there are only six rounds left, and with a busy schedule they do not have time for that to rest. He also reflects that Nathan is trying to strengthen the team, and has found another person who, oddly enough, does not want to come to Bolton. Drake wonders how long this impudent man will continue to run from them, deciding that he himself will convince him to join the team if he continues to evade. He comes to the conclusion that if Nathan calls this player a diamond in the rough, then his insight can be trusted, which means he needs to attract the guy he chose by any means, but first he needs to focus on the upcoming match. After some time, Drake announces the end of the grueling training, giving his team a rest. One of the football players says that before after training he could barely get home, but now he has become much more resilient, to which his friend says that he is also used to the stress. And now, even if he has to play the whole match, he will still have strength. They come to the conclusion that they now understand why the coach was so insistent on intense training, because now the whole team remains cheerful even at the end of the match. His friend says that this is all because they are still young, adding that it is still difficult for older players, to which he replies that some of the players here will soon be about 26 years old. They note that Park Jung continues to practice and praise his determination before wondering if he ever gets tired. They say that letting him get within striking distance is simply unfair to the opponent, because if his speed and determination are added, he will simply tear apart the EFL one. The footballer says that a special trainer came today, which cost a lot of money. They look at the coach and note that they don't recognize his face, wondering if he's a sports scientist. A few minutes later, the scene shifts to the Bolton Wanderers training center. While practicing judo, Pack falls with a swing on his back to the floor, emitting a muffled groan. The coach says that one more round is needed and Puck immediately sends him flying. He lies on the ground as Drake saunters over to him to watch the class progress. He asks Puck if he is practicing his falling technique, to which he calls out to him in surprise. He asks him if training such techniques is too much, to which he says that he improves an incredible number of things in such training. Drake says it will help him develop core strength to cope with pressure, as well as master the technique of falling safely to avoid injury adding that he carefully prepared everything for him so that Park Jung should not turn his nose up. With these words, he turns to the coach and asks him to spin Park Chon even harder than he is now. He reflects that skills must improve every day and such rigorous training will only contribute to this. After some time, a press conference begins with the coach of the AC Gillingame team, which is the opponents of Bolton Wanderers in the next match named Steve Bruin. The reporter says that under his leadership, Gillingham has soared from 20th to 13th position in the league, while Bolton, who recently also showed a rapid leap in the rankings, is fueling the interest of football fans in the upcoming match. He asks him if he's going to beat Bolton in the next round of the Football League. Steve Bruin says it's always down to chance, adding that it's hard to predict the outcome before a match starts. Steve says that Drake is an excellent coach who has developed good players from bench athletes in just 10 rounds, adding that he not only trains his players, but also pinpoints the weaknesses of his opponents and counters them with complex and thoughtful strategies that simply cannot be ignored. Nathan, listening to the broadcast, says that Steve is a caring coach who also respects Drake, to which his brother replies that Steve is just a regular bore who only pretends to respect him. He says that Steve is just trying to show off by pretending to be someone weak, adding that this game promises to be tiring. 
A few seconds later, Emma Charlotte enters the office, saying that preparations for the press conference are over. She tells Drake that she is ready to escort him to the mixed area where the press can interview him. As they walk down the hallway, Emma Charlotte asks Drake if he's going to hit up reporters with his merch sales today. She adds that lately they seem to be defending him, claiming that Drake simply lacks social skills, noting that this does not help sales at all, and then asks him to at least once go to an interview calmly and without any antics. She also adds that, unlike other coaches, Steve Bruin showed him respect, while Drake reflects that even his own mother did not scold him like that. However, he gives Emma credit, mentally thanking her for such concern, admitting that he listened to half of it. He remembers his life and career, realizing that now he has nothing to complain about. Lost in thought, he does not notice how they arrive at the right place, and Emma Charlotte shouts to him, saying that they have arrived. She says that she will not repeat it again and asks him to follow the prepared plan for the upcoming interview. Drake looks at Emma good-naturedly and smiles maliciously, looking away. He tells her that he has understood everything, and now it is time for him to finally hear from her words that he has matured, adding that Emma cannot worry and just wait for him to return soon. Emma blushes a little, mentally ironizing that Drake imagines himself to be an adult out of the blue. Drake reflects that Emma's words about the negative impact of his clown behavior on sales are absolutely fair. He decides to accept the rules of the game and sit quietly for once, after which he speaks at a press conference about how he also has mutual respect for Steve Bruin. He begins his speech by saying that Steve has been an outstanding coach from the very beginning. However, without holding out for even one minute, he declares that he has some doubts about him. Drake says he doubts his reputation as a Bruin will last after this match. The reporter asks Drake what he means, to which he replies that they will see everything after tomorrow's match. Emma Charlotte covers her face with her hand in disappointment, after raising her glasses to her forehead and starting to rub her eyes. Drake asks the reporters if Steve can continue to pretend to be tough after impressing him with his tactics, mentally admitting to himself that this image suits him better. On the radio where this press conference was broadcast, the presenters invite viewers to place bets on the outcome of the match. Steve Bruin's drivers listen to Drake's performance in bewilderment and wonder. They are interested in where he came from, to which Steve, laughing sincerely, says that he is funny. The driver says that Drake is just a greedy, attention-hungry jerk, asking Steve if he's overrated, to which Steve tells the driver that that's his main problem. Steve explains his point by saying that he is not overestimating Drake, but is exercising common sense based on what he has demonstrated in past matches. He adds that they shouldn't take cues from the coaches who lost to Drake, thinking he's a carefree clown. From Steve's point of view, Drake should not be underestimated, adding that Gillingham occupied the same position as Bolton before Steve took over as manager. Steve also says that Bolton was able to succeed only because of the inattention of their opponents, noting that until now all the teams they played with underestimated the coach and did not even think about studying his strategies. Bruin notes that they must have looked like easy prey in Drake's eyes. Steve confidently states that he would like to continue Gillingham's winning streak. He says that at least for this reason they should not treat their opponent with contempt, adding that self-confidence and arrogance are completely different things. He broods, noting that there will be no mistakes on his part, wondering if Drake will be able to snatch victory from them in this case. Drake, in turn, also thinks about tomorrow's match, admitting that he really wants to see what Steve is like. The next day marks the start of round 41 of the league which takes place on Bolton's home ground at the University of Bolton Stadium. Bolton Wanderers take to the field, and the spectators wish Owen Priestis and Park Chung good luck, asking them to tear up their opponents. The stadium screams to break Gillingham's spirit, and Drake is pleased to note that the atmosphere of a home match is now finally felt. Steve watches the field, calmly analysing what is happening around him. The commentator says that the match begins with a kickoff from the Bolton team. Owen prepares to receive the pass, and the commentator says that Owen is getting into the game very quickly today. However, Batista cuts Owen off, and the announcer says Slow's pass was too carefree. Batista makes a long pass to his teammate, and the commentator notes that Batista is a defender with excellent skills. Drake watches Edgar Batista play and says that he has very outstanding skills. He notices that Edgar is putting pressure on Owen non-stop and is paying a lot of attention to the game as a whole. He reflects that this situation is not a surprise, since Markman have clung to Owen before, adding that in order to keep the sedentary Owen, one field player must be sacrificed, which is why most teams refuse such men-to-men -men when it comes to before a foul or free kick. However, based on Drake's observations, Edgar Bautista plays surprisingly cleanly, 
doesn't commit fouls and makes intelligent passes when given the chance, after which he notices that this guy is greatly hindering Owen from performing his role properly. Owen, guessing Drake's thoughts, admits to himself that he cannot allow the coach to continue to think so. With these words, he falls to the ground, giving a very cunning and unexpected pass to his ally. This maneuver is crowned with success, and the commentator replies that Owen manages to make such accurate passes even from such a difficult position, adding that he is simply speechless from such force of the blow. However, Puck is blocked, not allowing him to confidently accept the received pass. The commentator states that Downs is winning the hard-fought battle for leadership, seizing the initiative. Puck begins to pursue Downs, but he does not give in and also picks up speed. Puck tries to intercept the ball again, but Downs elbows him away every time. Puck falls to the ground trying to pull off a feint, but unfortunately misses, and the commentator notes that it was a very good try. Nathan says that Puck's skills haven't developed much, to which Drake says that you can learn something throughout your life, but if you have bow legs, it won't do much good, so you just have to make the most of every opportunity. Drake irritably notes that the damn Bruin didn't even allow Park Chung to warm up properly and began to block him as soon as he picked up speed. He begins to tremble with anger, wondering how yesterday's candidates for elimination managed to develop such an effective strategy against them, to which Nathan tells him that now is not the time to give up. Drake says that he has everything under control, adding that he has several strategies in his arsenal, after which he asks Nathan not to worry, thereby surprising him. Drake reflects that developing a strategy is like playing rock-paper-scissors, and no matter how many times you have won so far, if your opponent is faster, then defeat is inevitable. He adds that fortunately, he has plenty of time to change strategies and can easily change them as the match progresses. Drake recalls that the opposition formation was 4-1-4-1 with a balanced midfield line. From his point of view, Batista is good at timing and always attacks and blocks Owen in time, as well as playing long passes along the first line and short passes between the two central midfielders, thereby taking over the field with a three-way play. The protagonist realizes that his provocation in the interview has clearly ignited the fire in the opponent and they have carefully analyzed their past matches and prepared a suitable strategy against them. Drake calls them miserable idiots, admitting that their skills and potential are at a very decent level. The commentator reports that there are five minutes left in the first half and Bolton Wanderers are making their first substitution, noting that Drake uses his substitution card quite early. The commentator says that Quick Floyd, who is a center who can dribble the ball for a long time with his fast feet, comes onto the field instead of Ezekiel, and then questions the decision to bring Floyd out right now. Another commentator says that adding a center right at the end of the half is a very dubious and unreliable idea. He also notes that the main problem for this solution is the struggle of the midfielders, but quickly interrupts his thought, amazed at what is happening on the football field. The commentator reports that Quick is not playing as a center back, but is moving towards the offensive line, adding that putting an athlete who is good at dribbling there was a very unusual strategy. Drake chuckles, saying that everyone forgot that Quick used to be a striker and asks his opponents if they can block him now that he has awakened his superpower. Steve looks at what is happening, surprised that Drake brought the so-called false nine onto the field. He wonders why they added Quick when they already have one fake striker in Owen. Steve recalls that based on analytical data, Quick never crosses and is not very good in combination with Slow Bulky. He argues that, to be more precise, Quick usually doesn't pass passes to anyone. Quick continues his attack by running towards the opposing defender. Instead of trying to make a pass, he makes a feint, deceiving the opponent. The commentator states that Quick takes the lead, running towards the opponent's goal area. He delivers a powerful shot, but the ball hits the target and the commentator tries to understand what it was. Quick screams in rage, wondering why Drake brought him onto the field at a time when the team is unable to develop an attack. He concentrates and calms down, telling himself that he must meet the coach's expectations. After some time, Quick returns to the center of the field, and the commentator reports that if Bolton is unable to develop an attack, relying on Pressis and Puck, then Quick was brought onto the field, capable of finding a way to attack through dribbling, noting that this decision is worthy of praise. Quick rushes forward and the commentator praises his ability to dribble with both feet, noting Floyd's great talents. However, AC Gillingham center Joshua Ramsey appears in front of him to block his attack. Park Chung runs up to Floyd from the flank, asking him to pass him a pass. Floyd reacts with lightning speed, passing the ball to the quick Park Chung. However, the pass turns out to be unsuccessful and the commentator reports that Idramund intercepts the ball. He adds that although Quick passed the ball to Puck, 
it was too slow. Noting that Quick's dribbling was certainly impressive, but it wasn't completed. Fans begin to scold Floyd, saying that he is the most disgraceful player on the team. Joshua turns to Floyd, telling him to come down from heaven and not expect anything from him doing his low-ranking dribble here. Drake watches what is happening and says that everything is going exactly as he planned. From his point of view, after this unsuccessful attack, everything that came before will fade and disappear from sight. Drake understands that in just five minutes, Quick created at least two memorable chances with his dribbling, adding that this is why he brought him on the field at the very end of the first half. There are only three minutes left in the extra time of the first half, and Quick, who at first exuded terrifying determination, demonstrated only a series of turnovers. The score still remained zero. Zero, and thus the balance of the game was maintained until the break, which was specifically noted by the commentator, saying that at the moment it is impossible to say with confidence that the decision to bring Quick Floyd out was correct, since in the first half he did not show an impressive result. The commentator points out what Quick could not have done in such a short time, to which his colleague replies that even in such a short amount of time, he managed to miss the ball several times, adding that if Bolton intend to win, adjustments to the strategy are inevitable. In the locker room, Quick recalled an old story that popped into his head every time he missed the ball. This story goes back to when he was still playing as a striker. At that time, the trainer constantly criticised his determination, saying that he had completely lost his head and could not perform even the most basic manoeuvres. Quick recalls that from then on, he vowed never to repeat the mistakes of the past after becoming a defender. But once he was switched to a forward after all this time, he repeated all the same mistakes. Quick is annoyed that his head is a complete mess, while his teammate says that Coach Drake is coming here. Quick looks up at Drake and says that he is incredibly embarrassed in front of him. Quick is ashamed that Drake believed in him earlier when he failed to live up to his expectations. Suddenly, he hears a question from Drake about where Floyd is now. Floyd signals himself and Drake asks him what kind of maneuvers they were just now. He says that Floyd did not shoot, did not pass, asking if he was poisoned by anything, and then tells Quick to do everything as usual and pass on the ground. He explains that when Quick needs to pass a pass, it's better for him to send them not to Park Chung, but to Slow or Aaron, adding that there are plenty of smarter guys out there and Quick doesn't need to try to figure everything out on his own. Drake says that in just seven minutes, Quick created four good opportunities, and if he had continued in the same spirit, he could have become the best in the league if he had not ruined everything at the end. After which, Quick asks Drake in surprise whether he really he created such situations, to which Drake replies that they no longer have a single bald person on the team to whom he could turn at the moment. Drake says that with his skills, Quick attracted the attention of all defenders four times, and if not for the turnovers, they could have penetrated into more dangerous moments when a goal could be scored. Drake says that Quick showed incredible dribbling today, and if he can continue to pull himself together and leave the attack to those who understand it, then they can even win. Quick is surprised that Drake doesn't criticize him for his bad performance, but talks about his good performance and boosts his confidence. He admits to himself that no one has ever told him this before, after which he casts aside all his doubts and shadows of the past. Drake says that Floyd is still playing completely according to his plan, to which Floyd asks him in surprise what kind of plan it is. Drake asks Floyd why he thinks he brought him onto the field in the last five minutes of the half, without giving any explanation. Drake says that this is a kind of feint, relying on an internal desire not to be fooled, adding that even if someone outsmarts him, it will not matter, since whatever he does will lead to victory, because Drake is a genius. He says that Floyd hasn't figured it out yet, but the point is that he only needs to do what he can do, adding that no one expects him to score points, and feeling pressure even without any expectations placed on him is the last thing the business he should be doing. Drake asks Floyd to get rid of this useless feeling and show them the highest class, noting that being a striker does not mean trying to score a goal. The break ends and the teams return to the field, but Bolton Wanderers are accompanied by a chorus of dissatisfied voices from the stands. The fans are shouting at Floyd to play normally and not try to perform meaningless performances. Steve Bruin's assistant says the atmosphere in the Bolton team is as if they are fighting for an inheritance, adding that they don't look much like cautious and carefully prepared opponents. Steve reflects that Drake and his team really aren't anything special, contrary to his expectations. He argues that the essence of the attack against Bolton is from man-to-man, man-to-man marking for Precis and ends with zonal defending of fast forwards, but their teamwork and getting the most out of their individual skills 
is a big answer to their strategy. Steve also understands that Quick Floyd was not brought onto the field by chance, since he created several significant moments, after which he expresses confidence that Floyd, without knowing it, lost his vigilance while listening to Drake's instructions. Steve looks at Drake's pleased face and thinks that he feels a strange sense of defeat when he looks at that sickening smile. The commentator reports that the team quickly took a free kick, but Quick Floyd skillfully intercepted the ball, but it was immediately blocked from both sides. Drake grinningly asks Nathan if he knows why they are so attached to Quick, to which he suggests that the reason for this is that he attracted attention in the last half, although he screwed up at the end. Drake says that it was indeed a dangerous attack, and he was even worried that Floyd's thoughts would be fixated on a bad ending. Drake says that Bruin has very difficult guys, so he prepared in advance to meet them. Nathan asks Drake if it is possible to know about this in advance, to which Drake calmly replies that you need to know the enemy by sight, adding that no matter how good the defense tactics, the main difficulty is maintaining it for 90 minutes, since concentration players rely on physical skills. Drake continues his speech, saying that from the play of their opponents it is clear that they were practicing tactics to contain the attention of Owen and Park Chung. But suddenly, their concentration is broken by the appearance of a guy who has not even spent 10 minutes on the field and received strategic instruction in just 15 minutes break. From Drake's point of view, the opponents were blinded by Quick's appearance and ended up making a mistake in blocking the two, noting that the guy named Ramsey was especially happy to keep stealing the ball from Floyd. Drake says Floyd needs to hold on a little longer, and since Ramsey, Gillingham's defence has started to falter. The ball hits Owen, and he makes a powerful shot at the goal. However, Gillingham goalkeeper Ryan Moses taps the ball with his fingertips, and the commentator praises him for his skill. The commentator says that Bolton have never been so close to scoring as they are now, adding that Pressis, who struggled with pressure throughout the first half, makes spectacular passes never missing a single opportunity to continue Gillingham's pressure. Quick Floyd looks at Owen and notes that his punch was so strong that he almost shit himself. Ramsey reflects on his coach, telling him to be extra careful with Floyd. He wonders if there's really any point in trying to stop him while leaving Precis alone, admitting to himself that he thinks the endgame strategy sucks since it's easier to not give them any passing opportunities at all. The commentator reports that due to the previous shot on goal, the pressure on Precis is again increasing. Nathan says that the enemy's attention has turned back to Owen, worrying that this calls into question their plan with Quick. Drake asks Nathan to stop looking at the tree and see the forest, asking him what happened to those who flocked to Owen. At the same moment, Quick Floyd runs up to Yoon Pressis to help him. He shouts at him to pass him, preparing to receive the ball. Owen immediately passes the ball to Quick, and the commentator says that Quick is now moving freely to the second line without encountering resistance which signals that Gillingham's defence is definitely losing a little bit. The commentator says that the defenders who stuck to Owen have returned to Quick again, and Drake says that now they themselves are confused about who they need to focus on. Drake says Gillingham's monolithic defence is unable to focus attention and has suffered multiple leaks. The commentator says that Quick Floyd is breaking through the defensive line again. Quick reflects that now the pressure on him has eased a little, and in the second half for some reason it increased, and it was difficult to get to the ball. Quick recalls Drake's words that he showed excellent dribbling today, and he should leave the attack to those who understand it better, noting that after the coach's words he felt much easier. He notes that he has even begun to see movements from players that he had not noticed before, while the commentator states that Quick calmly makes his way to the top of the box as if on a walk. Steve mentally tells Floyd that he created many memorable moments in the first half, but now Ramsey is standing in front of him, and this is the end of his next attempt. The sudden change in the situation on the football field causes Steve to fall silent and stare at Floyd in shock. The commentator reports that Ramsey and Forsyth appear in front of Quick to block his attack. Floyd reflects that he will still have to look through them, adding that there is nothing to grab onto, since they installed a protective block. Suddenly he hears Steve shout, ordering them to stop fooling around and pay attention to Owen Priestess, who is approaching them from behind. He orders them to quickly block him, but Quick manages to pass the ball to Owen, so that he can continue to develop his attack. Owen thanks Quick for the excellent pass and continues to run forward with the ball. Quick tells himself that Gillingham's defence failed for only a moment in which he was able to successfully reach the box. He notes that this gave the slow Owen extra time to attack the opponent's goal. Drake recalls that Bolton Wanderers' first team squad was largely made up of athletes who were unable to play on their own. He says that even if individually this team is pure chaos, 
When they come together, they become the new Messi, Donald and Neymar. Owen Preces, who has ranked first in average shots on goal over the last 10 matches, runs to within striking distance of the goal. Owen takes advantage of the opportunity and delivers a devastating blow, knocking the ball into the goal. After some time, a press conference begins for AC Gillingham coaches, where they are told that the match with Bolton ended with a score of 1-0. The reporter says that the loss ended their five-match winning streak and asks him if he feels bad about it. Steve Bruin honestly admits that, of course, it is unpleasant for him to lose in such a match. He says that they put a lot of effort into preparing for this match, and their athletes used all their skills and strictly followed the strategy. The reporter asks Steve what is the reason for their defeat, to which he replies that this answer is obvious to anyone who closely followed the match. Steve says that his defeat in this match is due to the fact that the opposing coach surpassed him in tactical abilities, mentally telling himself that he learned something. He tells himself that he will learn his lessons and next time he will not be such an easy target. That evening, Drake sits down in his office and brews a pot of delicious ramen. Drake inhales the aroma of the noodles and calls Nathan a damn traitor. He picks up the noodles with chopsticks and says that they were going to drink and sing songs today, lamenting that Nathan dared to leave, saying that they were waiting for him at home. Drake pours himself a soju, saying that this is why marriage is complete nonsense, since a man is doomed to sit as if in a dark cage and not be able to even drink with a friend whenever he wants. However, Drake notes that there are positives to family life, saying that Nathan is probably having a great time with his wife and daughter, noting that he is a happy bastard. Drake decides to check out the league statistics and opens the league table on his tablet. He notes that his team is now in 18th place, but only three points separate them from the relegation zone. Drake is frustratingly aware that there is no end in sight to the problems left by Derek Scott, adding that despite scoring 25 points, his club is only six points away from last place. He becomes lost in thought, reasoning that there are only five matches left until the end of the league, noting that even one failure would mean the road to hell for him. He remembers his last match and what happened in it around the 41st minute. The commentator says that one of the Bolton team athletes fell and the referee stopped the game. He says that the fallen player is Park Jung Ah, noting that he can't seem to get up. The commentator says that they see a signal that he cannot go to the bench and the medical team enters the field. Drake reflects that he did a great job of training Puck to be a real star, admitting that even he himself then thought that something terrible had happened on the field, although it turned out that it was just two micro-fractures. He also understands that all his players are very exhausted due to the peculiarity of their current composition, which is covering the inactive Owen with other athletes, which requires increased expenditure of energy. From Drake's point of view, the less force, the greater the likelihood of injury. He irritably notes that even alcohol does not get down his throat and decides to continue working. He spends some time searching, after which he finds the person he needs, starting to study his profile. The main character says that now it's finally time to meet the guy Nathan was talking about. The footballer Nathan recommended to pay attention to turns out to be a young athlete named Aidan Sensuous Roof, born in Wigan, County Manchester. He spent his youth playing for Wigan Football Club and was one of their up-and-coming players. However, a little more than 10 years have passed since then. The next day, Aiden Roof finishes soccer practice and changes into his street clothes. A teammate approaches him and invites him to have a couple of drinks at the pub. He adds that this will be a great opportunity for him to think about his career, but Aiden flatly refuses this offer. He indifferently replies that he has a lot to do and tomorrow he will need to go to work, to which his friend replies with sad understanding. His partner keeps trying and offers him a drink on the weekend, but Aiden leaves silently thinking that this guy is extremely lucky. He remembers that now he belongs to an unremarkable team from the 8th League. Aiden barely makes ends meet, juggling football and a factory job, earning a measly £39 a week. Funding for teams in such a league is initially low, and after today's defeat, the team was completely disbanded. Aiden arrives at his home, opening the entrance door. He tells his girlfriend that he's back when he notices an unexpected guest in his kitchen. He stares at Drake in surprise, asking his lover who this man is. His girlfriend says that this man introduced himself as the owner of the Bolton Wanderers football team, and Drake politely greets Aiden. He hands Aiden his business card, smiling widely. Aiden looks at the business card while Drake remembers that according to Nathan's report, Aiden has been wearing an electric bracelet for almost a year. Drake also recalls that the reason was an incident during which Aiden beat up a guy who was bullying his friend with a disability. However, then Aiden did not calculate the force and his blows were so strong that they left the bully himself disabled. After this incident, Roof was expelled from the youth team, 
since a player under house arrest cannot participate in away matches or attend night games and a team like Wigan, which is full of players, had no reason to keep him in the squad. Drake reflects that other clubs would be unlikely to want to take on a guy with such a troubled past, and finding a new team must have cost him a lot of effort. Drake says that he has found out a little about Aiden and adds that his basic skills are quite unusual, suggesting that this may be due to a year off from his youth and training on his own. Drake says he particularly noticed the unpredictability of his line break movements and his catchy, perfectly timed shot, noting that it was very impressive. Drake also says that the way he calmly stays in the box is worthy of a major league player, mentally noting that when compared to Park Chung, the latter is decisively inferior to Aiden. Drake thinks about the prospects for tactical opportunities if he signs a contract with Aiden. He admits that his mouth is watering at how promising this player can be. Aiden tells Drake that he is incredibly grateful for the appreciation of his abilities, but adds that there is one thing. Aiden says that he will not transfer to Bolton under any conditions, adding that if Drake studied his file well, he should have known about it. Drake doesn't appreciate such pretentious speeches and makes a displeased face. Drake says that he is interested in this just in case and asks Aiden whether the root cause of the feud between Wigan and Bolton, to which Aiden says that he heard that the owner has changed, which means Drake may not be aware of all the nuances. Aiden says that fan relations between the teams are so tense that police assistance is required on match days between them, so inviting a Wigan fan to play for Bolton sounds ridiculous. He ends his speech by saying that he is not in the mood for jokes, adding that the conversation can be considered over. Drake gets annoyed at this answer, thinking that Aiden doesn't seem to understand anything. He asks Aiden if he really doesn't understand, adding that all this ideological fluff doesn't matter now that his team has just broken up and he's no longer a footballer. Drake asks Aiden if fan pride is so important to him that he is willing to live the rest of his life working in a factory and watching football only on TV. Drake says he didn't come here for a guy who likes to fight with police in the stands, but for a guy who likes to play football. He says that if Aiden likes Wigan so much, no one is stopping him from coming to their matches and rooting for them with all his heart, adding that he honestly doesn't care whether Aiden likes Bolton or not, since he himself is not a Bolton fan and tries for him because this is his club. The main character also adds that in Wigan, no one is waiting for Aiden as a player, even if he gives up his bones for this. Drake gets up and hits the groan, confidently declaring that on Drake's team he can become such a player that his beloved Wigan will bite his elbows with envy. Drake emotionally calls Aiden a blockhead, saying that now, except for him, no one will accept a person with a record that contains a column about terminating a contract in the eighth league. He comes closer to Aiden and asks him if he was afraid that he would never attract Wigan. Drake says that if everything is as he said, then Bolton doesn't need Aiden, let alone Wigan, and he's wasting his time. After some time, Drake leaves and Aiden is left alone with his thoughts. Aiden remembers Drake's words that if he really wants to return to Wigan someday, he should not miss a single chance. Drake's face pops up in his head, asking him if he's afraid to fight for his place in the sun. His thoughts are briefly interrupted by his girlfriend, Ariana, who places her hand on his. He looks at her questioningly, to which she tells him that she is sure that he will definitely make the right choice. She adds that Drake's speech sounded incredibly rude and aggressive, but in her opinion, the club owner's proposal sounded quite reasonable and Aiden recalls that after the club's disbandment was announced, he made inquiries in search of a team for which he could play. However, as Aiden learned, no one wanted to accept him on their team. After this, Aiden again remembers Drake's question about whether he is ready to live the rest of his life working in a factory and watching football on TV, instead of picking himself up and pursuing a sports career. He clenches his fists, admitting to himself that he wants to continue his career as a football player. Meanwhile, Drake is walking down the street, thinking that Aiden is being a real stubborn bastard. Drake is amazed that a League 8 player would dare reject him, despite him practically bowing at his feet, and then says that all he had to do was come to Bolton, after which he would promote him so much that he would shine brighter than Park Chung. The next morning, during the team's training, Bolton Quick receives the ball and begins to develop an attack on the opponent's goal. One of the players smugly stands in front of Floyd, saying that he will take the ball away from him. Floyd, without hesitation, performs a body feint to deceive his opponent, which surprises him. However, the opponent thinks that he has already seen him dribble many times, which means his scheme can now be easily read. With these thoughts, he tries to take the football from Floyd, reading his movements. However, Floyd, without a second of doubting himself, circles his opponent, preventing him from getting the desired ball. 
Everyone present watches Floyd's movements in surprise, saying that it's as if Messi has inhabited his body. Fans standing behind Drake say that Quick was damn good, while Drake notes that the atmosphere at the public workout was great. He notes that Drake has clearly improved his technique on the ball, but this may be due to poor preparation of the defenders. Drake tells Nathan that Quick and Park Young can become great athletes if they improve their shooting skills. Drake asks Nathan if he has heard of a phenomenon called IPS, which is a sudden loss of certain skills in experienced athletes, deterioration of fine motor skills and psychological state. Nathan says that he is familiar with the term and has heard that it often happens to pitchers in baseball, to which Drake says that the term is also common in golf and then concludes that Nathan is familiar with it. He sums up his point by saying that this term also exists in football, seriously surprising Nathan. Drake says this is what got Quick into trouble with Shot, as he was injured due to the criticism he received on the junior national team. Nathan is surprised to see this side of Drake, noting that at first glance he appears to be a short-tempered brute with a sickening charm. However, Nathan now sees that Drake is capable of not only drawing up perverted strategies, but also of incredible care for the inner world of each player. Drake says that in order to overcome IPS, you need to start by practicing passes, in which the shooting goes towards the enemy and the pass goes towards your own, in order to reduce psychological pressure, to which Nathan replies that this is a good idea, since Floyd always made good passes into the defensive zone. Drake says that Nathan is right, as Floyd made the pass that defeated Gillingham, and if he little by little gains confidence in his passes, he will be able to overcome the IPS and make shots. Nathan reflects on how Drake has become a true coach who cares about the future of athletes. He looks at Drake and honestly admits that Drake has really grown above himself, but notices a sly grin on his face. After a second, Drake turns to Nathan and says that once they get stronger, they can be sold at exorbitant prices. He continues his reasoning, saying that they have invested a lot of effort in the players, and from the sale of a couple of people, they can get a substantial amount as compensation, after which he comes to the conclusion that they don't need to be sold, since they significantly increase the value of the club itself. And Nathan, Listening to all this, he comes to the conclusion that he hastened to conclusions, and Drake remains the grandson of his grandfather and thinks only about money. Drake announces that training is over for today, and the athletes allow themselves to relax for a while, catching their breath. Floyd reflects that he is now more confident in his success, despite the fact that playing as a striker seemed impossible to him. He recalls how he once succumbed to the persuasion of Derek Scott and agreed to be a defender, adding that deep down he always wanted to be a striker. However, from Floyd's point of view, the pressure that had held him back since the youth team did not disappear and his determination only faded. Quick admits to himself that Drake's words that he might not score calmed the endless fears and doubts that had previously overcome him. He comes to the conclusion that he will now make a name for himself as a striker who is good at breaking and linking. However, after a while, Floyd finds himself in front of Drake and blankly asks him if he really needs to practice shooting now. Floyd says that Drake told him that he might not score, to which he replies that he does not go back on his words, explaining that shooting is not a goal, but something similar to a pass towards the opponent. Drake asks Quick to think about a situation in which he successfully dribbles the ball and ends up passing the ball to someone else, adding that in this case, the aggressors will attack the one to whom he passed the pass. But if Floyd puts a lot of pressure on the opponent's defense, then they will, it will be difficult to maintain your style. Drake explains his point by telling Floyd that the point is not to try to score goals, but to simply put more effort into the ball, then adds that if he has a question about goals, then let him aim at people. The main character says that if the ball bounces to a teammate, a rebound will be possible, and if it hits someone in the hand, then there will be a foul, adding that this could also result in an own goal for the opponent, and if you are lucky and it will be considered a deflection, then it will be Floyd's goal. Drake says that Floyd does not have to shoot every time, and if he sees that he can pass, then he should immediately do so, after which he notes that there can definitely be situations on the field when there will be no passing routes due to pressure from defenders or because his teammates simply won't be in his sights. Drake continues his parting words, saying that in such a situation Floyd can aim at the enemy and then he will become the king of bouncers. He emphasizes that this is a fallback option, and if a chance arises to carry out a shot, then he does not need to aim at people on purpose. With these words, he says goodbye to Floyd, saying that he has business ahead of him, and Quick notes that Drake is very different from those he has seen before. He admits that even with all the dubiousness of his instructions until now, Drake gave him an O in roles that he could play, 
after which he realizes that if he trusts the coach, he will definitely become even better than now. Two days after this training session, Drake and another Bolton Club employee stand in the morning sun. They are located directly in front of the Bolton Wanderers brand store. Standing next to Drake, an employee who turns out to be in charge of communication with fans from the marketing team named Daniel Shy, reflects on why Drake called him here. He notes that they have been standing here for half an hour and just looking at what is happening, after which he assumes that Drake wants to check how the merch is selling. Suddenly, Drake screams with a brilliant idea, startling Daniel. He points to a small child, asking his father to enter the lottery, and asks him how he feels, to which he replies that he has many younger brothers and sisters and only feels PTSD. Drake excitedly tells Daniel that they need to start planning a huge project. He says the project will be called Bolton Wanderer's Young Worker, adding that they will be expanding the scope of the work to include children. Daniel asks Drake if there is a need to ask the children to participate in this experiment adding that although they are having trouble finding workers, the children are unlikely to be of much help to them. But Drake says that Daniel should listen to him before make comments. He says he doesn't need child labor and just wants to raise them into loyal Bolton Wanderers fans. He points again to the capricious child and says that he is impressed by the ardor of this little boy who stubbornly resists the grown man trying to play one more time. Drake encourages Daniel to tell this budding bully the history of their club. He adds that they will instill in him a sense of belonging to the team, and while he is still small and pliable, they will be able to mold him into a Wanderers with a strong character. Drake shows a couple of tickets, saying that he has prepared a nice gift to lure children. He says that he will give away tickets to the match to those who take part in this, and Daniel says that now he understands his motives, after which he asks if they will suffer losses if they give out free tickets. Drake asks Daniel if he really thinks the kids will come to the match alone. Drake says that they will go with adults, for whom it will no longer be free, adding that the ticket is just a bait for children. After some time, Daniel invites the children who were lured in this way, asking them to follow him. He opens the doors of the museum and turns on the lights, and a whole bunch of exhibits and cups appear in front of the kids. The children's eyes immediately light up with delight, and they begin to explore the room. Daniel says that this is where they keep the uniform of the 1905-06 Player of the Year, Alfred Stafford, before pointing to the boots worn by the 1955-56 Player of the Year, Nathan Loftus. After this, Daniel presents the club's trophies, saying that in the 1909-1910 and 77, 78 seasons they won the second division, and in 96, 97 the first division. He adds that each of the leagues is now a second division league on par with the EFL. Daniel tells the children that they have 10 minutes to look around, but if they touch anything, they will receive a 50-point penalty after which the children happily run around the hall. The children, with a fascinated look, examine everything in the hall, sticking to the glass. Daniel takes photographs of the children, remembering Drake's order that the children be sure to have memorable photographs. From Drake's point of view, in this case, the children will definitely want to show their parents what they did and what they saw. And then the parents, of course, will be happy and agree to take a look. And then they will hear that the photographs are hanging at Bolton Stadium. Drake expands on his idea by saying that once they think they have to go there to see a photo of their child, they will be hooked, and if they don't then buy their child a ticket to the game, they will become bad parents. After some time, photographs of children appear on the board with photographs of young employees and children with their parents gather around it. Daniel says that Drake used children as bait, admitting that it is the craziest thing he has ever seen. He pins another photo on the board, noting that the decision has nevertheless borne fruit. Also, after some time, the children are having fun in Drake's tent, located in his office. They ask Drake why there is a large tent in his office, to which he replies that he eats, strategizes, and sleeps in it. The child asks Drake if he can sleep in it, to which Drake politely replies that the tent is narrow enough, and he is so tall that the child would not fit in it even if he wanted to. The child says that in this case he will be able to sleep sitting up, to which Drake says that if he sleeps like this, he will not grow up so it would be better for him to bring his own tent and sleep in it. The child says that it sounds very exciting, to which Nathan reflects that children amuse him a lot. Nathan points out that children can want whatever they want, but they can never become like him. After some time, the 42nd round of the league begins, in which the Bolton Wanderers team compete against Lincoln Ostian at the University of Bolton Stadium. The child asks the adult how many tickets they need, to which the adult asks him in surprise why he helps sell tickets. He smiles brightly at the child, asking him to sell him two tickets at once. 
Nathan says there's a lot of people watching today, asking Drake if his project with the kids really made it all happen. He adds that Drake is definitely the best of the best when it comes to sucking money out of people, to which he says that it is too early to admire him, and this is just the initial profit. Drake says these kids will grow up to be loyal wanderers thanks to today, adding that if they successfully lay the foundations for nurturing such fandom, the club's value will increase significantly. Drake reflects that these long-term prospects are not his goal. He understands that after his participation in EFL1 is confirmed, the number of spectators will increase and he will be able to sell the club at an exorbitant price. Meanwhile, the silhouette of a tall man appears among the crowd of spectators. The man turns out to be Aiden Roof, who mingles with the crowd and goes into the stands to watch the match. After some time in the game, the commentator reports that the ball is lost and a Lincoln player named David Brown has a chance to attack. He passes the ball to Maurice to continue the development of the attack on the opponent's goal. However, they lose the ball and the commentator reports that Dominic Saldo takes the ball back with exquisite precision. The commentator notes that Maurice and Brown have scored 20 goals together this season, but today they were unable to break through as Bolton defenders stopped all their attacks. The commentator says that there is very little time left and Lincoln has not yet taken a shot on goal, adding that he thinks they need to change their strategy if they seriously hope to win. Aiden notes that Bolton blocked everything, even open passes, runs through the defence and long passes. He is amazed that Bolton's team play is so coordinated, as if they are anticipating every move of the enemy. Meanwhile, he passes a long pass to Rapid, who easily accepts it. The commentator reports that the defenders surrounded him, taking their places, and wonders whether he will be able to get out of such a difficult situation. Suddenly, one of the Lincoln players notices the Bolton striker running behind them, he turns around and indignantly asks where their scorer went, while the commentator says that Mason Aronson has passed the Lincoln defenders from the left flank. Lincoln players try to block him to prevent a pass in his direction. Owen Priestis, watching what is happening, suddenly realises that he has a great opportunity. He sees that the enemy's defence lines have been broken, and an open road to the gate opens in front of him. At that very moment he turns to Aaron Rapid, telling him that he is open for a short pass. Aaron passes the ball to Owen and he quickly takes it, preparing for a powerful blow. Taking his time, Owen delivers a devastating kick to the ball, giving it breathtaking speed. The ball hits the goal, giving Bolton another point. The stands explode with joyful shouts and applause, and the commentator declares that right at the end of the match, Owen Priestis scored the winning goal. The referee announces the end of the match and the commentator says that Bolton Wanderers defeat Lincoln with a crushing score of 3-0. Aiden Roof turns his attention to Drake, who happily raises his hand in the air, enjoying his team's triumph. Aiden thinks, finally understanding what the Bolton Wanderers team is now. After some time, Drake holds a press conference with reporters on the results of the last match, and the reporters ask him about the secret of his victory over the Lincoln Club. Drake states that Lincoln have focused more on defence than offence this season, adding that they have shown excellent defence of individual zones assigned to players, but if the defensive lines are carefully controlled, it will not be easy to break through them. He adds that in order to break through the defence line, they carried out successive attacks from different directions, like a seesaw, to which the reporter is surprised to ask if Drake can cover this tactic in more detail. Drake says that first Aaron made his way from the right side, forcing the defenders to move to the right flank, and then, half a step late, Mason came from the other side, similarly pulling the left flank, causing the Lincoln defence to split in two. Drake adds that Lincoln had previously defended their positions well to prevent Owen Priestis from getting through the middle. Drake specifically emphasises that the situation changed significantly as soon as Mason suddenly rushed towards them, making attempts to contain Owen difficult, as a result of which, in an attempt to quickly block Mason, they momentarily opened the centre, which Owen took advantage of, bringing the team a point. Aiden watches the press conference, admitting to himself that at first he thought Drake was crazy. The reporter tells Drake that a few weeks ago on Radio Kearsley, he assured everyone that Bolton's modest number of players did not hinder the team in any way. But in this game, despite the victory, the noticeable absence of Park Chung, who was absent due to injury, was felt, which shows that still there is a big difference between the game of the main player and the player from the bench. The reporter concludes his question by asking Drake if he plans to strengthen the team by signing available players, to which Drake replies that this is true, and he never stated that he would not sign players at all, adding that he does not want to rush and take just anyone just for the quantity. Drake develops his idea by saying that he does not care about the reputation 
or past achievements of the players. From his point of view, any player who is able to bring victory to the Bolton club will be invited as a participant without hesitation, which means this matter cannot be approached in a hurry. Aidan is impressed by Drake's words, and he considers joining the Bolton club, offering to see if there is truth in his words. After some time, Bolton announced on their official website that a new player named Aidan Sensuos Luck had joined the team. Due to the lack of information about him, fans reacted to his appearances with some prejudice, so in the next few minutes, additional details of his profile were posted, which greatly annoyed fans. Sometime later, Aidan walks down the hallway, heading to the soccer field for practice, passing team members unceremoniously bump him with their shoulders. One of them turns his head irritably, saying that these CGs don't see anything in front of them at all. However, he immediately encounters the chilling gaze of Aiden, who is ready to defend his rights. He decides to make a joke of it, nervously explaining that Bolton has a song with these words, to which his friend says that it is a real masterpiece, adding that the thought of them all singing it together makes his heart flutter. They look after Aiden, whispering that they almost got into trouble, since this man has a criminal record for violence, and then wonder why the hell Drake hired a member of the club, Wigan, who also has a criminal record. After a while, the training begins, and Drake commands them to jump more and more often, adding that their hips do not feel the load at all. He shouts over the loudspeaker that they are versatile players, so they will have to run a lot on the field, and in the real game, they will have to do much worse than now, so they cannot afford to give up at the very beginning. Drake says jumping jacks aren't just a leg-strengthening exercise, adding that the workout increases hip explosiveness and therefore improves every movement. The protagonist tells his team that if they train constantly, they can become sprinters that no one can keep up with, while Aiden reflects on how this is already his 20th attempt, noting that he assumed it would be harder than in the 8th Division League, but he didn't think it was that much. Suddenly, Drake addresses Aiden over the loudspeaker. He shouts that he is telling him to keep the correct position when he sits down, asking him if he is going to secretly raise one heel anymore calling him a little scoundrel. Aiden tries to answer him, but is unsuccessful due to the continued training and Drake's loud responses. He reflects that Drake is definitely a bastard who finally went crazy, adding that his image to journalists is a complete fake. With these words, Drake takes off his t-shirt, surprising his brother standing next to him. He exposes his alcoholic belly, saying that they don't understand anything, so he will have to show them how to do the exercises correctly. Drake says to keep your knees at right angles, Keep your hips parallel to the ground, keep your back straight as a stick, and then jump up and land softly, to which Aiden is surprised that he took off his shirt, noting that Drake is even crazier than he thought. At this time, Drake turns to Aiden and asks him if he wants to play in the next match. Aiden says that it hasn't even been a week since he left the 8th Division League, to which Aiden asks him with a grin if he considers himself to be an 8th Division player in terms of skill level. Drake adds that he didn't plan to give Aiden time to get his body up to the third division level, noting that he could compete in the next match, even if he wasn't used to jumping yet. Evening comes and the whole team lies down wearily on the grass, desperately trying to regain their strength. Aiden reflects that not only was the training incredibly grueling, but they were also talking nonsense under his ear, noting that he was left completely exhausted. One of the players approaches him, and mockingly asks if he was really put on the same team with a guy who doesn't even know the basics. He expresses the hope that Aiden forced himself to hold out until the end of the exercise, not because he believed this joke about the next match, adding that even though the chairman is crazy, it will be too much even for him. Suddenly, Quick Floyd turns around and looks ahead in surprise. He sees that Park Chung has returned to the team and happily greets him. He asks him how his leg is feeling, to which he replies that everything is fine with him and he can play from the next match. Aiden looks at Park Chung, mentally noting that everyone here considers him a legend. He recalls that the player initially came under fire for his promotion to the communications team. However, everything changed after the first match and the first winning goal. The opinion about him changed dramatically, and Aiden remembers that they began to call him the new deity of Bolton. He turns his head to the side, noticing some gossip between the players. He recognizes one of the players as a 19-year-old striker named Slow Bolki, who, despite his age, copes well with the role of wild card, excellent control of the ball in the air, after which he turns his gaze to Aaron Larid standing next to him, who is a left winger and has gained fame for his game in the semi-finals. Aiden questions why he wants to field him even though he has such outstanding players, adding that he wasted his energy on jumping. One of the football players approaches Aiden, saying that the offender's name is Victor Jones, who always bullies new players. He says that if you listen to him, 
you get the impression that he cares most about the team, adding that they should not pay attention to his words, since he himself sits on the bench, after which Aiden recognizes this player team captain named Dignity. Dignity tells Aiden that he is right, adding that he would like to talk about their next opponents, to which Aiden replies that he knows about them. Dignity says that it is precisely because of this that Aiden is unlikely to be taken to the battlefield unless Drake completely goes crazy. Aiden realizes that Bolton's next opponent will be Wigan Football Club and is lost in thought. Aiden comes into the shower thinking about the fact that he accepted Drake's offer to come to Bolton, train here and wear a Bolton uniform, but this does not change the fact that this does not make him a true wanderers. He understands that he has lived as an essigy for more than 20 years, and this is almost his entire life, and after that he cannot so easily rebuild and change his feelings. He leaves the shower with heavy thoughts that this decision was not easy for him, and he is even more pressured by the fact that his first opponent here will be Wigon. Aiden argues that Drake is not a fool and understands this perfectly well, which means that if he really wants Bolton to win, then he will not allow him to play on the field. He passes the news board, realizing that if he returns to Wigan, it will not be until he has significantly improved his skills. Seeing the writing on the news board, he drops his bag and looks at it in shock. He sees himself included in the first team squad for the upcoming match against Wigan. Aiden tries to understand what motivated Drake, noting that this is an absolutely crazy and illogical act. He recalls that Wigan and Bolton fiercely compete with each other, but if judged only by points, then Bolton is not their competitor at all since Wigan is now in third place in the top EFL1 and is a fairly strong team. Aiden points out that he had only been on the team for four days, so putting him against such a strong team was a mistake. Meanwhile, Drake holds a meeting with Richard Gears about tactics for the upcoming match. Drake says the majority of their profits come from viewership. Richard asks Drake if he deliberately put Aiden in the lineup to cause a stir among the fans, to which Drake replies that this is indeed true, adding that it was all for profit. Drake says it's Bolton versus Wigan, so they should exploit this mutual animosity between them. He suggests recalling the derby between the two Manchester teams, thanks to which their matches always become the subject of heated discussions, and not only for fans of these teams, but for all football fans in general. Drake says that they will also organise a small derby, similar to the Manchester one. He continues his thought by saying that they should add fuel to the war between Bolton and Wigan by releasing Aiden as a Bolton player adding that they could also watch their own fan play against Wigan. Richard Gears thinks about this plan, falling silent for a moment. He says that the fans always react strongly to matches between them, adding that they have not yet had a player from Wigan, adding that it may indeed increase ticket sales. But more importantly, Aiden's abilities are still not up to the level of EFL1. Richard adds that they can put him on the field if Drake is willing to turn a blind eye to these factors. Richard says that Drake, besides profit, must have another reason to put him on the team. Drake says that this is exactly what was expected of the manager, adding that Richard knows him even better than Nathan, with whom he has lived side by side for 20 years. He states that Richard is absolutely right, and he will be able to see this second reason personally during the match. After some time, the day of the match arrives, which takes place at the Wigan Football Club Stadium called Yggdrasil Arena. One of the Bolton fans decides to start celebrating early and greedily drinks from a can of beer. In a drunken stupor, he stands up and shouts for Bolton to beat Wigan, who are pathetic weaklings. His neighbour from the opposite team of fans says that the Bolton fan is just as crazy and backward as his team. A drunken Bolton fan looks at his neighbour, asking him if he has lost his head from impudence. The Wigan fan stands up and delivers a quick and brutal punch to the face of the man harassing him. The victim is picked up by another Bolton fan and tells his comrades that they should take these vile essigies and not sit idly by. Nathan watches the fans fight and tells Drake that they urgently need to do something about it. However, turning to Drake, he watches how his brother passionately supports the fans of his team. Nathan says that this is all because of his interview yesterday, asking him why he said this nonsense and put them in this position, to which he responds that Nathan only does what he finds fault with his decisions. The day before the match, Drake said that Wagan are a strong team, so they do not expect the match against them to be easy. Drake added that Aiden Sensuos Roof will take to the field tomorrow, but not as an Esigi, but as one of the Wanderers. He adds that everyone can criticize him as much as they want for being Esigi, but after he scores a goal against Wigan tomorrow, all this hatred will be replaced by endless joy. From Drake's point of view, putting Aiden in the squad will inevitably distract the Wigan players while Bolton remain ready. Back in the present, Drake asks Nathan if he's heard anything about the show, adding that everyone came just for it. 
Drake adds that this situation will only happen in the stadium, emphasizing that a huge number of spectators will watch the live broadcast, which means they cannot be disappointed. However, at the same second, a compressed soda can flies into the back of his head. One of the fans shouts to Drake that if Bolton loses today, he will send him to his forefathers, to which he replies that he will most likely send him to a short address. He urges him down, clenching his fists as Nathan tries to hold him down while Wigan's trainer, Percival Gardner, looks on haughtily. He stares at Drake, surprised that he was able to gain his master's approval, adding that he would never acknowledge him. He muses that he will personally prove to coach Steve that Drake was unworthy of his praise. From Percival Gardner's point of view, Drake is only disgracing all coaches with his behavior. After some time, the commentator announces the start of the 43rd round of the league, during which the teams Wigan and Bolton Wanderers will compete in a duel, after which he immediately notes that Deckard rushes deep into the enemy's formation from the very beginning, demonstrating his serious attitude. He weaves past several Bolton defenders passing to his teammate Strong. Drake reflects that Raheem Strong is a very scary guy who sits top on points in EFL 1. The commentator soon notices that Quick Floyd is quickly blocking him, and despite the significant difference in strength, they maintain excellent balance. Floyd manages to outwit Raheem Strong, and with his pressure he returns the ball to his team, passing it to Dignity to the delight of the commentator. Without hesitating for a second, Dignity decides to pass the ball to Park Chung, delivering a confident kick. The commentator admires such a skillful long pass, while Percival Gardner mentally notes that everything is going as he predicted. From his point of view, this is a typical pass used by a weak team that fights with a strong one, since the risk of losing the ball is minimal, and there is an excellent chance that this will turn into a successful development of the attack. However, this time this trick does not work, and a Wigan team defender rushes towards Park Chung. He jumps into the air, hitting the ball with his head, to which the commentator states that Berber has no problem parrying Bolton's attack. Percival gloats that Bolton probably didn't see this coming, adding that they will always defend their right to be in EFL 1. He notes that they have broken such transmissions countless times. Meanwhile, Deckard again fiercely presses Owen and takes the ball from him. Seconds later, Strong bursts forward, battering the Bolton Wanderer's defence. The commentator states that the ball has changed its direction again, and the Bolton players seem to step aside in a daze before the power of Wigan rushing towards them. Nathan tells Drake that the situation is getting dangerous, adding that the difference in the players' skills was much greater than he thought. He adds that he sees a complete loss of confidence in the Bolton players' faces. Drake says he doesn't understand Nathan's worries because they have another player who is doing just fine. Nathan asks him what he means, and he explains that he's talking about that guy from the 8th Division. From Drake's perspective, Aiden is confident and not afraid of anything. Drake proudly states that Aiden doesn't care that this is a strong team, just like he didn't care that he played for them in the past. Aiden, meanwhile, muses that he has no idea what Drake was thinking, adding that he'll play along if that's what he wants. Drake concludes by saying that Aiden is a very sneaky striker who wants nothing more than to play football. At the same time, Aiden looks at the situation on the battlefield and wipes the sweat from his forehead with a slight movement not worrying at all about the power of the Wigan team. He briefly dives into the past, remembering how scared he was when Wigan competed in the famous EPL League. In those days, while still a player in the Wigan youth team, he clearly remembered this feeling. He watched in fascination the matches of his team, which fought against very strong opponents. It was then that he realized that he really liked the feeling when you challenge a strong team from a higher league. He also liked tactics that often caught the enemy by surprise. But what he liked even more was how the players implemented all these strategies and maneuvers in the game. Aiden admits to himself that in his mind back then, Wigan was invincible, and even many years later, he was always afraid to fight his desired opponent. Returning to the present, he honestly admits to himself that the current Wigan has not lived up to his expectations from him. Will Deckard receives the ball, and the commentator reports that he is rushing straight towards the opponent's goal. Will remembers that the coach was worried before this match and admits to himself that he himself thought that there was a reason for this. But in his opinion, Bolton turned out to be a simple low-grade team, lost in the victorious thoughts that if he passes to Strohn, then the point will be in their pocket. He loses sight of Aiden approaching him. Will, without having time to react, immediately loses the ball, not noticing Aiden, rushing like a hurricane across the football field. Aiden continues to develop the direction of attack facing Wigan defenders named Sergei Verba. He looks arrogantly at Aiden and wonders if he really decided to try to dribble him, after which he decides to answer the challenge and test his opponent's worth. However, 
Aiden decides to use a little trick and faints his body, stopping abruptly in place. Sergei falls into a stupor from such a strange movement and stares at Aiden with incomprehension. Taking advantage of the second pause, Aiden again rushes to the attack, skirting Willow, and the commentator joyfully notes that he has never seen such an unusual diversionary maneuver in his life. Nathan looks at Aiden Roof with bulging eyes and asks Drake what kind of strange techniques he just saw, to which Drake replies that it was Nathan who recommended taking him to the club. So over time, Aiden picks up the pace and breaks through to the goal, and the commentator says that this is a very good chance to earn a point. The goalkeeper prepares to repel the attack, but briefly freezes at Aiden's strange movements. The commentator states with surprise that Aiden is posing, demonstrating some kind of shamanic dance with his movements. Nathan completely goes crazy, not understanding what is happening, to which Drake irritably tells him that he hired him, after which he calls his brother a bastard. Aiden finishes his dancing and hits the ball, sending it on a highly unpredictable trajectory. The goalkeeper manages to turn around and notices that the ball is flying into the upper corner of his goal, after which he makes a dash towards it. Wigan goalkeeper Samuel Jackson catches the ball, and the commentator reports that no one could believe that he would miss even such a difficult shot. Percival looks at Aiden, who is upset about his failure. However, he does not share his pessimism, starting to nervously bite the fingers of his palm. He looks on excitedly at Aiden's antics and wonders what the hell he just saw. He rubs his eye and mentally admits that this blow was very good, despite a hundred unsuccessful ones. He wonders why Aiden is behaving so obscenely, suggesting that by doing this he wants to show that all people from the Wigan youth teams behave this way. He angrily wonders why everyone still considers Drake a strategic genius if he decided such a player deserved to be on his team. He remembers the same pre-match press conference where Drake announced Aiden's participation in his team. At the time he called the performance sheer stupidity, but Steve Bruin warned him not to underestimate it. Steve then said that although Drake grinds out whatever comes into his head, in fact he is an outstanding genius who uses extremely unpredictable tactics that can easily prove effective if Percival is careless. Percival hesitantly asked Steve if he thought Drake was a more talented trainer than him. Steve thought for a moment, not daring to give an answer to this provocative question. Having gathered his resolve, he says that it is difficult for him to admit this, but everything goes to the fact that he is more talented than even himself. He remembers that Steve suggested that he look at the results of the match, to which Percival, concentrating on the current game, says that the result of this game is a foregone conclusion and there will be nothing to look at. He looks at Drake with contempt, and states that he is definitely a more talented trainer than Drake. Drake, meanwhile, comes to his senses and reflects that Aiden's maneuvers could benefit them. Meanwhile, the commentator announces that the first half of the match ended with a score of 0-0. Zero, zero. During halftime, Drake comes into the locker room saying that the whole team did a really good job. He adds that despite the lag in the number of shots and the percentage of ball possession, the result speaks for itself, adding that Wigan were unable to earn a single point. Drake says they can finally move on to the next strategy. After a while, Park Chung-ah lets out a loud cry, filled with pain and despair. The commentator says that only 20 minutes have passed since the second half began, adding that Bolton seemed to have decided that the Yggdrasil Arena is a place for camping, since in those 20 minutes they have already fallen to the ground six times. He continues his tirade, saying that it seems to him that Bolton did not come to fight, but to stall for time so that the ball would in no way hit their goal. The Wigan striker shouts at the pack, calling him a bastard and telling him to get up and not be a fool, to which he dramatically shouts that all opponents are bandits. Percival says he can't believe what he's seeing, wondering if Bolton thinks he can win like this. He calms down and says that even if Bolton get a draw, their position in the table will not be lower. But for Wigan, this match is extremely important because if they draw, they will no longer be able to reach second place this season. He assumes that this is the reason for this behavior, and again becomes irritated, saying that Drake's pride exceeds all limits. Suddenly, he remembers the words of his mentor that he would remember one very important thing. Steve said that Drake's advantage is not only that he has a good understanding of players and builds unpredictable tactics. From Steve's point of view, the reason he is so wary of him is somewhat different. Steve was convinced that Drake would do anything to win the match. At this moment, Drake glances at Percival and he notices that he is full of enthusiasm and cunning. The scene moves a few days before the match to Bolton's training ground. At that time, Owen, exhausted from grueling training, asks to simply finish him off and end his suffering. Aiden, sitting on the grass and watching his entire team feign serious injuries, wonders what the point of this training is. Suddenly, his bewilderment is interrupted by Drake, quietly approaching him closer. 
He asks Aiden if he is going to do this drill properly to have a chance to take the field. Aiden tries to repeat the exercise, and Drake says that he has absolutely no faith in his acting, adding that if he takes it so lightly, then they won't get that far. With these words, he sits on Victor Jones and asks him to remember, to which Aiden shouts that now he should actually be in pain. Drake says that King Victor can't be hurt, so Aiden shouldn't devalue his acting skills like that, adding that he's now hurting a follower of Derek Scott himself, which is an unforgivable offence. Drake says that Aiden still doesn't understand all the intricacies of the craft, adding that now Sergeant Park will seem like a masterclass to him. Drake says that now we need to perform simulation number 17 called Aggressive Stopping the Striker. Park Chung begins to pretend and Aiden notes his outstanding skills. Puck crashes to the ground and Aiden admits that it looks incredibly realistic, as if all this is really happening. He looks at Park Chong, who is crumpled in agony, and seriously wonders whether he was really hurt. Park continues his performance, making pitiful cries of imaginary agony. Aiden looks at the next take of this drill, and reflects that he is so impressed that it is as if he is seeing the player who injured him. Aiden says that with such skills he can even fool Var, to which Drake says that this is the highest level of skill. Drake proudly states that this all happened thanks to his special training, mentally noting that after it, his skills could not help but improve. He then says that Park Chung is good at more than just that, adding that his ability to judge distance and get the ball right where Owen can shoot from is incredible. Drake states that all of these, of course, are tricks and cannot be called real football. But in the confrontation with Aiden's former team, he will have to use all options and put his pride far away. Drake states that all this acting is not for the purpose of winning a draw, adding that he is going to defeat Wigan. Aiden muses that they're not here for fun, adding that he can clearly see that even with this kind of acting, Wigan will beat them. Aiden looks at Park Chung and says that if they are really going to beat Wigan, they have to give it their all. The judge, meanwhile, talks to Dignity, saying that this is no longer serious, demanding that he do something, adding that if this continues, he will have to add 15 minutes to the total game time. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted by Aiden, who runs towards Park Chung, lying on the ground with a dramatic scream. He despairingly asks Park Chung if he can breathe and how he feels, surprising his teammate. He sheds a stingy manly tear, saying that Park Chung gave him a promise to make it to the EPL. He says that Park Chung should hold on and remember his mother, who is waiting for him at home, and the members of Team Whedon get into the drama of the situation, also shedding a few tears. He asks Puck what he will say to his brother, who is now in the hospital due to an accident, and even the judge begins to sniffle, thinking that England needs to improve its policy towards foreigners. Raheem Strong says that this bastard fell out of the blue, asking everyone if they are ashamed to create melodrama here. However, the referee does not listen to his voice of reason and shoves a yellow card right in his face. The referee says that he will not tolerate any rudeness on the football field, adding that he honestly tried to be on his side, but he did everything to get this card. The judge recommends that Rahim put it in his name and not show off. The commentator states that Bolton had been given another chance for a penalty, adding that the player is preparing to take the shot alone. He adds that the goal is 40 yards away, but Wigan are not complacent and have built a strong defensive wall, adding that Bolton Wanderers' play has become increasingly threatening of late, as if they are trying to intimidate their opponents. Percival shouts to his team, telling them not to wander back and forth and to do everything at their pace, calmly and confidently defending the goal, after which he reflects on how the tactic of pretending on the field is a typical choice of a weak team playing against a strong one, adding that they, of course, expected this course of action and worked out special countermeasures. He reflects that, after all, his honour and the opportunity to gain the recognition of teacher Gadner are at stake, noting that this is why he carefully developed tactics for playing not only against Owen and Park Chung, but also against the rest of the players. Percival comes to the conclusion that they only need to remove two variables to win. After this, he yells at Raheem Strong to respond to their pretense as they discussed. Drake at the same time realises that they have achieved the destruction of the mental state of their opponents due to a game that is devoid of common sense. Little by little, all of Rahim's thoughts focused on only one man who came out as a flanker after the break and deceived everyone with his inimitable play. He stands behind Puck and watches him closely, asking him if he is going to fall again, adding that he is now right under the VR. Meanwhile, Owen Priestess concentrates on the upcoming penalty, gathering his will into a fist. With concentration and proper aim, he delivers a crushing blow to the ball, sending it far towards the goal. 
The goalkeeper watching the ball frantically tries to understand whether this is a deceptive maneuver or a tricky pass. He realizes that this pass is definitely sent to Puck, who is standing behind the Wigan defenders. He focuses his attention on Puck, watching his movements. He notices that the Wigan team's defenders are completely blocking him, which means he can only take the ball. However, another Bolton striker intervenes and decides to take matters into his own hands. Drake notes that the final step of their strategy is to find a chance to break through the defense of the ever-vigilant Raheem Strong. Taking advantage of Raheem's mistake, Aiden slips through them, continuing to gain enormous speed. Raheem looks back in amazement and notices the satisfied face of Puck, who had anticipated such a maneuver in advance. Percival is horrified by the danger of the situation and shouts at Raheem not to count the crows and catch the impudent Aiden. Raheem rushes after Aiden, trying to grab onto his shirt with his hand. However, Aiden easily escapes his grip and rushes towards the enemy goal. Strong can only look after Aiden in shock, not understanding how he was fooled. Drake notes that Raheem Strogue's focus on defense helped them disguise their movements, which became a huge screen for the enemy. Meanwhile, Aiden breaks ahead, realizing that his finest hour has come. He recalls the events that took place in the Bolton dressing room at half-time. Suddenly, Drake called out to him and he turned around, staring at him questioningly. Drake asked Aiden what those sighs were, adding that he was nervous for nothing, after which he calls him a shaman, to which Aiden says that he almost died of shame in the first half. Drake says that when he watched him move in the match, he wondered if he was even human, adding that Aiden looked like a newborn baby giraffe getting tangled up in its own legs. After this strange speech, Drake adds that this is why he put him in the lineup. Drake says that Gardner is probably going crazy, adding that after seeing Aiden's show, he will definitely decide that he is a worthless player and their defenders will absolutely not block him, which means they absolutely will not recognize his killer skills behind the screen of shamanism, after which he notes that Percival may be Bruin's student, but he is still far from his analytical abilities. Drake tells Aiden that he will definitely get his chance in the second half, and when that happens, Percival Gardner will pay dearly for counting him out. The commentator, blazing with enthusiasm, reports that Roof broke through the wall of the Wigan defense. Strong grabs Aiden's shirt with his hand, holding him in place only briefly. However, this is enough for Aiden to stumble a little and slow down his speed. He notices the ball falling a few meters away from him, and the commentator alarmingly says that Aiden may not have time to strike. The ball flies over the field line, and the commentator says that at such a speed, it is impossible to catch the ball. Percival breathes a sigh of relief, admitting that he was confused for a moment, but now everything is going smoothly. Meanwhile, Aiden remembers what Drake says at his last training session. He stated that jumping, among other things, increases the explosive power of the legs, which means it will improve their every movement. He recalls his thoughts that he was only an eighth division player, and therefore had to work like a dog to close the gap between himself and other players. Drake also appears before his eyes, who tells him that he cannot miss this chance. At this moment, he finds incredible strength within himself and pushes off the ground with increasing force. Aiden picks up crazy speed, and the commentator notes that Aiden Roof decides to catch up with the flying ball. Percival notes that Aiden looks like he is a rabid dog on the loose. He looks at the ball, reassuring himself with the thought that it doesn't matter anymore because the ball almost hit the outfield. However, at the same moment, Aiden catches up with the ball and swings for a powerful blow. Nathan and Percival are frozen in place, unable to utter a word, while time seems to slow down. However, Drake, watching Aiden with pride and confidence, says that the time has come to prove himself properly. Aiden manages to hit the ball, preventing it from flying off the field, sending it towards the goal. The ball spins along a bizarre trajectory thanks to Aiden's powerful kick and flies straight into the goal. The goalkeeper understands that this cross is flying straight at him, realizing that at such a speed he can safely throw the ball outside the danger zone. He jumps to catch it, but the ball turns out to be twisted and suddenly changes its trajectory in the air. The goalkeeper only has time to wonder in shock how Aiden was able to spin him along such a bizarre trajectory. In the last seconds before the goal, he realizes that his initial premonition was not wrong. However, the ball quickly flies into the goal, stretching the net due to its high flight speed. The stadium erupts in cheers or applause, and the commentator says that it's like a UFO flew over the stadium. After which he adds that with this blow, Aiden plunged a knife into the back of his former team. After some time, the commentator announces the end of the match with a score of 1-0 in favour of the Bolton Wanderers team. He adds that Bolton are a real whirlwind, having crushed third-placed Wigan on their own home turf. Drake says Gardner failed to control the player's mentality and, more importantly, underestimated the power of his opponent. 
Meanwhile, Fanata Wigun calls Aiden a damned traitor, saying that now he has no right to be called Esigi, adding that he is an ungrateful trash. Wigan fans continue to curse Aiden, but soon enough Drake approaches him, beckoning him to come to him. He says that today the fans shower him with praise, so they should go and smile at them together. Aiden smiles at Drake and then follows him, supported by his team. And Drake mentally notes that Percival's last mistake was forgetting about the arrival of a new Bolton Wanderers striker named Aiden Roof. A couple of days later, a second group of young Bolton Wanderers staff visit Drake's office, where he tells them the story of his brilliant victory over Wigan. Drake ends their story by saying that they made it clear to Wigan what kind of dirty and dishonest tricks they can do. Nathan, who listened to this story, pats Drake's cheeks and tells him that he warned him to choose his words in front of the children. One of the children tells Drake that he has one more question, to which he politely asks him what he wants to know from him. He asks Drake if he will now try to lead Bolton Wanderers to the EFL Challenger League, surprising Nathan. He remembers Drake's words and argues that he probably still plans to sell the team and leave the country. Drake smiles and says that this is his plan, adding that this is why he is trying so hard, while Nathan continues to reflect on how he used to do everything for profit. But now that he has been through so much with the team, he will inevitably have a hard time at heart. The next day, Drake finds himself sitting in the Bolton Wanderers team office, bored out of his mind. Drake rubs his head, trying to figure out what he can do to cope with the dizziness. He looks at social networks, noting that his team has nine wins, two draws, and four losses, which means there are more and more positive reviews about him, which contributes to the appearance of strange posts. He also notes that trade turnover, which previously was simply falling, is now completely frozen. But fortunately, they cancelled the order for a new batch of toys before they began to sit in the warehouse. Drake asks himself with horror and bewilderment what they found so attractive in these toys that makes them hug and kiss them adding that people are completely crazy these days. Emma Charlotte, who is in the store, hears Drake's desperate screams even through several ceilings and flinches from the sharp sound. The cashier, who wants to punch the receipt on her toy, asks her permission to take it, while Emma wonders what the noise was all about. After some time, Drake comes to the Horwich radio station to record a podcast about the life of the Bolton Club. Podcast host Aaron welcomes listeners by saying that they are starting a program called Bolton Evening News, he introduces himself again, saying his name is Aaron Bench, adding that he is very pleased that this program has become in great demand. He states that today they have a very important guest, who is the king of all kings, coach and owner of Bolton Wanderers, nicknamed Little Drake. Drake is surprised by Aaron's strange behavior, but quickly realizes that he reminds him of someone. Deeply immersed in thoughts about the recent past, he realizes that it was Aaron Bench who made love posts along with Drake's Dakimakura. Drake mentally notes that he always knew that Aaron was always a Bolton fan, but he never imagined that he would be so obsessed with Drake personally. Drake muses that it's all because of his overwhelming success, so he can't be surprised, while Aaron asks him if he can borrow a lock of hair from him, which he will then keep as an heirloom. Drake does not appreciate such interest in himself, and the podcast is urgently interrupted for advertising due to unforeseen circumstances. After a while, Aaron comes back on air, saying that now they can move on to the next question. Aaron, who found himself badly beaten, says that after beating Wigan, they drew with Peterborough, asking Drake for a comment on the match. Drake calmly says that because they needed all the strength of their players against Wigan, they decided to opt for a quiet, safe game to build up strength for their next opponents, Ipswich. Drake adds that thanks to the point they get for the win, they only need to win their remaining two matches once to avoid being relegated from the league. Aaron says he would expect nothing less from a man like Drake, adding that he inspires confidence in him before asking him to pass on a message to the loyal Bolton Wadners fans. Drake reflects on the latest question from a young boy who wondered if Drake would lead the team to the EFL Challenger League. He reflects that everything is going as well as possible and all he has to do is choose a successor and leave. Drake moves to the microphone and addresses the fans, saying that he, as a devoted member of the Wanderers Club, will do his best to keep Bolton afloat forever. After that, he grabs the microphone and says that next season they will try to get into the EFL Challenger League. After some time, the scene shifts again to the Bolton Wanderers training ground. Nathan says that after the warm-up, they will begin endurance training, but suddenly he is distracted by a strange sight. He notices Drake helping Owen with his stretches, instructing him on the best angle to hold his leg. Drake sincerely and politely tells Owen that he is a very valuable player for their team, adding that when he strengthens his thigh muscles, he can become an even stronger player. He tells Owen that he will help him, 
suggesting that they work together to improve their skills. Nathan mentally notes that he never thought Drake would be capable of such speeches, adding that he has matured a lot. He turns back and remembers that today reporters will come to shoot a documentary. Suddenly, Nathan realizes the real reason why Drake is so respectful towards his players. He looks at Drake, who is scanning the reporter's eyes for a chance to get a good shot. Suddenly, he hears the photographer speaking and turns his head in his direction. He notices a journalist who, in broken Korean, asks Park Chung for one photo, to which he replies that he can speak English. After analyzing the fact that Park Chung is a universally recognized handsome man, Drake realizes that he has a great chance to appear on camera. Without thinking twice, he approaches Park Chung and puts his hand on his shoulder in a friendly manner. He asks Park Chung how his training is going, adding that in addition to training hard, it is also important for him to rest. He turns on the caring mother mode and with a stingy tear in his eyes, says that Park Chung's injury is still a traumatic memory for him that he would never like to experience again. The photographer says that Drake and Park Chung look great with each other and begins to photograph them. To which Drake says in an unnatural voice that he did not notice that there are journalists here, adding that Park Chung is like a brother to him. Nathan says that Drake is acting so sick again to promote his club, adding that he is quite a calculating jerk. Meanwhile, a newbie journalist from Horwich called Kevin Potters speculates that Drake is putting on a rather cheap show here. He looks at Drake's photo and mentally says that after he became the head of the team, even Bolton, who had previously been languishing in the relegation zone, began to bring good results, and that is why public opinion about him became extremely positive. He adds that he himself cannot recognize Drake as a true wanderers, since he is some kind of pathetic native of the low league. Potters expresses confidence that Drake bribed the judges, or will get points through other dirty means. He notices that all the photos look somehow unnatural, quickly coming to the conclusion that this is not all that important, since they were very conveniently asked to make a documentary about Bolton, adding that he will find out everything under the pretext of filming, after which he will reveal the dirty truth about Drake. He plunges into victorious thoughts, thinking that once he brings it to light, it could become a sensation that will make him famous, however. Drake, who came up behind him and looked at the photographs, interrupts his thoughts, saying that in some of the photographs, he turned out quite fat. Kevin Potters screams in horror, and Drake, frightened by this reaction, asks him why the hell he is screaming so loudly. Potters quickly puts the camera under his coat and begins to mumble something incomprehensible. He suddenly runs away, saying that he has to go to the toilet, to which Drake says that he should take a photo of him to make him look slimmer. The fleeing Potter reflects that he knew that Drake was a suspicious person, adding that he would show him later. Drake looks after Potters with disappointment, saying that nothing can be done about it, understanding his stomach problems. The 45th round of the league begins shortly after, with Bolton Wanderers taking on Blackpool at the Blackpool Road of Blowford. Blackpool recently put in an unprecedented performance by winning six games, which immediately lifted them up the rankings from 14th to 7th. The secret to Blackpool's victory is that their coach, Eric Lai, has a special way of using his players. Nathan looks at the football field and is surprised that Blackpool have changed their strategy again. He says that until recently they focused on counter-attacks, but now they are building their game so that they can start using tiki-taka tactics at any time. The commentator says that Dignity gets in Sims's way and tries to take the ball away from him. However, Sims anticipates this outcome and passes the ball back to his teammate Kobez. Kobez in turn passes a long pass from himself directly to his teammate. Blackpool striker Natal takes the ball using his right foot. He runs to the goal and delivers a confident shot, but to the pity of the football commentator and Blackpool fans, the ball flies over the goal. Nathan reflects on the terrifying aggressive tactics they are faced with that take his breath away. He pats Drake's shoulder, confidently thinking that Drake will definitely be able to counter this with something, and asks him how they will respond to this. However, Drake suddenly replies that he's very scared, since Blackpool's strategy is simply incredible. Nathan falls into a stupor, admitting to himself that he never could have imagined that Drake would tremble in fear. Suddenly, he pulls himself together, thinking that he must come to his senses, adding that he should not be so spineless and in such a situation, he must cheer up his brother. He begins to say something, but is interrupted by a commentator, who joyfully reports that Blackpool have scored a goal against Blotten, adding that in the first 25 minutes, Joe Natal managed to score the ball into the opponent's goal. Nathan listens to the commentator who says that Bolton, who outperformed their opponents in terms of percentage of ball possession, still lost to Blackpool. Nathan's colleague asks him where he is going, to which he calmly replies that he is going to prepare for the next match. Drake reflects that he understands Nathan's feelings perfectly well, 
because this has never happened to them before today. Drake realizes that any Bolton attack in this match is blocked, as if the Blackpool players are calculating their actions several steps ahead. Drake also notes that, moreover, Eric Lai's tactics, although chaotic, are devoid of obvious shortcomings, adding that it is impossible to quickly respond to a strategy that is constantly changing. Drake says he feels as if he is standing in front of a stone wall that cannot be broken in any way. Drake also understands that he is experiencing an extremely unpleasant feeling. He watches Blackpool play and tries to understand where this strange feeling comes from and what is its root cause. Suddenly, a guess comes to the main character's head, which greatly surprises him. He remembers his past, realizing that this tactic was once described by himself on the website of a football management application. Drake begins to smile sincerely, realizing that now he has a chance to cope with this strategy. He addresses Victor from the bench and asks him to bring Nathan here. Drake says that he should quickly run after him and bring him back, since they don't need to prepare for the next match, because they will definitely win today's match. The commentator announces the end of the first half, adding that the first half of the match ends with Blackpool ahead with a score of 1-0. Eric Lai's assistants fawn over him, saying that they expected nothing less from such a tactical and strategic genius, adding that they expect the same from them in the second half of this match. Eric says that they shouldn't praise him so much, because all this happened because the players and other coaches believed in him and his strategies. However, he mentally notes that now he is finally a recognized genius. He takes out his phone and notes that no players or coaches played any role, since they were only able to get ahead thanks to the world management application. He recalls that when my nephew showed me this application, he thought that this was a place where only amateurs sat. However, this application was different in that it contained an anonymous person who uploaded his unusual strategies. This player's name was Mad, and as soon as Eric Lai saw his strategies, he immediately realized that they would work well in real matches. In the future, trusting his instincts and adopting these tactics, the Blackpool team snatched six wins and rose all the way to seventh position in the league, and as a result, he became a great coach. Eric realizes they now only have a couple of games left to play, and if they win bottom, they will go through to the playoffs, and if things continue like this, he will become a star coach in the EFL. He understands that they will definitely beat the Boltonians, who are barely crawling across the field, using the strategies of the mad user. However, suddenly his victorious thoughts are interrupted by the joyful cry of the commentator, who reports that Bolton Wanderers is scoring a goal against the enemy. The commentator says that in just the first five minutes of the second half, Aidan Roof suddenly scored a beautiful goal. The commentator says that Bolton have leveled the score and now the game is in their hands, while Eric wonders in surprise how the invincible Mad's tactics could have failed. He turns towards Drake to see what kind of man is standing in front of him. Looking up, he sees Drake looking at him disdainfully, saying that he is trash that there is no point in looking at anymore. Nathan says that he believed in Drake, adding that he was confident that Drake could bring them victory. Afterwards, Nathan, tied up and wearing a sign apologizing for doubting Drake, asks to untie him, adding that he has been good from the start. Drake says that Nathan still hasn't come to his senses and orders Victor to tie a rag over his mouth. However, after some time, Drake forgives Nathan and ties him up, after which he asks him how he was able to win. Drake says that Eric used strategies that he uploaded to the internet while he was a user named Mad, adding that all of his strategies were authored by Drake, who of course knows how to get around them. He adds that all the strategies he downloaded were not at the EFL1 level of the third division, but tactics for EPL teams of the first division. From Drake's point of view, if Eric wanted to use these strategies, then he had to remake them according to the abilities of his players. Because if a titmouse follows a stork, it will simply break its wings. Eric reflects that he has no reason to doubt, since he apparently made a mistake somewhere. And that is why the mad strategy did not work. He rereads the strategy again, hoping to find a detail he missed. He approaches his assistant in fascination, informing him that they should try the Gigan pressing strategy, to which he fearfully replies that all his commands will be carried out. From Eric's point of view, if it works, they can take the game back into their own hands and save the day. Eric adds that incredible mad strategies cannot fail, so they must stick to them more carefully. The commentator states that Owen Precise receives the ball, but Blackpool begin to attack aggressively, adding that four players have surrounded Owen and are starting to press. He adds that Owen tries to pass, but he fails and ends up losing the ball. Eric happily looks at what is happening, saying that everything is finally starting to work out for them again. Eric adds that now it is their turn to attack again, and the commentator states that Natal and Sims are rushing towards the enemy goal. However, 
Bolton has something to respond to this attack, and Dominic Sild approaches the attackers from the left side. Natal ponders the fact that he will not be able to pass the pass to Sims while trying to find his comrade Lubala. He tries to look around and freezes in place, stunned. He notices that four Bolton players, led by Aiden Roof, are attacking him at once. The commentator states that Bolton Wanderers respond with attack, adding that Delicate wins the ball back. He irritably asks his team what the hell they are doing, adding that they need to attack quickly to get the ball back. Drake says that Eric was so carried away by stealing other people's strategies that he forgot the basic fundamentals of football. From his point of view, Eric does not take into account the player's abilities at all, continues to change strategies on the fly, and also forced them to use Gigan pressing, which takes a lot of energy. Drake realizes that because of this, the Blackpool players have already reached their limit, after which the commentator says that no one from Blackpool can catch Aiden Roof, who has the perfect chance to shoot on goal. Aiden, using his secret techniques, delivers a powerful blow and scores the ball into the Blackpool team's goal. Eric grabs his head, not believing that they managed to lose so suddenly. He is immersed in thoughts that they could not lose, since they used mad strategies, the outcome of which can only be victory, suggesting that the only reason for the defeat was worthless players. His assistants approach him, asking him what they need to do, and he instantly comes to his senses. He frantically flips through mad tactics, saying that he needs to move on to plan B, which he is prepared for such a case. He shouts to his team to change their tactics and move on to plan B. However, this only leads to the fact that Bolton Wanderers again break through to the goal a few minutes later and score another goal against Blackpool. Eric yells at his team to stay motivated and move on to plan C. However, this plan does not work and Bolton again manages to get to the enemy goal to score another goal. Eric begins to frantically move on to the next plan, but this too does not produce any result. After some time, having gone through almost all possible options for mad strategies, Eric powerlessly sees that the ball is being kicked into the goal again. The commentator states that after a goal from Park Chong, a loud howl is heard over the field. Nathan tells Drake that he is incredible, adding that he was able to outplay himself by playing so aggressively in the second half. Drake says that his orders are not really that different from Coach Lies. For Drake, the key difference is the players, as Bolton Wanderers have the strength to follow his tactics. Drake adds that this is precisely why his team undergoes brutal training, noting that all this is necessary in order to be able to survive to the end. Drake says that although the football field is a place for the battle of strategies between the two coaches, they are not alone on it, as this victory was made possible thanks to those who obediently followed him. Nathan is impressed by this speech and smiles at his brother. He puts his hand on Drake's shoulder, telling him that Drake has learned to say the right things, inviting him to celebrate by buying some meat after this match. After some time, the commentator reports that the 45th round of the league ends with the referee's whistle. The commentator says the match ends seven, one in favor of Bolton Wanderers. Nathan hugs Park Chung and tells Drake that this win has taken them even higher in the rankings. Owen and Floyd thank Drake, saying that all this became possible only thanks to his efforts. Aiden Roof says that Drake's efforts were good, and Dignity, passing by, asks him if he wants to go back to the 8th division, after which he tells Drake that he did a great job. All the players approach Drake, showering him with compliments and enthusiastic words of gratitude for his work. Drake laughs sincerely and says that they shouldn't flatter him so much, because they also put in a lot of effort to win. Suddenly he realizes that his team is coming almost close to him and taking him by the shoulders. He asks them what they are doing, to which they answer that they are going to throw her into the air. Bolton Wanderers bounce their manager in their arms as they celebrate their victory, and Drake reflects on the fact that they have one game left in the league and are only four points clear of the 21 Saint Place team relegated from the league. After some time, Drake comes to his senses, hanging upside down in an unknown place. Looking around, he realizes that he's in his office and wonders how events took such an unexpected turn. An hour earlier, Drake had been drinking in his office with his brother, celebrating a crushing victory over Blackpool. Drake says that this soju tastes incredibly good, to which Nathan offers him a drink for their continued struggle for existence. Nathan says that it's been a long time since they drank quietly like this, to which Drake replies that they ran towards their goal every day without stopping. Nathan says that now that he returns to Korea, his hardships will end and happy times will finally begin. Drake says that this is really the end, adding that they managed to stay in the league, which means Drake will sell the club and go to Korea, as he planned. He says that when he thinks about it, it has been quite a long, but at the same time fast journey, as a lot has happened since he arrived in Bolton, adding that he has met quite a lot of good people. 
Drake humbly reasons that even though he lived in the office, it didn't cause him much inconvenience. Nathan starts pointing his fingers at his brother, saying that the incomparable Drake cries out of affection, adding that this signals that he has changed, to which Drake replies that it is just the effect of alcohol, to which Nathan asks him why he shouldn't have stayed for another season. Drake asks Nathan to stop bothering him, to which Nathan only ironically imitates him. Drake loses his temper and says that there is no way he will do this, adding that he's going to get rid of everything and go back to Korea. Their argument is interrupted by the sound of a cake falling to the ground. Drake doesn't notice this and holds Nathan's t-shirt, saying that alcohol should be drunk beautifully, after which he asks what happened to his facial expression. Realizing that someone is standing behind them, Drake decides to turn around to look at his guest. Emma Charlotte begins to talk in an otherworldly voice about how Drake doesn't like the third division team, asking him how he managed to put up with them all this time, after which she accuses him of being a liar who told her he would promote her next season. Emma continues to say that Drake promised to make Bolton the winners of the FIFA Club World Cup, to which Drake fearfully says that he never promised such a thing. Having expressed everything she thinks about him, she sighs sadly, deciding that there is nothing to do about it. She says it's a joke since it's Drake's life, and she has no right to tell them how to live it, adding that she was so excited and baked a birthday cake for him, like a fool, only to end up feeling like a pathetic idiot. She says she's sorry, but she'll still be okay, while Drake frantically tries to find words to calm her down. However, Emma Charlotte opens the door, saying that she cannot speak for them. She asks Drake to reassure her comrades, adding that if he does not want to reassure some third division workers, then they too will be able to understand this. The department heads look at Drake with an angry look and say that they trusted him for a second, after which they unanimously call him a dirty liar. Richard Gears invites everyone to calm down, saying that Drake is not to blame for anything, to which the main character radiantly says that he is as rational as always. However, Richard immediately says that Drake's mouth is to blame for everything, which needs to be torn out. Drake turns to Nathan, asking him for salvation from these deranged people. However, Nathan is suddenly not in his original place, and Drake casts his desperate gaze into the void. He accepts his fate and mentally calls Nathan a damn bastard. After some time, Drake, already hanging upside down, reflects on how much time he has already spent in this position. A few minutes later, the door to Drake's office opens and he hears soft footsteps. The main character is blinded by the light of a chandelier and he closes his eyes. He sees Emma Charlotte's legs approaching him and hears her say that he looks much better than she thought. She sits down next to him, asking him for a few minutes of his time. Drake looks at her questioningly, and she tells him not to take all this too personally. Emma Charlotte says everyone was upset by the news, adding that if Drake hadn't been loved by the club's staff, none of this would have happened. She adds that no one will keep a person they don't like if he decides to leave. Emma says that after Drake arrived, the atmosphere in the club changed 180 degrees, as the owner of the team, who gave them hope that they could become champions, could not help but like them. She admits that there were many times when she hated him, since every time he did something his way, she was irritated by her domineering nature, unkempt protruding belly and sticky hair, which has tons of wax on it. Emma says that now that he is leaving like this, she feels very sad and adds that she will miss him very much. She admits that she wishes they had a little more time to spend together. Drake, impressed by Emma's speech, looks at her in surprise, realizing that he has to confess something to her. He turns to Emma, saying that there is something he needs to tell her. He says that this is very important, asking her to listen carefully. Drake admits that he is about to vomit, and Emma begins to frantically say that now she will untie him and lower him to the ground. However, Emma isn't fast enough and Drake empties his stomach onto the floor of his office, causing Emma to scream in fear. A few hours pass and the afternoon sun begins to shine over Bolton Stadium. Nathan enters Drake's office and asks him if he can talk to him. Drake asks Nathan what the traitor needed in this office, to which Nathan says that he does not understand all these accusations since he suddenly had urgent business at home yesterday. Drake says that it doesn't matter anymore, asking him if he saw the sports news today regarding the Azazel Derby Club, who recently returned to the EFL Challenger, to which Nathan is surprised that Drake is already aware of this. Nathan says Derby Azazel was sold after being relegated to EFL 1 two seasons ago, but this time the club's value has more than doubled, thanks to a successful return to the EFL Challenger. Nathan wonders about Drake's intentions and asks him if he has changed his mind. Drake turns to Nathan, saying that twice that amount is 100 million pounds, to which Nathan says that Drake is a crazy bastard. Nathan sits down in his chair and with a sigh asks Drake if he has decided to stay another season and move to another league. Drake tells him that if you look at Bolton's achievements since he took over, 
Bolton's promotion to the EFL challenger doesn't seem so absurd. Drake says it's just his wish, adding that Nathan can return to Korea if he wants. Nathan tells Drake that they will definitely do this. Drake looks questioningly at Nathan, and he tells him that they should definitely try to get into the next league. He happily asks Drake what he will do without such a brilliant coach like him, adding that he will happily work with him next season. Nathan says that they won the last game, which means the team atmosphere is pretty good, adding that staying for another season isn't such a bad idea. He stands up and tells Drake to be more honest with himself and not talk nonsense about 100 million pounds. With these words, he leaves the office, saying that it is time for him to go to work. Drake mimics Nathan, distorting the last words he said to him. He takes out his tablet and wonders why Nathan is suddenly acting like his mom. He adds that 100 million pounds won't come from just digging in the ground, so they have a huge amount of work ahead of them. After this, he decides to check Bolton's social networks and account. He sees that the official account has posted a photo from the so-called corporate party, in which Drake participated as decoration, and says that these people cannot be stopped. He protests why they took a photo of him without permission, then says that because his hand slipped, he put the photo on his wallpaper. He opens a bottle of tonic and says it's time to get to work. The protagonist concludes that his next goal will be to raise the value of his club to 100 million pounds. However, after a while, Drake sits down on the sofa after intensive work on documents. He desperately tells himself that he should have stopped showing off and sold this damn club right away. The season is over and English football has come. For some a long and for others a short break, but not everyone was able to rest and relax. Drake reflects on the fact that, under the influence of the atmosphere, he made such a serious decision, missing the most important thing. According to Drake, the biggest problem remained that Bolton remained an incredibly poor club. He angrily recalls that the Vegas club, which failed to advance in the league due to losing to him, received sponsorship worth one billion won, and the idiot Percival Gardner even received a salary increase after renewing his contract while he was the owner of the club, couldn't even raise his own salary. Drake says he's been thinking so hard about the club's future that his head is spinning, so the reward is an hour of watching a YouTube video. After five hours of watching nonsense, Drake indignantly says that these days guinea pigs have better goal-scoring abilities than Park Chung. After spending some more time watching the video, he stumbles upon a football blogger's channel and watches it with interest. Drake wonders if this blogger is getting anything from these videos, deciding to look into his channel in more detail. He opens a special website and enters the name of this user there, noting that he has 400,000 subscribers. Seeing the monthly profit numbers, Drake drops his tablet to the floor in shock. The next day, Nathan unsuspectingly enters the football club building. Nathan reflects on the fact that he saw Drake again in a new light and notes that he never believed that the day would come when a man who lived only for money would suddenly think not only about himself, but also about the other employees of the club. He begins to think that Drake has matured a little and immediately stumbles upon his brother, who is filming his football blog, dressed up like some kind of weirdo from a mental hospital. He says that this is a channel that will introduce everyone to the Bolton Club in detail, asking everyone to subscribe to it and like it at least once. Nathan decides not to say anything and simply walks away, while Drake thanks Killer Tank One Maiden for his 15,001 donation. That night, Nathan, in a fit of anger, booked a ticket to Korea but after much deliberation, he decided to stay in England. Meanwhile, Drake is broadcasting from his office, giving a tour of his workspace, while Emma Charlotte walks in, saying they need to talk. Emma tells Drake that she was given information that Drake has been lounging around with a camera all day today, to which Drake says that he is just doing a live stream on YouTube to promote the Bolton Club. Emma immediately turns red with embarrassment and anger, asking Drake what he means by that, to which he replies that, in truth, this broadcast is happening right now. Emma angrily says that she believed that Drake had changed, but he still remained as selfish, to which Drake tearfully asks her for mercy, to which Emma Charlotte demands that he quickly turn off the broadcast and give her the phone. After some time, Drake takes part in a meeting between the heads of the club's departments, flashing his bump. Emma Charlotte says he was promoting Bolton through the broadcast, adding that Drake said it was to attract sponsors, then asks if interacting with fans was a bonus. Drake calmly tells Emma that everything was exactly as she said. Emma says that she understands his intentions perfectly, adding that if he acts like this without consulting them, it will only complicate their lives. Daniel tells Drake that they conferred and decided that Drake should broadcast in a calmer tone, and until he corrects this, he should refrain from live broadcasting. All the conference participants say that these broadcasts may be too burdensome and dangerous for their image, 
to which Drake says that if everyone is against it, then he will have to cancel this decision. Finally showing Velma his tablet, she asks him what is shown there, to which he replies that these are donations that he earned yesterday from the live broadcast. Velma sees the amount that was transferred to Drake and gapes in surprise, to which Drake says that his subscribers are very generous, adding that he seems to have a talent for broadcasting. He sarcastically notes that if he changes the concept, it will not be so interesting and he will have to say goodbye to donations. Drake says that if the profits from the YouTube channel were consistent, they would be able to give bonuses to their hardworking executives. Managers are very impressed by information about a possible salary increase and they change their minds 180 degrees. Daniel says that to be honest, he is in favor of broadcasting since the image of the new YouTuber Drake is simply crazy. Velma fearfully asks how their handsome owner Drake got such a big bump, to which Drake remarks that they were all taking pictures of it a few minutes ago, surprised at how big it is. Everyone begins to fawn over Drake, saying that they were on his side from the very beginning. Emma looks in surprise at Drake, who asks her what they should do in such a situation. He adds that apparently the concept of broadcasts will still remain the same. The other executives tell Emma that she is a bit conservative, adding that she could broadcast a little more frivolously, and then saying that the owner even sacrificed his authority for the future of their club. Emma angrily invites everyone to listen to her, but Richard Gears intervenes in the conversation, having first asked her forgiveness. He says that he has nothing against this way of raising the morale of the employees, but there is another reason why they are here today, to which Drake says that Richard is right, and it is time to move on to the main topic of today's meeting. Richard says it's time to talk about the upcoming new season and promotion to another league. Velma, Emma and Daniel listen to Richard in shock, not believing that they swung so high. Emma says it's natural for the club to fight for this, but setting goals beyond its realistic capabilities will have a negative impact on the team's morale, adding that other players will definitely be needed to resolve the issue. Velma says that Emma Charlotte is right, since the club's finances are not enough to recruit players suitable for their purpose adding that Drake also promised them bonuses, to which the main character politely remarks that because Velma continues to talk behind his back, his head begins to hurt, after which he invites her to return to her place. Richard says they really need to take into account the team's thin squad as they use tactics that require a heavy workload, adding that with this approach, the team can start to struggle in the second half of the match. Richard asks Drake what he thinks about focusing on stabilizing the roster this season with the goal of reaching the mid-tier rankings and aiming for another league next season, to which Drake replies that their opinions are valid. Drake says their dire financial situation is a serious problem, that income from the YouTube channel is unlikely to correct. However, according to Drake, he set this goal for the upcoming season for a reason. He says that they need something else that can be the key to their advancement. After some time, the scene shifts to Manchester Blue Moon's home stadium and its office site. The head of a sports team management team named Francis Carson's phone rings, and he picks it up saying he's listening attentively. He hears that his interlocutor wants to know about the loan of players and asks him what club he is from, after which he is surprised that his interlocutor is a representative of the Bolton Club, which, in his opinion, barely managed to stay in the third league. Meanwhile, Drake, on the other end of the line, politely communicates with Francis, after which he says goodbye, and Nathan, standing next to him, asks him about the results of the business negotiations. Drake says Francis told him he would kill him if he tried to prank him again. Nathan finds out who Drake called and chastises him, asking him why he decided that such a club would loan out players to third division weaklings like them, adding that Drake was playing it cool again, saying something about the key to victory, although his plan once again turned out to be nothing. Drake tells Nathan not to jump to conclusions, noting that what happened a moment ago is a small teaser announcing them, adding that this is all just part of his plan, so there is no problem with it. Nathan roughly guesses what kind of plan Drake might have and asks him if he is ready to go that far. Drake says that Nathan got it right, explaining that if they can loan players from Blue Moon, they can solve both the financial difficulties and the player shortage problem at the same time. Drake states that in order to do this, they must prove that it is also beneficial for Manchester Blue Moon, which is why the plan is important. Having finished his story, Drake asks Nathan what happened to the new face he last saw to which he replies that things are going smoothly, thanks to the fact that he handed over full power. Drake gloatingly replies that this is great news, and Nathan reflects that his brother has become even more devious since coming here than he ever was in Korea. The next day, a colleague suddenly approaches that same Francis, saying that he has urgent news, 
He asks him what happened, to which he reminds him that yesterday the so-called representative of Bolton called him, after which he adds that now the sports director of this team is on the radio and is behaving terribly inappropriately. A colleague turns on the radio louder, and Francis hears Drake's voice, who says that Blue Moon is the unconditional master of Manchester. Francis, hearing Drake's voice, notes that this is the same voice as yesterday's interlocutor. Drake asks his interlocutor whether it is worth thinking about questions of this kind at all. Aaron Bench tells Drake that there are still new Hellion in Manchester, who have held a dominant position for a long time, to which Drake objects that this is already an old story, since everyone knows that Blue Moon has long smoothed out her wrinkles left by Man U. Drake also adds that the Manchester Derby is also a thing of the past, adding that Manny is no longer the same. Drake says that looking at recent matches, comparing these teams would be disrespectful to Blue Moon, to which Francis says that Asians are good at games because they have three lives, after which his colleague replies that he seems to have heard something already similar. Aaron tells Drake that he doesn't have to hide anything and admit that he continues to praise Blue Moon in an attempt to achieve something, to which Drake replies that Aaron is very smart. Drake states directly and honestly that he would like to collaborate with the Blue Moon Club. Aaron is surprised by Drake's words, and he replies that he would like to coexist with them and support them through mutual cooperation. Aaron asks Drake how Bolton can support Blue Moon if they barely manage to stay in EFL 1, to which Drake, chuckling sarcastically, replies that this is no secret to him, since they are the so-called weak middle or lower team ranking in the third division. Drake says that despite this, they are still able to support them, after which Aaron asks Drake what he means. Drake says there are currently 15 teams in EFL 1 alone who are objectively rated as stronger teams than Bolton, so they still have a long way to go, meaning there is plenty of opportunity to compete in real life against his own team's rivals, adding that since Bolton have a small core squad, selection will be easy to compete for. Drake says even players who don't have the physical attributes of an adult, or players who grew up at home but failed repeatedly in the arena, will be a good fit as it can take them to at least EFL challenger competitive levels and beyond. Francis says that in another time he would have thought Drake was a crazy athletic director of some third-rate team who was overstepping his bounds. The fact that Bolton had achieved such success under his leadership in less than half a season was not something Francis could ignore. He asks his colleague if the director of the club is familiar with this situation, to which he replies that he has probably already been notified about this because of the hype created. They both wonder what the director's reaction will be while he listens to Drake's performance while sitting in his office. Aaron tells Drake that he would like to ask him a question about why he chose Blue Moon. Aaron says that Manu's players are probably as good as Blue Moon's, even though Drake has already listed them as enemies, and asks him if he really thinks Blue Moon are the masters of Manchester. Drake says that this is not the case at all, adding that a few days ago he challenged Manu to a friendly match in order to learn something, but they continued to refuse him and that is why he harboured such thoughts. He gloatingly suggests that Manny must simply have chickened out since they failed last season, and it seems they don't really want to lose to a third division team, which means they and Bolton are at about the same level. Aaron can't find the strength to say anything, and so he just freezes in place, looking at Drake dumbfounded. The employees of the Blue Moon Club react in exactly the same way, not expecting such bold words. Nathan, stuck to the glass, looks at Drake just as dumbfounded. Drake and Aaron look at him in confusion while he quietly says that Drake is a crazy idiot. After the podcast ends, Nathan takes Drake to the club and asks him if he was crazy for coming up with such a strange plan. He says that he will soon die with him, adding that Drake promised him not to go that far, to which Drake just chuckles insidiously. Nathan grabs Drake by the shirt and calls him an idiot, adding that they are now the targets of all the hooligan Manu fans, to which Drake loudly interrupts him, ordering him to watch the road. Nathan is surprised that Drake is not worried at all, adding that he himself knows how radical the fans of Manu's club, nicknamed the Devils, can be. Drake says that he knows that to succeed, they will have to sell their lives to the Devil, adding that in order to attract Blue Moon, they will have to attack their old enemy, which is Manu. He states that among other things, if they show a good game in this friendly match with Manu, then the possibility of partnering with Blue Moon will increase, to which Nathan reminds Drake that Manu abandoned him. Drake says it was a ploy that worked brilliantly, then shows him the phone, adding that after the radio broadcast ended, they immediately accepted his offer for a friendly match. Nathan, filled with enthusiasm, asks Drake to show him the message, to which he fearfully says that he will show him everything he needs. But after they arrive where they need to go, 
Drake reflects that all the necessary conditions for the plan have been met, adding that they clearly impressed Blue Moon and even managed to knock out a friendly match with Man Yu. Drake understands that they only have to prove everything in a friendly match. However, further, from Drake's point of view, everything will depend only on the decision of sports director Blue Moon. Meanwhile, Francis receives a call from the director saying that he also heard the interview. He talks with the director, receiving valuable instructions from him, after which he says that he understood everything. He replies that in this case, he will take every action to contact Drake as quickly as possible to set up a meeting with him. Drake, meanwhile, falls asleep and is awakened by Nathan's voice, ordering him not to sleep in the passenger seat. After some time, Emma Charlotte enters Drake's office, asking for forgiveness in advance for distracting him from his business with her visit. She says that she has important news regarding a meeting with the sports director of the Blue Moon Football Club. Seeing what Drake and Nathan are doing in his office, she freezes in place and there is deathly silence in the office for a minute. Emma Charlotte, with incredible difficulty trying to comprehend what is happening, squeezes out a laugh full of reproach and anger. A few minutes later, after listening to the explanations of Nathan and Drake, she asks the protagonist in surprise whether he was really threatened by the Manu Devils. Nathan says that if Drake shows off his face now, he will actually be stabbed, so such drastic measures are necessary, to which Emma Charlotte asks worriedly how bad things have become that they have gone this far. Nathan tells Emma that from the home stadium, the training ground, the radio station, to the restaurant they frequent, there are groups of people waiting for him who seem to be very angry after the radio broadcast. Drake says that as expected, in order to succeed, he must sell his soul to the devil, adding that he even managed to arrange a meeting with the athletic director Blue Moon according to his plan, to which Nathan says that Drake is an idiot, adding that there is no point in all this if he is killed with a stone, a knife or a gun. Emma listens to the two brothers bicker about how Drake's methods justify the means and sighs heavily. He seriously wonders whether this friendly match can end safely. Meanwhile, the head coach of Manchester New Hellion, named Marco Panther, comes to the club director and asks for a few minutes of his attention. The director says that he heard that Marco has business with him, to which he replies that he came precisely about this. Marco says that he wanted to talk to him about a friendly match with Bolto's team, which confuses the sports director, Elik Nainha. He asks Marco what could be so unusual about this match, to which he replies that joint training and tactical reorganization are necessary to prepare for it. Elik freezes for a second, trying to suppress the onslaught of anger. He asks Marco if he has heard the very program that put the whole of Manchester on its ears, to which he replies that it seems everyone has already heard about it. Elik says Drake acted like a child complaining about being rejected, adding that his motives were so obvious that he even laughed. According to Elik, Drake is creating cheap provocations, being hostile towards them and trying to somehow attract the attention of the public and Blue Moon, which makes him look like a parasite that cannot survive on its own. He squeezes the pen tightly, saying that he agreed to arrange a friendly match, not because he fell for this cheap trick. Marco asks Elik what he means, to which he replies that he is simply trying to get rid of the parasites that have attached themselves to his football club. With these words, Elik stands up from his chair, resting his hands on his desk. He says that he has something to say to Marco's proposal for joint training and reorganization. Elik ominously tells Marco that they will not need any preparation to destroy the pathetic cockroaches, adding that Marco should simply crush them with his bare hands. Elik says that in any case, all Bolton want is to make money by playing against a strong League One team. He adds that Marco will be better prepared for next season. In Elik's opinion, a useless match like this wouldn't be worth even a second of his attention. Marco takes a short breath and leaves the office telling Elik that he perfectly understood his intentions. Having closed the door, Marco thoughtfully pronounces Elik's last words under his breath. He reflects that he understands perfectly well what the director wanted to say, but as the head coach of Manu, he has his own view on this situation. He notes that the game shown by the Bolton Wanderers team last season was definitely not at the level of parasites. Some time later, Drake arrives for a meeting with director Blue Moon and sits in a chair drinking tea. He puts it on the table admitting to himself that he is terribly nervous, despite the fact that this is a common thing for him. He mentally notes that it was truly unexpected that director Fev was the first to suggest meeting with himself. Drake admits he admires Fev Guadalajara as he is the Blue Moon leader who achieved a golden hat-trick last season. Drake says that he now understands perfectly well how girls feel before meeting their favorite artist. He also notes that his worried mind ordered him to bring a piece of paper and a pen with him to get an autograph from Fev Guadalajara. Drake slaps himself on the cheeks, telling himself that he did not come here to have fun, 
since the future of Bolton largely depends on this meeting. He concentrates on his emotions, ordering himself not to lose, since he himself is not only a sports director, but also the owner of the club. He gathers his strength and puts on a serious face, telling himself that he must show his worth as the owner of a promising club. Feb Guadalajara approaches Drake, calmly asking his forgiveness for keeping him waiting. He asks Drake if he is the sporting director of the Bolton Club, adding that he has heard a lot about him and was very impressed by his tenacity. He adds that his strength is so impressive that it seems even a little dangerous. Drake instantly loses his cool and slavishly greets Feb. Feb Guadalajara sits down in his chair, and Drake ponders what would be a more appropriate reaction. He notes that he somehow met a star whom he had admired for a long time. He mentally adds that Fev was the first to say that he wanted to meet with him. Depending on their character, everyone may have a different reaction. But among all the options, there is one that is most likely. Most likely, a person who finds himself in such a situation will smile with a stunned expression on his face. Drake, after a long pause, tells Fev that he looks much better with such a hairstyle and beard, to which he responds with gratitude with some bewilderment. He drinks tea, musing that Drake is acting like a complete jerk, noting that his behavior is completely different from his behavior on radio. He is surprised that Drake continues to ask him idiotic and useless questions, and assumes that this is his way of testing him. He decides to give impetus to these strange negotiations, and says that Drake has come a very long and difficult way to meet him, after which he asks him if he has any questions for him. Drake, not really understanding this hint, asks Fev Guadalajara how he manages to remain as handsome, increasingly irritating director Blue Moon. He notes irritably that he took the time to arrange a meeting with Drake, and he only came here to talk some nonsense. He stands up from his chair, mentally telling himself that he was disappointed to see that Drake was just another parasite trying to attach himself to a strong team, and then turns to Drake, thanking him for meeting him today. He muses that talking to Drake is a waste of time, saying out loud that he doesn't think the collaboration he proposed with Bolton is worth discussing. Like a bolt from the blue, these words have the effect of an icy shower, and Drake instantly comes to his senses. He tries to say something to Fev, to which he quickly replies that he was very glad to meet you. Drake tries to understand what he just did, frozen in place in incredible shock. Drake realizes that he just acted like a complete idiot in front of the athletic director who is his idol even without considering the fact that the collaboration hasn't even been confirmed yet. Drake realizes that he has again acted hastily and made a grave mistake, as if nothing has changed since he was in Korea. He bows, hitting his forehead on the tea table, and Fev fearfully asks him what he is doing. Drake briefly tells him that he will definitely win, to which Fev looks at him questioningly. Drake asks Fev to reconsider his decision to cooperate with Bolton Wanderers if Bolton wins the friendly match against Manu. The meeting ends and Drake sits alone, lost in his thoughts about the recent past. He remembers telling Fev just a few minutes ago that he would definitely win the friendly between Manu and Bolton Wanderers. Fev replied to Drake that he accepted it, but would be forced to change the terms a little, to which Drake asked him in surprise what he meant. Fev says a Manu win is not necessary, adding that even if Drake is the most competent sporting director in the world, with the current Bolton squad, it is almost impossible. He adds that instead he has another, equally important condition. Phoebe says that Drake needs to put a stain on Manu's reputation, adding that this is a condition for cooperation. He ends his speech by saying that this should show him that Bolton Wanderers is a good choice. After some time, the scene moves to the Bolton Wanderers training ground. Owen passes the ball to Park Chung, sending the ball home with a cross. Nathan watches the football team practice, completely lost in his own thoughts. He wonders what Drake might have said at the meeting, noting that he never told him anything. He looks at Drake, remembering that since his return, the intensity of his training has increased significantly. He looks at the piece of paper on which the upcoming tactics are written and is surprised at what he sees. He looks at Drake and wonders if Drake really decided to die at the hands of the devils. Victor, completely exhausted from training, falls to the ground and loudly says that he can't stand it anymore and won't do anything. He declares that this training is truly hellish, adding that this has been going on for several days, even though they only have a pre-season friendly match. Dignity turns to Quick Floyd, who groans and says that you can die like this. Dignity looks at Park Chung, who is also sweating, trying to catch his breath. Dignity notes that based on how his team is feeling, they are at the limit. He reflects that it is actually quite hard, noting that he does not understand why such rigorous training is needed before a friendly match. Drake orders his team to get ready, adding that he is also running around the field with them, after which he says that no one should dare to get tired because of such trifles. With these words, he takes the pose necessary for the next training 
and asks the others if it has become clearer to them. His team notices that Drake is shaking like an autumn leaf from fatigue, but he still gets to his feet. Drake says that he himself knows what his team is thinking, saying that they are probably wondering why they need such rigorous training before a friendly match and are not motivated by it. He adds that all this grueling training is for their sake, even if they don't understand it right now. Drake says that he can guarantee one thing for sure, adding that if they trust and follow him, their price will definitely increase. With these words, he takes off and tells everyone that they need to run five more laps. Dignity looks after Drake, thinking that he is a truly unique person. Suddenly, he sees Aiden running next to him, who says that he will no longer fall for Drake's damn tricks. He asks Aiden if everything is okay with him, to which he points to Drake and says that even if this pig can train for so long, then he himself is quite capable of coping with it. Quick Floyd follows Aiden's example and gives chase. A few seconds later, he is joined by Puck, who cheerfully points out that Aiden did indeed call Drake a pig. Dignity also decides to follow his comrades, rushing after them. He turns back briefly, asking Victor why the hell he lay down. Thus, Drake raised the morale of his team, and they endured a hellish training session of unprecedented intensity. There were two weeks left until the friendly match and Bolton Wanderers were holding one training session after another. With the continuous honing of my skills, time flew by much faster than usual. After a while, the long-awaited day of the match between Bolton and Manchester New Hellion, taking place at Bolton's home stadium, arrives. Drake comes into his team's locker room before kickoff to give them a pep talk. The whole team looks at him carefully, sitting on the benches. He says that he will not prevaricate or lie and asks his team how many people outside they think are pinning their hopes on them. He says that their opponent will be Manchester New Hellion and the third league team will look like a bug crawling across the field. Drake asks his team why they put all this effort into it and then asks if his guys are confident that they can defeat New Hellion. He adds that this is all complete nonsense and they do not need any victory. He says all they're interested in is dragging the proud face of New Hellion through the mud to make their mark on the top teams in the EPL. He asks his team if they are willing to raise their price, to which they loudly shout yes. Drake confidently says that it's time for them to move forward and show everyone how strong the guys are who have nothing to lose. The commentator states that he is starting a match in which Manchester New Hellion will face Bolton Wanderers, adding that this match promises to be extremely exciting. The commentator reports that Man U's squad is close to the second squad and includes mainly reserve players, adding that Man U probably wanted to say with their decision that pride does not allow them to bring their main squad against Bolton Wanderers. His colleague says that even despite this, Bolton will have a difficult game today, to which he replies that since the second team of Man U is comparable in strength to the level of the second league, then for Bolton from the third league, it will be an extremely difficult battle. He adds that getting this match was also difficult, after which he expresses the hope that Bolton will show his best side. Among the fans is the owner of the club Blue Moon Feb Guadalajara, who is closely watching Drake. He expresses the hope that the look with which he gave him the promise of victory was real. Drake, meanwhile, is unaware that his idol is watching him and listens carefully to Nathan. Nathan asks him to quietly look at Manu's bench to see something important there. Drake glances at the players sitting on the bench and is surprised to note that these are first-team players he has only seen on TV. He admits to himself that he has heard that the level of each of them is equivalent to the whole Bolton club, adding that seeing them live, he feels a slight jitter. The main character argues that Nyunga, it seems, really didn't want to let them out since today there are only two players from the main squad on the field. But thanks to this, they can breathe more calmly. Drake and Nathan exchange angry glances with their opponents, scrutinizing each other. Elick argues that Drake is just a little brat, capable only of idle chatter. The referee's whistle blows on the football field and the match finally begins. The ball is almost immediately passed to Owen and he makes a confident kick, sending it to his allies. The commentator happily reports that from the very beginning, Bolton immediately makes a long pass forward. The ball falls right in front of Park Chung and he happily announces that he will gladly accept it. However, something goes wrong and the commentator reports that Pak could not cope with the first touch. The commentator also says that at the same moment, Collie Sober from Manu quickly intercepts the ball and goes on the attack. Without allowing any of the Bolton team members to get close to him, he makes a quick and confident kick to the ball. The commentator reports that Manu also makes a long pass to Anderson who saw this and moved into position. Isaac Anderson takes the cross safely and continues to drive the ball forward towards the Bolton Wanderers goal. However, Dominic Sild quickly blocks his path and Dignity and Perez begin to approach him from behind. Sild looks at Isaac insidiously and asks him where he's going to run now. 
Isaac stands at a loss for some time, after which he smiles, letting everyone know that he's not at all embarrassed by the current situation. He starts running forward again, carrying the ball next to him. Realizing that he has only one way out, Isaac Anderson delivers a powerful long-range strike. Unfortunately, however, the ball, which gained such good speed, hits the goalpost straight. The commentator states that it was an extremely threatening mid-range shot from the second-string ace playing as a central midfielder. Ellick says Bolton Wanderers don't even hold a candle to his second-team squad and only cause laughter with their performances. He notes that Park performs worst of all, whose skills in reality turned out to be worse than ever. Ellick says Park couldn't handle his first touch and his goal-scoring ability is also low. From his point of view, the speed of the pack is really good, but everything else sags. He is surprised that a team with such a player as an ace dares to provoke him with such cheap tricks. After which he looks at Drake and admits to himself that the more he looks at him, the angrier he gets. Meanwhile, the ball goes back to Manu's side, and Jalal Amar dribbles the ball across the halfway line, going deep into the field. Delicate rushes to intercept him, and tries to interrupt the development of Manu's attack. Amar looks around, trying to find a way out of the current difficult situation. He notices Isaac Anderson who is next to him and passes to him, kicking the ball quickly and confidently. The passage to the Bolton Wanderers goal is open, and Anderson realizes that he will have to try again to kick the ball into the goal. Taking proper aim, he delivers a powerful blow to the ball, sending it flying quickly. The ball begins to fly along a difficult trajectory, and the goalkeeper has difficulty reacting to this blow. Isaac Anderson begins to rejoice that the ball will definitely end up in the goal, but his joy does not last very long. Dominic Silda manages to reach the goal and makes an incredibly high-quality save, hitting the ball with his head. After that, he falls to the ground, and the commentator says that it was a very gambling game that saved the team from the risk of missing another goal. Isaac Anderson wonders what the hell his opponents are doing, noting that they are trying so hard in a friendly match, knowing that they are no match for them. Meanwhile, Dominique Silda rises to her feet, glancing at Isaac. Looking indifferently at Isaac and grinning, he shakes off the dirt from his uniform and pretends that what happened is a pure trifle for him. Isaac Isaac stares at Dominic, mentally admitting that he is beginning to annoy him. Marco indifferently says that for some reason they still can't score, to which Elick says that if they continue to break through in this spirit, they will definitely succeed. A second later, one of Manu's players, Ryan Benedict, throws a long pass across the entire football field. The commentator reports that Manu made a pass to the first line and Dominic Silda again starts chasing the ball, saying that he will intercept it. However, suddenly Isaac Anderson rushes in at the speed of light, accelerating faster and faster. He manages to get to the ball first and swings to deliver a crushing blow. He hits the ball, concentrating all his strength and all the hatred that has accumulated towards Dominic and the Bolton team on this blow. The shot turns out to be extremely successful and the ball flies into the Bolton Wanderers' goal, stretching the net from its crazy speed. Drake looks on in surprise while Illich cheerfully encourages his team, telling them not to slow down. The commentator happily reports the goal, adding that 30 minutes of the first half have passed, and Manny, who continued to attack the Bolton goal, takes the lead. Isaac Isaac smugly reflects that if they play seriously, then Bolton is no match for them, and then wonders how they dare to organize this whole circus in front of him. However, he suddenly turns around and sees Dominic Sild suddenly standing in the pose of the Statue of Liberty. The commentator falls silent for a while, after which he guesses Dominic's intentions and says that looking at those sparkling and imperturbable eyes, everything became clear to him. He reports that Dominic Sild confidently appeals for offside with his hand proudly outstretched. The commentator notes that this is such a decisive appeal that even the arbitrator was taken aback by Dominic's determination. The commentator says that the assistant referee did not raise the flag, suggesting that this was just a routine appeal for a missed goal. However, he is captivated by Sild's gaze, which does not contain a drop of lies, which dispels any doubts of the judge. Under pressure from Dominic Silda's unforgiving gaze, the referee decides to call for a VAR review. Elick says the players behave just like their athletic director, adding that they simply can't admit they missed a goal and act like pathetic children. Meanwhile, a video replay appears on the screen, and Elick looks at the big screen in surprise. A commentator observing the scene says that Anderson was definitely ahead of Delicate, adding that Sild noticed everything with filigree precision. At that time, Sild, shouting that he will take over the match, mentally notes that Anderson can run as much as he wants, since it will still be offside. Isaac Anderson is mentally destroyed looking at what VR shows. Elick turns with a creak towards Drake and Nathan, having difficulty thinking about the fact that they are real bastards. He realizes that the two have set an offside trap, 
and after all their attacks will be looking to drain their team's stamina. Drake looks contentedly at the VR results and hears the referee's decision, admitting that they were very lucky. He looks at Zeke, noting that he has been wandering around all this time and his position was undefined, adding that thanks to him they were offside. He also notes that Dominic really angered Anderson, which also helped a lot since the young guy had already lost his temper. With these thoughts, he looks at Alec and Marco and, smiling slightly, admits that everything is turning out extremely funny. Alec, filled with anger, looks at Drake, mentally burning him in the fires of the underworld. Subsequently, Anderson hits the ball again, but Dominic Silda is not far behind him and again interferes with him, hitting the ball. The commentator reports that in 30 minutes, Manu fired 17 shots into the goalpost, but the Bolton defenders blocked the shots very well adding that the court, however, still seemed tilted to one side. From a commentator's perspective, it's only a matter of time before Man New scores, while Nathan admits that the pace of the game is incredibly fast and there is chaos everywhere. Nathan says that Isaac Anderson is doing very well, adding that in a year or two he could already be promoted to the main roster, to which Drake replies that he is willing to bet that he will rise to it this winter, at that Nathan asks about the point of betting on the fate of this player. Nathan notes that their team is nevertheless much more organized, to which Drake says that Manu has a mix of first team and reserve team players, adding that the tactics of Ning Har and the director of the reserve team are significantly different, which is why their teams lose to Bolton in terms of tactical coherence. Nathan says that Alessi Pedro Camacho is the only first team player playing today who also played for the reserve team until recently, adding that since he is still very young, he makes decisions too quickly and has probably already forgotten the feeling of playing in the reserve team. Nathan says that Carmacho, among other things, is playing particularly poorly today, barely holding the ball, to which Drake replies that he doesn't know if he's feeling good. He adds that perhaps the arrogant Elik Ningha told him to play half-heartedly, to which Nathan asks him if he would really tell him to play half-heartedly. Drake loudly states that Ningha doesn't think this match is important at all, adding that if this guy, who is currently the only reliable striker in Manu's first team, suddenly gets injured while playing here, then it will be a really serious problem, which is quite likely be. Nathan asks Drake if it would be dangerous for the guy to play at full strength, noting that he is fast as a bullet and the other players may only become more united in the second half of the game. Drake, turning to the stands with the fans, says that this is true and that is why they cannot be allowed to do this. Meanwhile, the Bolton Wanderers fans are showing their strong and enthusiastic support, and even though their team has only been defending so far, their fervour and passion has been truly incredible. Even young fans also provide strong support for their team, in no way inferior in their enthusiasm to adults. The children begin to lift up the coloured cells and form the pictures of a cat from these cells, and the commentator wonders what connection the Bolton club might have with the cat, after which he quickly comes to the conclusion that there is no connection but it is still a very cute display support. Dignity, watching the big screen, sees that the children have posted an image of a huge cat. He insidiously observes this image and signals to his team that it is time to change strategy. Elik, not understanding anything of these secret interactions, looks on in shock at what is happening on the football field. He notices that the Bolton Wanderers team suddenly began to rebuild, changing their positions on the field. He glances at Drake, assuming he was giving them some kind of sign from the fan stands. Isaac Anderson turns around and wonders why Bolton Wanderers are changing their positions at will. He looks in the other direction, noticing that Dominic Silda, as luck would have it, remained in his position. Meanwhile, Dominic reflects that he has no need to change such a funny opponent as Isaac Anderson. Isaac glares at Dominic, mentally surprised that Dominic is looking at him like he's reading his mind, annoyed that he's wasting his time on a third-rate team. However, suddenly, his angry thoughts are interrupted by the shout of the coach, who asks Isaac what the hell he is doing, and he raises his head, noticing the ball flying above him. Dominic immediately gives chase and Isaac tries to keep up, watching him angrily. However, despite all the efforts and speed of Isaac Anderson, Dominic Sild easily intercepts the ball and passes back to his team. Immediately after this, he calmly runs away from Isaac, again leaving him with nothing. Isaac, dreaming of quartering the annoying guy, gives him a look full of contempt and indignation. Meanwhile, Tim Frederick intercepts the ball from Owen and the commentator reports that so far, Manu is not giving Bolton Wanderers a chance to attack. The ball, intercepted by Frederick, is immediately passed to Benedict and he, deciding not to waste time, sends it forward. The commentator excitedly reports that the ball is flying very high 
and this time Isaac Anderson is already waiting for him. Dominic Sild leaps into the air to compete for the ball, but Isaac Anderson decides to go for the illegal move. He viciously orders Dominic to fall into the underworld and delivers a strong shoulder blow to Dominic's leg, causing him serious injury. Drake and Nathan look at what is happening in surprise, realizing that Dominic is not pretending at all and is not feigning severe pain. The commentator states that Isaac Anderson just made a very poor decision, adding that at least for the safety of his opponent, he should have jumped together and competed for the ball in the air. The commentator says that Dominic Sild cannot get up, and considering that he complains of severe pain, then he may have suffered a serious dislocation. According to the commentator, there was a very disappointing injury scene shortly before the end of the first half in a friendly match. He adds that injuries must always be taken care of in pre-season games, and players must exhibit the same professional sportsmanship as in the regular season. While Nathan asks Drake about what they should do, adding that if Sild is now leaves, they will need someone capable of standing at centre-back. Drake is annoyed to realise that they currently don't have a central defender, but they definitely need Sild to use the tactic of changing positions. Suddenly his eyes land on Victor Johnson and a new plan comes to his mind. He calls Victor by name and demands that he get up from the bench. Drake says that Victor should warm up properly at halftime, adding that he will make a substitution very soon. Ellick happily reports that while there will be a lot of media coverage of the incident, they have got rid of the centre-back who had been a thorn in the side throughout the first half. From Ellick's point of view, if Dominic is not there, then in the second half they will be able to increase the gap by at least four goals, since more than half of the shots were blocked by Dominic. He turns to Carmacho and tells him to show his full strength in the second half of the match. Camacho calmly turns around, expressing emotional agreement in his gaze. During halftime, Elik menacingly walks into his team's locker room, calling them pathetic bastards and asking them if they're ashamed of playing like that. He says that they cannot cope with some pathetic team from the third league, being part of the great Manchester New Hellion. Elik angrily states that he doesn't care if they are ahead in possession or number of shots, as those numbers mean nothing, and then says that if they want to win, they have to score a goal eventually. He declares that they can no longer tarnish the name of Manu and orders his team to risk their lives in the second half of the game. Meanwhile, in the Bolton dressing room, Victor Johnson says that he cannot suddenly take the position of central defender, to which Drake reprimands him that Victor has always whined about sitting his ass on the bench, and now that he is allowed to play, he refuses, adding that he is required to be at least half as good a player as the guys he was berating, to which he replies that he is an attacking midfielder and Drake tells him to play as a central defender, despite the fact that even with multi-position there are clear limits. Drake asks Victor if he forgot all the training, to which he replies that it is impossible to forget since he was in any position, since Drake used him only as a player for training. He remembers all the training he had to go through and suddenly it dawns on him about the reasons for such torment. Drake puts his hand on his shoulder, saying that Victor has finally begun to understand what it was all about. With a contorted face and a fake voice, he tells Victor that he has been training him all this time, that he has become a multi-position player. But Victor does not fall for such an obvious scam and tells Drake to repeat it, looking into his eyes. Drake decides not to put on a show and immediately admits that he just lied, adding that Victor was just one of the soldiers, always ready to train in their outback, noting that he was a very convenient punching bag. However, he adds that willingly or unwillingly, Victor continued to follow him during his difficult training, adding that he himself had just realized that he had learned a lot from them. Drake tells Victor that he, without realizing it, has created the potential for himself to become the real Rud Gullit, after which he says that the second half will begin soon, and his role in their rotation strategy is more important than any other. He looks at Victor and asks him again whether he can participate in such a responsible strategy at such a fateful moment. The second half begins, and the commentator reports that Bolton Wanderers have decided to make two changes, adding that Dennis Sleep has replaced the injured Dominic Sealed, while Victor Johnson makes his first appearance since Drake took over. Dignity hugs Victor, saying that they haven't seen each other on the field for a long time, and he even thought for a second that he was back on the bench again. Victor is annoyed, and notes that he is entering the field for the first time in several months, and his opponent is immediately man new. Meanwhile, the Little Wanderers change their posters as if welcoming Victor and show a drawing of the rabbit. Seeing this drawing, Team Bolton changes its formation, confusing Team Manu with its unusual rearrangements. One of the players looks at Quick Floyd and wonders why the hell he was here, remembering that Floyd played as a centre-back. 
Marco notes that Bolton have changed positions again, adding that this time the defensive formation has changed to a 4-3-3. He points out that Victor Johnson suddenly became the centre-back, pushing Quick Floyd into the attack zone, who calmly handled his position. Ellick says Quick Floyd has been assigned as a striker at times throughout the season, adding that he is still at the level of a minor league dribbler, meaning Drake is simply trying to create confusion and hide the difference in ability between the starting centre-back and the player who came on. Replacement, after which he tells Marco not to fall for such tricks. However, Ellick mentally notes that although he said not to worry so as not to spoil the atmosphere, Bolton's well-coordinated teamwork cannot be ignored, after which he notices that this time there were no signs from the bench either. He looks at the hair and assumes that it might be him, but quickly gets rid of these thoughts deciding that he is simply beginning to see tricks in simple children's pranks. Ellick notes with alarm that he has slowly begun to fall under the influence of these guys and decides to urgently come to his senses. He consoles himself with the thought that they are leading in this game anyway, while the commentator reports that Camacho is moving into the centre with lightning speed, reflecting that in the first half he only accumulated strength. However, Bolton does not stand still and Dennis quickly blocks the passage for Camacho rushing forward. Carmacho sees Isaac Anderson running to help him and realizes that he has an excellent opportunity to pass the ball. The commentator notes that Carmacho made an unexpected cutback towards the quickly running up Anderson. Anderson happily reflects that now he will definitely score a goal since Dominic is no longer in the game. He once again concentrates all his strength and strikes the Bolton Wanderers goal, sending the ball along a highly unpredictable trajectory. The goalkeeper rushes after the ball, but his speed and reaction are not enough to return the ball launched from such a short distance. However, Isaac's plans are not destined to come true as Victor Johnson comes to the rescue, who makes a divine sewing, reminiscent of what Dominic did in the first half. The fans burst into enthusiastic shouts, applauding Victor, who had just entered the field and showed his worth in the first minutes of the second half. The commentator notes that since Drake took over, Victor has rarely appeared in games, while the Bolton goalkeeper is helping him get to his feet. The commentator reports that today, Victor Johnson came on as a substitute for the first time in a long time and is already demonstrating his incredible performance. Drake and Nathan put on special glasses and shout words of encouragement to Victor Johnson, saying that he is the English rude gullet. Marco says that he doesn't understand the amount of fuss that comes from one successful block, noting that if someone looks at them from the outside, they will think that they scored a goal, and then asks where such funny glasses are sold. However, Elick does not share Marco's composure and angrily groans that their opponents are pathetic little parasites. A bloody veil of anger clouds his eyes and he shouts to his team to raise the line to the top, adding that they definitely need to score. Marco asks him what he is saying, to which he orders him to shut up, shouting that he is no longer going to be influenced by the third league team. He states that if they score quickly, it will all be over, and the commentator reports that the man new players are raising their line, trying to strengthen their game. A striker named Ryan Benedict receives the ball and attacking rights again pass to Manu. Marco thinks that the director is right, since there is no way that they will not be able to score against some third-rate team, so they cannot delay their attack any longer and they need to score immediately. The commentator reports that Ryan Benedict makes a forward pass deep in the pitch, adding that it ends up in the Bolton penalty area. Victor Jones prepares to compete for the ball with Manu's striker. They both jump into the air, colliding with each other, but the ball flies past them both. Before they both land on the ground, team captain Bolton Dignity knocks him away with a powerful headbutt. The loose ball conveniently ends up right next to Owen Priestis, who decides to take advantage of the opportunity. He turns towards the enemy to see if there are any obstacles to a direct strike. Having quickly looked around, he realizes that the path to the gate is completely open since Manu have put everything on the attack. He shouts at Park Young to run forward as quickly as possible and prepares to strike. Owen yells at Puck that it's time to start and kicks the ball, sending it flying. Puck begins to pick up speed, breaking away from his pursuers with every step. Elik yells at Carmacho, ordering him to grab Park Jung and intercept the ball. Elik says that Pack can be as fast as he wants, but he is just a third league player who poses no threat to Carmacho, who is one of the best and fastest players in the first league. Carmacho, rushing in pursuit of Park Chon, thinks that Elik is right. He recalls that after he joined the first team, it was he who drove many opposing defenders to despair. However, despite all his efforts, Camacho notices that the distance between them is not closing in any way. After a while, he begins to lose steam, noticing how Park Chung is rapidly approaching the gate. 
Park Chung runs up to the goal almost closely and prepares to strike a distracting blow. The goalkeeper of the Man U team jumps on Park Chung, trying to intercept the ball, and Park makes a tricky shot to the ball. Time stops for a second and Drake, along with Ellick, look at the ball in fascination. Puck's kick turns out to be successful and the ball goes straight into the goal of the Manchester New Halley team. The fans begin to shout joyfully, praising Bolton Wanderers, not hiding their tears of joy. The commentator with the same enthusiasm says that Park Chung Ah, being a young player from Asia, scores the first goal against Man U. Park Chung happily runs towards Drake and Nathan, while the commentator repeats that Park scored a goal against Man U at Bolton's home stadium. He adds that the most important thing about this goal scene was that Park literally destroyed Carmacho, who is considered one of the fastest players in the EPL, thereby proving that he is not only fast among EFL1 players. Ellick admits to himself that he let his guard down too much, adding that no one could even think that this Asian would be faster than Carmacho. He recalls that even in the EPL, there are only a few players who can surpass Carmacho in speed, and now someone from a third-rate team has managed it. Marco says that the time has come for them to make a replacement, to which Elec asks in bewilderment about what he just said. Marco points out that Puck is too fast, and if they raise the line and open up space at the back, something even worse could happen. Elec tells Marco not to bullshit, adding that they just need to release Rafael Saran to increase the speed and stability of the defence. Elec says that even if the third league team is leading, they should not be so hasty in replacing players with the main squad, adding that Marco has clearly gone crazy and wants to be treated like a complete fool and a loser. He adds that this pre-season tour is almost over and this replacement can tell on the stamina of the main team, after which he disappointedly and angrily asks Marco why he is still unable to adequately assess the situation. Elec tells Marco that they are still far ahead statistically and if you control the defensive line well, then there should be no problems. Meanwhile, one of Manu's attackers trying to keep up with Puck notes that he is damn fast. In an attempt to stop him, he forcefully grabs his shoulder to slow him down. However, Park, taught by long training in acting skills, performs a dramatic somersault with a coup. After such a stunt, she falls down onto the grass and begins to pretend to be seriously injured. The referee, impressed by such acting, immediately runs onto the field and shows a yellow card. Drake, without hiding the tears in his eyes, shouts at the medic so that they would rather save Park Chon, while Nathan calls man-new devilish bastards and asks them if Dominic was not enough for them. Stopping this spectacle, Nathan informs Drake that Nainha is one step away from killing him, adding that he is unlikely to be able to prevent it, to which Drake responds that the back of his head was tingling a while ago, believing that it was a gaze attack. He turns to the stands, saying that if he wants to kill him, then he better attack as soon as possible. He notices Fev on the podium, adding that the picture in this case would be simply ideal. Fev takes off his glasses, revealing his appearance to Drake and smirks slightly, approving of the results of today's match. Director Fev's order was not to beat Manu in the upcoming soccer ball. For him, the most important thing was to leave a stain on the reputation of the Manchester New Halley team. The most effective way in this case will be to break the opponent's psyche and show them an image of self-destruction. Everything from the selection of players for a friendly match to the tactics that Drake prepared with the utmost care was aimed at fulfilling this task. Although Bolton's past opponents have also used convoluted tactics, changing formations several times, at the end of the day, there are a maximum of three or four formations that can be played in a game right now that can work perfectly, as preparing for more will drain players' stamina. Drake has used three formations so far, which although look varied, with multi-positioning adding to the sense of confusion, is ultimately a defence-based formation, and the spacing between the front line and second line is based on the long counter-attack of the ball, and if used this as the main tactic, it will be impossible to defeat Manu. However, in this case, Drake has prepared another setup to completely break the psyche of his opponents. The commentator states that there is a new map in the stands, adding that based on the events of the match, then Bolton Wanderers must now change the formation of their players again. He adds that as expected, the formation has changed and Park, despite the injury, shows incredible fighting spirit, trying to execute the strategy. The commentator states that Bolton have now decided to create a two-line defence in front of the penalty area. He is surprised to note that Park, meanwhile, takes a position in front to catch the enemy by surprise, since among Manu's defenders there is no player capable of matching him in speed, so it will not be easy to block him. Elick loses his composure, annoyingly wondering if they are really going to sit out in such a defence. Elick shouts to his team that everyone except Benedict and Menzies should go up and apply pressure from the front, 
adding that they must score a goal at all costs. Drake gloatingly says that Elik is making a mistake if he thinks that he can play beautiful football by rushing players who are already at a loss. Isaac Anderson takes the ball from Dignity, pushing it away with his hand due to his inability to control his emotions. Dignity falls to the ground because of this, and the referee calls a foul on Isaac, to which he expresses a clear protest. But the referee says that in the last half, Isaac also crippled one player. The referee says that this is no good, and he is not going to turn a blind eye to it, giving Isaac a yellow card. Jalal Amar runs up to the referee and asks him in an insulting tone what the hell is going on here, to which the referee calmly replies that for inappropriate words, he also receives a warning and a yellow card. Alec raises his hand, saying that the judge is acting as if he was bribed, but Drake comes to the judge's defense, saying that Jalal really used obscene language. The commentator says that it has been a long time since he saw director Ninghaha so excited, adding that Manu today appears in a variety of images. He adds that fortunately, it seems that director Ninghaq was not given a card, noting that his pride has already suffered enough and that in order to make up for lost time, they will have to gather their courage. The match continues and the commentator notes that Bolton seems determined to finish the job, adding that all athletes have a high level of immersion. He adds that after the match with Vegan, Bolton is catching strong teams by the ankles with Middle Eastern-style football, to which Fev notes in surprise that this sounds quite absurd. He notes that Bolton is taking a smarter and more evil approach since Manu is no longer able to recover morally. Feb looks at Drake and notes that he understands and exploits not only his players, but also the characteristics of the opposing team, adding that he is a much more capable director than he thought. He puts on sunglasses, adding that this makes him look forward not to his next matches, but to their future collaboration. Meanwhile, the match continues, and the commentator notes that Victor Jones wins another ball in the air. He adds that the ball is now heading towards Roof, and if he can get past Akobe, he can create a chance. However, today's rivalry between Roof and Akobe is completely dominated by Akobe. Roof muses that Pack and even Victor Johnson, who was benched for months, played an active role in this match, meaning he can't afford to end this match with just crappy acting. With these words, with the help of rather cunning maneuvers, he wraps a Kobe around his finger and overcomes his block. He rushes forward on all fours as a Kobe tries to catch him, screaming about Aiden being a crazy idiot. Taking the lead, Roof manages to throw a rough acrobatic pass to Park Chung. A Kobe says that he missed the ball, ordering his ally not to give Puck space. Team defender Manu muses that with his speed, all he can do is just hold it. Park Chung and Benedict fall to the ground with a bang. The commentator says that for his gross violations, Ryan Benedict receives a red card, which means he is removed from the game. Alec begins to shout at the goalkeeper, calling him the most unflattering names. The commentator tells everyone that Alec Nyingha vehemently protests, noting that this is unnecessary given the obvious scene of violation. He also notes that the referee is inexorably approaching Alec, as he is no longer willing to just watch. With a stern face, the referee hands over another card, signaling the competitor's removal. Elik looks at the referee and understands that for his rude and unsportsmanlike behavior, he is also removed from the football field. Stardom is what it takes to be called a star player, but it consists of several aspects. The first component of stardom is, of course, skill, since if you have a unique playstyle, then that is the icing on the cake. In addition, an important factor is the special history leading a person to success and the positive impact on society. Among all this, there is the most important condition that cannot be achieved through skills, but can only be obtained at birth. This criterion is appearance, and a footballer named Shearer Kane can be considered as having great star qualities. Even though he plays in the fifth league, he has the skills to become the top scorer this season, as the flexibility and strength of his ankle allows him to shoot even in a prone or awkward position. Also, his name, like the name of the main character, is a combination of the names of the new and old legendary strikers representing England. Shearer Kane has already attracted attention with flashy nicknames such as the Emperor of Chesterfield and has received offers from top flight clubs since the end of the season. Shearer could comfortably play for a mid-tier side in the EFL Challenger this season. However, the day will come when Shearer plays for his dream club, which is Manchester Blue Moon. But suddenly an event occurred that seemed to put an end to the plans of the narcissist. He asks his agent if he will really go to Bolton, which now has such a strange owner. His agent says that only the head coach came to this meeting, who suddenly named an exorbitant amount and kicked out all the representatives of other teams. Shearer says that he is not going to move to the third league, to which his agent replies that Shearer's emotions are understandable. 
But first of all, this deal must be completed so that he can negotiate with other teams. Shearer admits that Bolton began to interfere with his plans, and then, in order to create a reason for refusing Bolton's offer, he had to spend precious time monitoring the actions of the club. Listening to Drake's speech about Blue Moon's dominance in Manchester, Shearer notes that he, of course, speaks the truth, but acts as if he has two lives. Hearing Drake's words that they want to collaborate with Blue Moon, Shearer is completely speechless for a short time. He bursts out into hearty laughter and assumes that this is all either a joke or a show to recruit him to join his team. He muses that if Drake has come this far, he can at least pretend that he wants to join them. However, after a while, his manager brought Shearer an invitation to a friendly match with the words that he should go there and watch the game before the official meeting. Shearer looks at the invitation in surprise and argues that Drake is going too far to recruit him to his team. He notes that he still wants to go to Manu's game, so he won't lose anything if he accepts the invitation. Currently, watching everything that happens, Shearer is surprised that Bolton is simply mocking Man New. He reflects that he, of course, guessed that mentally young players could weaken, but he did not think that such a fate could befall Neng Haha. The commentator states that he notices director Guadalajara on the podium, who looks quite pleased, adding that he did not notice him right away, because he was not sitting in the invited area, but in the regular one. Shearer realizes with surprise that he is not dreaming of all this, and the director of Guadalajara really came which means cooperation with Blue Moon was no joke. He looks at the situation on the field and notes that judging by today's match, this is quite possible. The commentator reports that Owen Presses is preparing for a free kick, adding that due to the fact that Benedict immediately fouled, the kick will be taken quite far from the goal. He adds that Bolton can win even if they just maintain a one-goal difference, so the team is not particularly involved in the attack and only the strikers stand inside and prepare. The commentator says that Presis moved quite far away to approach the ball, which means that most likely he will hit it himself. He notes that due to the power of Presis's kick, landing a straight punch won't be that difficult for him. Owen muses that the only way to score a goal is to rely on Puck's speed, since only he can receive the pass and develop such an attack. However, seeing that now there will be no opportunity to pass the ball, he mentally asks for forgiveness from him. He adds that this time he himself wants to be the centre of attention. With these words, he runs up properly, calculating the force of his blow and the possible trajectory of the ball. Having reached it, he delivers a powerful blow to the ball, sending it flying. The ball flies at great speed past Isaac Isaac's head, heading straight into the opponent's goal. Also, neither Roof nor Park Chung have time to receive the ball, since it was initially launched at a different target. The goalkeeper realizes that he misread Owen Price's intentions and jumps towards the ball, trying to reach with his hand. He reaches for the ball, but it's not enough. Fev and Shearer jump up from their seats, looking excitedly at the ball. Nathan and Drake, having already prepared their winning points, realize with beaming faces that the ball will definitely hit the goal. The commentator happily calls out Owen's name, saying that he was able to score the key goal with a fantastic free kick late in the game. He gives him credit by saying that Owen Pressis is definitely a world-class player in dead ball situations. After a while, the commentator says that Bolton is replacing Puck and Priestis, adding that these two strikers, who showed an excellent game today, leave to a loud ovation. He adds that Park and Priestess prove today that their speed and punching power are effective against EPL teams, adding that they definitely got themselves clips of the players' highlight videos in the preseason match. Their replacements are Joel Biggs and Slow Bulky, who are centre-backs and a striker, and the commentator notes that Slow has been brought on to take advantage of his height and will strengthen the set-piece defence. Drake and Nathan give Owen and Puck piggyback rides, honouring them as the true heroes of today. Marco understands that there are only four minutes left until the end of the second half, and Bolton will continue to play, relying on defence. After some time, the match ends and the commentator says that Bolton's first pre-season match is over, and Bolton beat Manchester New Hellion with a score of 2-0. Victor notes that he has not participated in a match for a very long time, noting that he only ran half of the match, but is incredibly tired. Meanwhile, Dignity approaches him and raises his hand up. Victor watches as fans celebrate his name, thanking him for a great save early in the second half. Drake says that Victor's popularity is still at its peak, to which Nathan replies that Victor has exceeded all his expectations today. Nathan tells Drake that Victor probably still hates him, to which Drake replies that Victor probably doesn't recognize him yet, but releasing him was still a great decision. Drake says that since Derek Scott, Victor has been the undisputed starter alongside Owen Doyle and Falcon Jones, 
He adds that, among other things, Johnson's number is 10, and this number symbolizes the team's ace. Drake confidently states that the guy who got a lot of love from the Wanderers couldn't play it safe no matter how much he hated him. Meanwhile, Manu leaves the field with a heavy mood and heart. Marco hugs Carmacho, telling him he did a great job today. He muses that with Bolton Wanderers' level of excellence, they will one day have another chance to compete, be it promotion or the FA Cup. With these words, he says that next time everything will not end as absurdly as today.